Good morning, everybody, and welcome to News Now from Fox, the Monday edition. It is November 23rd. Pilar Arias here with you. We are taking a live look at Times Square in New York City, where they're getting some rain this Monday morning ahead of the sunrise. Again, happy Monday. I hope you all had a fabulous weekend. I know most of us were preparing for this weekend, right? The holiday weekend. Many of us have four-day weekends. I actually do, which in this business is very rare. So I am super excited for that. I'm going to say hello here to you in just a second. You know me. I got to fix my camera shot, check my hair and all that jazz. But again, it is a Monday morning, so I did as best as I could this morning. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for watching News Now from Fox. Again, my name is Pilar Arias, one of several hosts across the country. I'm here in Orlando, Florida. It is our East Coast hub, but the News Now from Fox headquarters are in Phoenix, Arizona, which just so happens to be my hometown. So, yes, I miss it, especially this time of year when the weather slowly starts to cool down and it's perfect to get out hiking in the mountains. Yes, there are mountains in Phoenix. That's why it's called the Valley. And yes, there's even snow two hours just north of Phoenix, Arizona. I drive by car, so it's a great time. And I heard that Arizona Snow Bowl was actually opening, if not this weekend, then very soon. So some might be hitting the slopes over the Thanksgiving weekend. If you are watching on the platform that has a chat feature, please check in. Let me know where you're watching from, how your weekend was, and what you're planning for this week, especially this weekend from Thursday through Sunday. I'm going to get you all caught up with some top stories from across the country. Again, everyone, we're taking a live look at Times Square first and foremost. Uh, let's take a look at those who might be traveling for Thanksgiving, hitting the airports, perhaps the first real actual travel holiday during this pandemic since it all started in uh, March. Let's take a listen. A stark warning right before the holidays from the CDC, urging Americans not to travel to visit loved ones for Thanksgiving. That advice now being echoed by governors across the country as more states move into stricter lockdowns as COVID cases rise. Obviously, there's no playbook for this. My top priority is to preserve um, our hospital capacity, our health care workforce. During the surge in cases over the summer, hospitals could bring in doctors and nurses from other states to help out. Now, with nearly the whole country seeing a spike, many are now working 12-hour shifts. We were kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and just very, very quickly, uh, numbers really started to change. CDC scientists believe about 40 percent of those infected will be asymptomatic and might not know they have the virus but can still spread it to others. The increased concern has led to more Americans wanting to know their virus status before visiting family. Drivers at this site in Florida waited more than two hours to get tested. We're going to visit some family for the holiday. No symptoms. We're just doing it just to be cautious. But we think it's primarily due to the the holiday season coming up, families visiting, and those traveling as well. The CDC says if you do plan to gather for Thanksgiving to keep things outdoor as much as possible and to stay six feet apart. In New York, Alex Hogan, Fox News. All right, Alex, thanks so much for that update there. We are taking a live look at the Capitol in our nation's capital. By the way, everybody, while I have a few moments, as always, I want to say thank you for your patience and understanding. This morning launched a little bit later than usual, but it's a Monday morning of a holiday week, and sometimes things happen. <laughs> but again, I hope you had a fantastic weekend. So here's a live look at our Capitol. Uh, the latest with Washington, D.C. news, in particular, the Biden transition. And uh, what's the latest with President Trump over the weekend, right? Well, let's hear from his legal team. According to Fox News, Rudy Giuliani says Sidney Powell is not a part of Trump's legal team. Powell was included on a list of lawyers for his team uh, that President Trump mentioned in a November 14th tweet. But again, the latest from President Trump's campaign uh, on yesterday distancing itself from Sidney Powell saying that the lawyer who's been alleging voter fraud in the November election is, quote, not a member of the Trump legal team. Sidney Powell is practicing law on her own, said Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and another lawyer for Trump, Jenna Ellis, in a statement Continuing on to say, quote, she is not a member of the Trump legal team. She is also not a lawyer for the president in his personal capacity, end quote. No further details or clarification were offered. In a statement obtained by the Wall Street Journal, Powell said, quote, I agree with the statement today. I will represent hashtag we the people and seek the truth. I intend to expose all the fraud and let the chips fall where they may. We will not allow the foundations of this great republic to be destroyed by abject fraud, end quote. 
The statement comes after Powell, who also serves as General Mike Flynn's lawyer, has given multiple press conferences on behalf of Trump, who included her in a list of lawyers for his team in a November 14th tweet. That tweet reading, quote, I look forward to Mayor Giuliani spearheading the legal effort to defund our right to free and fair elections. Rudy Giuliani, Joseph D. Genova, Victoria Tonsing, Sidney Powell, and Jenna Ellis, a truly gay team, added to our other wonderful lawyers and representatives. That is according to the tweet from the president. Powell appeared alongside Giuliani at a whirlwind press conference on Thursday where they both made a number of allegations concerning coordinated voter fraud in a number of states. So again, this is all the latest from Fox News. When and if we heard anything else from the Trump team, legal team, the White House, anything else coming out of the Capitol, we'll bring it to you right here on News Now from Fox. Well, unfortunately, during the pandemic right now, there is a blood shortage. So let's hear the latest from Fox News. Not everybody can be a nurse or a doctor, but at least you can donate blood. Travis Brinson is back in the saddle, donating blood at the New York Blood Center. And it couldn't come at a better time, as blood centers everywhere are facing a donation shortage. Statewide, New York's blood center needs about 8,000 more donations a month. Nationwide, America's blood centers reporting 22% of their 60 centers have a one to two day supply. 25% only have a one day supply. And it has a lot to do with the pandemic. Tens of thousands of blood drives were canceled across the country this spring. Donors no longer able to just drop by a blood drive at school or their place of worship. And some folks were simply too scared. The Red Cross now reassuring people that it is safe to donate. We have uh, our staff wear masks. Our staff are diligent about being socially distant. We have cleaning protocols in place. We take temperatures as people come in. We manage appointments very carefully. Uh, we control the flow. So uh, we have adapted to the pandemic. In some blood centers, we'll even check to see if you have COVID antibodies. Bernardo Flores is donating convalescent plasma for a third time after beating coronavirus in April. It was a, a scary moment in life. It's actually incredible to have that feeling, to know that like, you know, my plasma can help up to like three people uh, fighting against COVID. A small sacrifice that could save a life. That's what keeps Travis coming back, even in the middle of a pandemic. Despite all our fears and our expectations of what might or might not happen, we should still try to help each other and go out of our way to go above and beyond. And if you want to find the nearest place to you to donate, just head to americasblood.org or redcross.org. In New York, Aisha Hasne, Fox News. All right, Aisha, thanks so much for that. Again, everyone, my name is Pilar Arias. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for joining us right here on News Now from Fox. I definitely have my coffee ready to go here because uh, it's a Monday morning, and as a journalist, I am just addicted to coffee. I love coffee. I have to have it every single morning. If you do too, let me know if you're watching on the platform that has a YouTube chat. You'll probably see I've been very chatty with you guys this morning. Okay, so we are continuing on with our top stories from across the country, right? Unfortunately, over the weekend, a lot of COVID-related news came out. We're going to take you to a city, a community that I used to live in, El Paso, Texas, to find out, unfortunately, about the situation with their COVID-19 surge and the response. Again, it is Monday, November 23rd, 2020, and you are watching News Now from Fox. We are uh, dealing with uh, a pandemic uh, unlike on any other. With El Paso hospitals and ICUs over capacity since last month due to one of the worst COVID-19 surges in the country, three Air Force medical teams have spent the past two weeks deployed in the borderland to aid in the fight. We came over here to University Medical Center. We onboarded over here with the medical staff. They showed us around the hospital. And after that, we hit the ground running and uh, started working in some of the critical care sections in the emergency medicine rooms. Staff Sergeant Blake Foff is a member of the team at UMC, where the COVID-19 ICU is drawing comparisons to a war zone. A lot of the people I work with um, have described it uh, similar to Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, there's uh, just a large amount of patients. Um, that we're taking care of in a lot of critically uh, sick patients. El Paso has seen a wave of deaths among COVID-19 patients that has overwhelmed the county morgue, with the county having to call in the National Guard today to work through a backlog of nearly 240 bodies. But the Air Force team say they're taking pride in the patients they have been able to save. We do have uh, some uh, patients unfortunately losing their lives, but um, I, I'd rather focus on uh, the patients that we are taking care of, the ones that uh, we are um, able to take off the emergency ventilators. Although members of the military 
military are often called heroes for their service. The medical team say the spotlight belongs on the health care workers who've been saving lives in El Paso since the pandemic began. They're the real heroes. Uh, we're just in here in support of them. Keenan Willard, KFOX 14 News at 9. All right, everybody, we have some unfortunate uh, breaking news to bring you this morning. We've learned that there's a stabbing at California's Grace Baptist Church that has killed two and multiple people are in serious condition. So this broke from overnight. This is video from overnight. Authorities responded to the stabbing at 8.45 p.m. Multiple people were stabbed Sunday night, including two fatally at San Jose's Grace Baptist Church while the building was reportedly being used to shelter the homeless during a cold night. Authorities said some of those injured sustained life-threatening injuries. Sam Licardo, the mayor, said the police arrested a suspect, but the Mercury News reported that the tweet was deleted. This quote goes out to say, Our hearts go out to the families of the two community members who have succumbed to stabbing wounds in the attack at Grace Baptist Church downtown, Licardo said in a tweet late last night. NBC Bay Area reporting that authorities responded to the stabbing again at 8.45 in the evening and the church building is near the San Jose State University campus. This is another quote, police said, according to the paper. For clarification, no church services were being conducted at the time of the stabbing. Unhoused individuals were brought into the church to get them out of the cold, police said, according to the paper. So unfortunately, that is the situation there in California. We're going to continue on with our top stories here from across the country and all COVID related news. First, our sister station KTVU, they did a segment about uh, Thanksgiving safety. So let's watch right now on News Now from Fox. Hi everyone, it's Alex Savage at KTVU, Fox 2 News here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, we want to talk about some of the concerns about coronavirus as we head toward the Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, to do that, we bring in Dr. Malenka Stoll, a senior medical director with Blue Shield of California. Dr. Stoll, good, good to have you on here. Um, there, it, there is a lot of concern about the spread of coronavirus here as people gather over the Thanksgiving holiday. W what are your biggest concerns and, and what are you recommending to people? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me today. I'm most concerned that that people are gonna hold on to the idea of tradition and, tr and try and make this Thanksgiving like every other Thanksgiving. And, and of course that's natural, it is a, it is a time for tradition. Uh, and I think there's ways that we can celebrate that are going to be fulfilling, but they're gonna have to be really different than in years past. It's just not the time to get together with people outside your household. And with the cold weather, you, you know, during summer we were able to gather outside and, and do that safely with our masks on. In winter, it's much harder indoors. Um, and of course, when you're eating, your mask comes off. So, so I have concerns about that as well. Mm -hmm. What, you know, what, what if people are still, you know, what if they keep the groups smaller for, for Thanksgiving? I mean, what if it's people who are uh, you know, within, their, within their bubble or who've been in their bubble this entire time? Is, is yeah. that okay? And what, what sort of limitations in terms of size should people have on, on their Thanksgiving events? That's a really natural question, and I think every situation is a little bit different, but the general guidance that I'm hearing and that I'm following at home is, is really just to stick with our immediate family. So okay. even though, for example, my father has been a part of our bubble, I think it's safer this, this time around just to stick with our immediate family. Unfortunately, it's, it is hard, you know, mm -hmm. but, but I figured, well, we can cook and drop off food the next day. There's, there's ways to kind of, to keep it cheerful. We can certainly get on the phone and get on Zoom calls and, and wish each other uh, happy holidays. So I think there's ways to do it, but I just really think we should uh, go towards the side of caution and stick with the folks who are in your immediate household. In, in terms of the travel situation, obviously Thanksgiving is one of those times a year when people like to travel across the country and, and see their loved ones. And I'm sure you've heard the, the recommendations from public health officials, from the CDC, urging people to, to avoid Thanksgiving travel this year. We're, we're sort of getting into that window where we usually see travel start to ramp up and people starting to head out of town here. Um, wh what would be your message to, to someone who has made plans to travel, maybe to take a flight across? Across the country, um, but might be having some second thoughts right now about doing that. What 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 would be your pitch to them about why it's the best uh, best idea to probably stay home? I think it's a 
good time to listen to those second thoughts and, and to, again, uh, have caution. Again, every situation is different. I can't, I can't speak for every, every single family in every single situation. But I think that if there is a voice saying, maybe this isn't a good idea, that's probably the voice to listen to. All right. You know as well as I do that there, there are going to be people who are, are, are still going to have uh, Thanksgiving celebrations, uh, you know, in some form or fashion with some number of people. You know, we, you hope it's a smaller number. But if people are going to do this, let's just say that, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're set on the fact that they're going to have some sort of a Thanksgiving dinner uh, with people. What beyond that? What guidance would you give them? What suggestions would you give them in terms of how to make that meal uh, be as safe as possible and, and, and hopefully limit the spread of coronavirus? Yeah, good questions. I, I think, as I mentioned before, outside's better than inside. So if you happen to live, you know, in our climate in California and you can set up some heat lamps outside, that's going to that's gonna be definitely more safe than being crowded inside. And even when you're outside distancing, so sitting six feet apart, um, having, you know, if there's a family there, they can sit as a unit, but then having them six feet from another family, you're gonna have to have it set up that way. So little tables or whatever it takes. Um, and I think um, making sure that there's not a lot of sharing, there's no sharing of utensils and sharing mm -hmm. of, of food. So making sure, you know, they're saying no buffets, um, you know, sometimes even potlucks families can bring their own food and you still have that fun of, of uh, gathering, gathering together. Um, and then of course, wearing masks at all the time other than when you're eating. So those, those would be my, um, that's what I would suggest. Is, is there any benefit to, to limiting the amount of time that you spend? I've heard some people suggesting, well, you know, maybe you try to make the Thanksgiving dinner, you know, it, obviously it's, it's nice to, to eat and linger and, and, and chat and, and, you know, have drinks and all that stuff. But is there any benefit to, to, to putting a kind of a time limit on things? Yeah, the less time you're interacting with others, the less chance that the virus is going to spread. And of course, remember that you can have the virus and not be sick. So that would be another, I mean, obviously if somebody's not feeling well, if they're sick, uh, they want to stay away from any type of gathering and that's going to be really important. But even for those folks who look well and feel well, they can um, actually be transmitting the virus. So any reducing that amount of contact to your point is, is the way to go. So short, shorter duration would be better. Um, there's also discussion about alcohol and, you know, when people drink, did the masks come off? Do people get a little closer together? Um, you know, that that's an issue too. So again, I think limiting the time, um, you know, making it short and sweet, that would definitely be advisable. How do you, you know, what, what is your, what is your gut feeling about how things are going to play out here as we head, you know, into the heart of the holiday season here? There, there's a lot of sort of dire predictions about people still gathering over the Thanksgiving holiday. And then, you know, you look a few weeks, a uh, month or so down the line, and you might see a lot more people uh, getting sick with the virus here. What, what, is your, what is your gut feeling about how, how all of us as a, as a broader community are, are going to handle this holiday season with cases on the rise? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm hopeful that the, as you said, the discussions that have been happening around just, um, just the rapid, the surge that we're in right now, just really, really rapidly increasing cases every day all over the country, that people will take that seriously. And as they go into the holidays, uh, do the right thing for themselves and for others. So, so that's my, certainly um, my hope. And, and I think, you know, the other, the other good news is we know more about this virus than we did maybe at July 4th, you know, when people were talking about gathering and we know how it spread. We know that masks are, are really effective. Um, and so wear the mask. Um, so we're learning more and we know more. And I think that's going to help us as well, as long as people, like I said, listen to that voice that's kind of telling you to do, to do the right thing. And, and of course, as well, we have the recent news, good news about a vaccine on the horizon. Um, but I do want to emphasize that that's, that's not right around the corner. So we have, um, it's good news because what it tells me is that next year for Thanksgiving, hopefully things will be back to those regular traditions that we love so much. Um, but between now and then, if we want to get to that point and we want all of our loved ones to be with us at that point, then we really, we really do need to do the right thing.
Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really great point. And um, yeah, I mean, just because we have the vaccine, it, you know, it doesn't mean that we flip a switch and, and all of a sudden um, we don't have to practice all of these safety measures and wear masks uh, in, in the meantime. But yeah, I mean, I think you make you make a great point that it's it's about making you know this Thanksgiving is going to feel different. It's 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 just you know it's it's going to be different, and we have to get through this one and and look ahead to next year, right? Absolutely. And there's, you know, it's always, it's sometimes really hard in times like this to find those things to feel thankful for, but it's, it's really helpful to do so. I think, you know, it, with your family and friends, whether it's on the phone or not, just, just reminding yourself of what, you know, what you are grateful for. I think, I think that always helps. And that is the spirit of the holiday. Absolutely. All right. Great advice. Uh, really appreciate your time, Dr. Maleka Stoll, uh, Senior Medical Director with Blue Shield of California. Really appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Uh, enjoy your smaller celebration this year. Yeah, you as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right, everyone, we have some breaking news out of New York. Our sister station, Fox 5 New York, providing us these live images on the ground right now. Unfortunately, what we are hearing from our sister station is that a gunman opened fire, shooting a total of seven people, killing one in Brooklyn. So that unfortunately means that six people were injured and one person is dead. The New York Police Department is looking for at least two gunmen, actually, who opened fire at a party in Brooklyn, again, injuring six and killing one. Police believe that shooting at a party on Albany Avenue in Bedford, Stoy Vacent, I definitely did not say that right, I'm sorry, New Yorkers, at about 11.15 last night was connected to a shooting during a Sweet 16 party in East New York earlier in the evening. All of this information is being reported by our sister station, Fox 5 in New York. In the first shooting, a teen was shot in the leg. During a second shooting, a 20-year-old woman was shot and pronounced dead at Woodhull Hospital. In total, four males is what they're saying, and it's probably because they're teenagers in age because it doesn't say men, and three females were shot. All of the victims were between the ages of 14 and 20. So yes, most of them teens, but of course some probably aged 18 to 20 would make them legally adults. The latest gun violence comes amid a 95% uptick in shooting incidents citywide compared to last year. Unfortunately, in stressful times and around the holidays, crime increases. We've heard about stabbings. We've heard about shootings already this morning here on News Now from Fox. But this is breaking news from our sister station, Fox 5 in New York. I wanted to provide you the latest right there. A little bit of the beauty and magic of News Now from Fox is that we can jump from community to community, not just nationwide news here, but we are worldwide. If we get international feeds that we are capable of taking, we'll bring them to you right here on News Now from Fox. So now I'm going to take you from New York back here to Central Florida, where our sister station, Fox 35 Orlando, put together these two pieces about the COVID-19 latest here. Again, everyone, my name is Pilar Arias. You are watching News Now from Fox. As soon as this story ends, some of you are going to see a quick two-minute break, and we will see you when you return. The U.S. passing 12 million reported coronavirus cases since the start of the pandemic. Johns Hopkins University reports.
uh, and it would have probably had an impact. Who knows? Maybe it wouldn't have. I'm sure they would have found the ballot someplace, the Democrats and the group. These corrupt games will not deter us from doing what is right for the American people. And I will always put American patients first. And I think uh, it can never be shown better than what I'm doing today. Already, we successfully lowered drug prices for the first time in 51 years. In September, we finalized a rule allowing states, wholesalers, and pharmacies to safely and legally import drugs from Canada. Career politicians have promised to institute this reform for decades, and we got it done. The reason Canada, and this is going to be, I think, just a short-term fix, because until we have the favored nations fully ready, which we hope to have be in January 1st, I think a very important thing is to say January 1st. It's right around the corner. Um, but uh, I'm giving governors the right to go to Canada because they'll pay, pay approximately 50 percent less for their drugs for, that they buy for their states. So the governors buying drugs for their states go to Canada. They buy the drugs for very, very much less, and they'll be able to pass that on to the people of Florida. Uh, Ron DeSantis uh, was the first one to ask, but others are asking also. And uh, it's a great thing. I mean, you'll save 50%. They're going to buy a lot from Canada uh, initially, and I think ultimately they'll be comparing prices. You'll get the lowest price anywhere in the world, so you won't need to buy from Canada. In a few weeks, my administration will also finalize rules requiring federally funded health centers to pass drug company discounts on insulin and EpiPens directly to patients, and the EpiPen prices come way down. We remember those horrible stories about EpiPen. Well, the prices now come way, way, way down. We capped insulin costs for many seniors at just $35 a month, as I said, saving them an average of nearly $500 to $1,000 a year just on insulin saving $1,000 a year on insulin. Since I took office, we've reduced Medicare Part D premiums by 12 percent, putting nearly $2 billion back into seniors' pockets. Now, 12 percent is great by any standard, but 12 percent is peanuts compared to what we've done with favored nations. It's, uh, I think it's probably the biggest story that we've ever had relative to drug prices. There's never been anything like this. This is uh, something that has been talked about for many years, but nobody had the courage to do it because of the power of Big Pharma. We ended the gag clauses that prevented pharmacists from telling patients how to buy less expensive drugs. As you know, pharmacists could not talk to patients about how to buy drugs. How about that one? I think that's right. And now they can and should. We approved a record number of affordable generic drugs for three years in a row, and we put a very hemp a very heavy emphasis on generic drugs. And uh, the pricing there has become very good, but that pricing will also go down very substantially. No administration has ever fought harder or achieved more for our patients and for our seniors. But for America, when you think of it, for America, because other countries were paying a fraction of what we were paying, in some cases a small fraction. I mean, it was, it was uh, what the numbers were just staggering. The difference between going to, I won't name nations, but I could uh, name five of them right off the top of my head, that uh, it, it is so incredible to think about for years what was happening. We've been working on this for two years. Statutorily, we had to go through a process. But when you think that our nation, for the exact same pill out of the exact same box, often made in the exact same factory, same company, and you take a look at uh, the cost was so much more, many, many times more. In four short years, we've instituted the most dramatic series of drug pricing reforms in decades, and you'll see that it all comes to fruition right now, starting on January 1st, and the American people will benefit from our actions for many, many decades, and it should be very immediate. Now, I presume they'll sue, but it's a suit that they should never be able to win. Uh, they should never, ever be able to win. So now I'd like to ask Secretary Azar to provide some more details as to the action. And then, Seema, I'd like to have you come up and say a word, few words. And uh, great job. We appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary. Well, thank you, Mr. President. What an extremely exciting day for American health care. 
On top of the news that you just made, today, Pfizer will be filing a Hey, everybody. I think it's a Monday. <laughs> Sorry for the brief interruption there in the content. We were trying to bring you the latest from right here, Central Florida, our sister station, Fox 35 Orlando. Two separate reporters, matter of fact, helping us out. We had, let me make sure I give credit to where credit's due. Jessica Albert and Amanda McKenzie. Jessica covering Adamall Outlet, precautions taken for holiday shopping. And Amanda McKenzie covering County Parks, expect rush of COVID testing in anticipation of the holidays. So again, let's listen in right here on News Now from Fox. As always, thanks for your patience and understanding. It's definitely a Monday morning of a holiday week. In the U.S. passing 12 million reported coronavirus cases since the start of the pandemic. Johns Hopkins University reporting almost 180,000 new cases on Sunday and nearly 1,500 new deaths in Florida. The state is reporting just about 6,600 cases on Sunday. Thanksgiving and the holiday season now at the top of mind for many people. Good day, Orlando has live team coverage here for you this morning. Fox 35's Jessica Albert is live in Orlando with more on the crowds who are just filling up the shopping centers. But we do want to begin with Fox 35's Amanda McKenzie because she's live at Barnett Park for us once again this morning. And Amanda, good morning to you. Some people once again waiting for hours this weekend to be tested. That's right. Some people waited more than two hours in line to get tested. Demand is up and test sites are working hard to meet that need. Long lines as Orange County sees record numbers of people getting a free COVID-19 test. Officials don't expect the demand will slow down anytime soon. We think it's primarily due to the, the holiday season coming up, families visiting, and those traveling as well. Some waiting more than two hours at the Barnett Park COVID-19 testing site. We're going to visit some family for the holidays. No symptoms. We're just doing it just to be cautious. The site offers both the molecular and rapid antigen tests. No symptoms are necessary and no appointment is required. Now, this test site here at Barnett Park will now be open seven days a week, but they will be closed on Thanksgiving Day. Reporting live in Orange County, Amanda McKenzie, Fox 35 News. Amanda, thanks. As many people waited for uh, tests, others packing shopping centers. Take a look at the video here at Shoppers at the Orlando Violent Premium Outlet Mall on Sunday. Our live team coverage continues with Jessica Albert. Jessica, health officials are sharing concerns now as, of course, cases rise. Good morning. Good morning, Ryan and Fox 35 did talk to a local health expert who says that holiday shopping can be safe if you're careful, which is good news because we expect the malls to be very busy ahead of Thanksgiving and Black Friday. Risk versus benefit. You know, I know that it's really fun to go out shopping, but how much risk are you willing to take? The holiday shopping season is in full swing at Orlando Vineland Premium Outlets, despite the CDC recommendations to limit indoor activities this Thanksgiving. If you live with your grandparents, maybe you shouldn't take too much risk. The walkways of this particular mall are outdoors. Guests are required to wear masks and there are signs telling them to stay six feet apart. Dr. Todd Husty says shoppers shouldn't worry about getting COVID-19 through touching surfaces. Many months ago, they, they, we really found out that the vast majority of transmission really is through respiratory. I mean, it, it, it's not through contact. Does that mean that we shouldn't worry about it at all? Well, no, not very much at all. So still good hand washing. He says it's okay to go shopping, but if you find yourself in a crowded store, you should leave. And for people who do not want to take part in traditional shopping, you can also shop online or you can do curbside pickup at many of the stores here at the outlets. Reporting live in Orange County, Jessica Albert, Fox 35 News. All right, thanks to our sister station, Fox 35 Orlando, for both of those updates. We're continuing on with our top stories from across the country, everyone. My name is Pilar Arias. Thank you so much for being here. Hopefully, you are having a great Monday and start to the week. Some people, it's only a three-day work week. 
Again, we're taking a live look at the Capitol. The sun is rising. It is cloudy there in D.C. It's also cloudy here in Orlando. I'm looking outside the uh, building here, and I'm definitely seeing some clouds. The sun is there, but not nearly as bright as it normally is. We're coming up on the 7 o'clock hour. Some of you are going to be taking a quick commercial break. We will see you in two minutes. And for everyone else, we're going to continue on with our top stories. Let's first head on out to Wisconsin, where uh, police made an arrest in connection with the mall shooting in Wauwatosa. The suspected gunman, a 15-year-old boy, Fox's Chris DeMeo, has this story right now on News Now from Fox. All right, doesn't appear like there's any audio with this story, but that is a okay because we've got a backup plan and we've got the information from our sister station. So, Fox 6 Milwaukee is reporting that Wauwatosa police said a 15 year old was arrested in Friday's shooting at Mayfair Mall that injured eight. Wauwatosa Police Chief Barry Weber said in an update yesterday it was an altercation between two groups injuring four, quote, innocent bystanders. A Wauwatosa Police Department spokeswoman added yesterday, quote, several arrests have been made, but we are still investigating those. Chief Weber said the 15-year-old is Hispanic and a firearm was recovered at the scene of his arrest. Weber said he didn't release photos of the alleged shooter to preserve the investigation and because an initial investigation did not reveal an immediate danger to the public. Again, this is all from our sister station, Fox 6 in Milwaukee. The chief offered few details on the arrest, only that it took place after a young man had left the mall property on foot after Friday's shooting. A Wauwatosa Police Department spokeswoman said he was arrested Saturday night following the execution of search warrants. Chief Weber said he believes the boy was arrested during a traffic stop. The chief said the shooter exited the mall as shoppers were running out. The chief said the process to clear the mall for all 1.2 million square feet took six hours with seven tactical teams. This after calls came in for shots fired 249 in the afternoon Friday. Chief Weber said first responders were on the scene within 30 seconds and their first priorities being securing the mall and rendering first aid. Police said Sunday those injured were continuing to recover and that most have been released from the hospital. So that's the latest there. We're hearing a 15-year-old boy was arrested as a result of the Mayfair Mall shooting in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Continuing on now again, taking a live look at the U.S. Capitol in our nation's capital. I'm actually going to let you listen in, though, to the latest news conference from the police on this incident. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. We are here to provide some information regarding the shooting at Major Mall that occurred on Friday, November 20th. The way this conference will proceed, proceed is that Chief Barry Weber will be making a statement. Mayor McBride is also here as well. Once the chief makes his statement, I will come back up to the podium to answer any follow-up questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Barry Weber. I am the Chief of Police for the City of Wauwatosa Police Department. Today, I will provide you some updates to the shooting that occurred on Friday, November 20th, 2020 at Mayfair Mall. The Wauwatosa Police Department is pleased to announce the arrest of a 15-year-old Hispanic male in, in connection with the shooting at Mayfair Mall. The suspected firearm used in the incident was also recovered at the scene of the arrest. Around 2.49 p.m. on that day, officers were notified of shots fired inside the mall near the lower level Macy's. And it's, uh, the um, main entrance way. Officers were on scene providing medical aid to the victims within 30 seconds of receiving the phone call. An officer's first priority in this situation is to secure the immediate scene and begin rendering first aid. During this time the shooter exited the mall as other patrons were running out. Unaware that the shooter had left the mall and a perimeter was established and tactical, tactical teams were formed to begin clearing the mall of patrons, sheltering in place, as well as searching for the suspect. 
the process to completely secure the mall, which contains 1.2 million square feet of space, took approximately six hours and involved seven tactical teams. While tactical teams were securing the mall, investigators were interviewing victims and witnesses to aid in the identification of the shooter. Multiple leads that were obtained during this time period, which resulted in numerous hours of investigation, it is important to stress that these types of investigations not only require the identification of a suspect, but preservation of evidence related to the crime. This presents a cautious balance for us as to what to release to the public versus per potential destruction of the evidence, compromising our case. Our initial investigation led us to believe that this was not a riot, not a random, and therefore no immediate danger to the public existed. existed. Photos of our suspect were not released to media for fear of compromising the investigation and potential destruction of evidence. It is important to stress that this act of violence was not a random one, but an altercation between two groups. As often happens in these types of situations, innocent bystanders are injured. There were four innocent bystanders that received non-life-threatening injuries during this incident. We extend our well wishes and prayers to them for a speedy recovery. On behalf of the Wauwatosa Police Department, I would like to thank the numerous agencies that assisted in this investigation. The bravery, professionalism, and service to community shown by all first responders was exemplary. As a result, the city of Wauwatosa and Mayfair Mall remain a safe community and shopping destination. I would like to express special thanks to our officers, detectives, the FBI, Milwaukee Police Department, City of Brookfield Police for their commitment and invaluable assistance among others. I'm so proud of the personnel in our police department. They have worked tirelessly to solve this case quickly. We've gotten support from so many agencies and law enforcement here in Wisconsin and really all of southeast of the part of the state and in Wauwatosa continues to showcase the professionalism and capability that citizens have come to expect. Mayfair Mall is a wonderful place to shop and is a safe place to be. Oftentimes people ask you, is it a safe place to, to, to go shopping? And yes, it is. Unfortunately, in our society, an incident of this type can happen at any time in any place. I encourage people to show their support for Mayfair. They have been wonderful partners for us uh, at the police department for many years. In closing, Whenever a critical incident like this happens, we receive many inquiries from citizens and news media demanding more information and speculating why we aren't providing more. Understand in almost every incident we have more information than we can release. We cannot risk compromising the recovery of evidence, information, or location of the suspects. Thank you for being here and we'll now take any questions if you have some. There were several members of those groups that were injured during this altercation, yes. How, did they all know each other? We are still investigating that, uh, their connections. Were, did they, did anybody else have weapons on them? Was anyone else arrested? Uh, several arrests have been made, um, but we are still investigating those. Can you tell us about the weapon that was used? I do not have those details. Uh, surveillance video, is, is, that, is that available for us? Have you guys seen any video from inside the mall? There is surveillance video uh, that was not released as the chief had, was not released as the chief had mentioned due to the investigation and the leads that we had. Can you talk about injuries sustained? All of the injuries were non-life threatening. Um, most of the victims have been released and are, are recovering at home. What do we know about the We do not. We are still investigating that. Where was the teen arrested? I do not have that location. Who, who was the 15-year-old targeting the teen? I do not have that information as well. We are still looking into the details regarding that. Were they gang members? I do not know that. Do we know how these suspects said he was exiting while patrons were also leaving the mall? Do we know um, how he left the property, if he did it all? He left the property on foot based on video that we have seen. So have all, everybody involved 
much they've all been released from the hospital? I believe most of them have been released. There may be uh, one or two victims that are still uh, receiving medical treatment. When did you, did, did officers find him? Did he turn himself in? How, did, how could you talk about the arrest itself, how it took place? Uh, based on some investigative leads, we obtained some search warrants, and the suspect was arrested based on that information. Is, is he from Wauwatosa, Milwaukee? He's a Milwaukee resident. Can you tell us when that arrest was made? Uh, last night sometime. Uh, I think that the public was, was wondering why a picture hasn't been released. According to police witness accounts of the suspect was that he was a white male. In his 20s or 30s, it was a really bad description. Could you talk about, you know, how long you guys knew of, of, of the suspect and, and why, again, pictures or videos weren't released? Thank you. Yeah, I think the uh, initial information that was put out was was erroneous about uh, who we were looking for. We had we knew that we were looking for a white male, but we didn't know an age or anything. Uh, later that evening, we started developing some leads, and we thought it might be somebody younger than than the person that uh, was described. And uh, and of course, once we focused in on who the uh, actual suspect turned out to be, being that uh, he was a juvenile, we were not going to re release that picture at all. Did the video help you find the suspect? Yes, I believe so. Anything about how he was captured? Um, I, I think that he was in a vehicle or something, and uh, if I recall, and he was uh, they, they pulled over the car and uh, and, and s scooped him up there. Was the weapon found? The weapon was found. Do you know anything about the owner of the gun? I do not. I don't. Was the weapon in the vehicle? That that I'm not sure. You know, and, and I don't mean to be evasive, but this is this is so new stuff that's that's coming through. We wanted to get it out that the the person's in custody, because there's no other threats to the public, and everybody who is involved, we believe, are, are have been uh, um, taken into custody. So there's nothing more as far as that goes. So I know you said search warrants. Did one of the other shooting victims tell you about the suspect? Don't have the particulars. You know, the reports are still being written and all that too. So I don't have all that. I don't know if there were any other weapons, not that I'm aware of. Do we know if the suspect came to the mall to settle with a dispute, or is this something that happened? Right now I'd just be speculating because it seems, and we've seen this in the past, where people have come to the mall and uh, seem to want to settle their scores. And, and uh, But we do know that there was some sort of altercation, and then and that's when the bullets started flying. So. Is there a confirmation of how many bullets were actually shot? I, I've heard some different numbers, so I, I, I would probably be giving you some wrong information be, because it always changes. So we're, we're going to have more for you as, uh, as in the next couple of days and stuff, too, and we'll we have some other things. What time was the suspect arrested I don't have the specific details. I know it was in the evening time. Yeah, in the evening sometime. Can you kind of talk about I, I'm not sure that they've even brought it to the district attorney yet as far as what, what the discussion will be. I'm, that's usually something that probably happen tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Mayor McBride is here. At the... I don't have a lot to add other than my thanks to the Wauwatosa Police Department, the Brookfield Police Department, the Milwaukee Police Department, the FBI for helping our our great officers. And I I think the important message here is there's a it's hard and I can say this in forty years as a lawyer and I've worked in government on many levels, you want to balance getting information out to the public with making sure that the information you get to the public is factual and accurate. So it's really important for us not to speculate, and the police have been careful, I think you've heard, not to speculate here or even earlier. They've been trying to follow leads. And sometimes as a matter of good police strategy as well, it's important not to release too much information if you're trying to track down a suspect. So I hope you all appreciate the difficulties in, in an investigation of this sort. And uh, as Chief Weber said, I'm sure that as we get additional information, we'll release it to you as soon as we can. But I appreciate your interest in this. And again, 
Uh, I thank the, the police and all the partners that we had, but also the people of Wauwatosa and the Milwaukee community who have shown a lot of courage in this. And I will tell you this, uh, as soon as I leave here, I'm off to Mayfair. I have no problem whatsoever in shopping at Mayfair. I never have, and I never will. It's a safe place. So I wish you all a, a good holiday season, and I hope I see you at Mayfair. Yes, we actually do have officers that are routinely stationed at the mall on a regular basis. We have increased our patrols. Um, also with the holiday season, that naturally brings more officers to the mall just to, um, you know, un to let everyone enjoy their shopping experience. A scene like that is extremely chaotic. We had no description of the shooter when we initially arrived on scene. As the chief had spoken to, officers were rendering aid within 30 seconds of receiving that information. Our first priority is to secure a scene and to render aid to those to those injured. Um, again, you think of Mayfair Mall in the on a Friday afternoon. There are thousands of people that are shopping. One individual who's running amongst the other crowd. It, you know, it's a fair assessment to say that the police did the best they could at the time. I have not, no. Um, I've seen still photos of it. Our investigators are still trying to gather some of that surveillance video. Again, there's numerous uh, cameras within the mall. What is working, what's not, what's available, all those kind of things are still being worked on. Question for the mayor. Um, what do you say to residents who uh, have expressed concern that it's a little too soon after such a mass shooting to open up the mall? And are all the stores in the mall going to be open or just some? I, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to speak to the mall general manager. I hope to do so tomorrow. I, my understanding is that all the stores are open today. Uh, you know, as the chief pointed out, that uh, we live in a society where there are a lot of guns and a lot of people who uh, act impulsively and stupidly. And uh, this could have happened anywhere. It could have happened on the street. It could have happened uh, at a church. It could have happened at a shopping mall. It happened to happen at a shopping mall. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever to be uh, concerned at this point. Uh, again, it was, a, it was a, not a random act. And I will just say this, too, that the last time I saw the numbers, I think there are 16 million people a year who go to Mayfair. That's like filling Miller Park uh, 365 days a year. It's an awful lot of people, and as uh, Sergeant Pavlik said, uh, it can get chaotic, so it's kind of hard to find the, somebody who's running away. But um, there are a lot of people there, and there will be a lot of people there, and they're going to be happily shopping, and they're going to be safe because uh, the mall security will make sure that's true, and our good police officers will as well. Well, I certainly see a deeper problem in society. Children shouldn't have guns. And Mayfair has a strict no-gun policy, and uh, people should not be bringing guns to malls. State law says that private property owners can exclude guns from their premises. Mayfair has uh, that rule, and people should follow that rule. Unfortunately, there are people who break rules and break laws, and from time to time that has negative, uh, a negative impact. Mayor, any thoughts on the MAGA protesters who decided to come the next day, some armed, to protest the, you know, just a block away from the mall a day after right. such a tragic shooting? That rally, as I understand it, was uh, planned for at least a week uh, prior to the shooting. Uh, I think it was unfortunate that they chose to come despite what happened the day before. I don't think people should come to political rallies with guns. Uh, we need to respect the First Amendment rights of everybody to uh, stage a political rally or a protest. But uh, again, I, I don't think uh, if it had been up to me, I would have said, please, do not come. Do not bring guns. Honor the fact that our community is suffering right now and needs to heal. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, that's the latest from police there in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. The mall shooting, they're saying that a teen is in custody. We are taking a live look now at Times Square in New York City, where it looks like there's still a little bit of rainfall happening in the Big Apple. Hope you all had a great weekend. The reason I'm taking you there live is because next we've got their governor, Andrew Cuomo, latest about COVID-19. Let's listen in. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Almost 7.15, so some of you are going to see a quick two-minute commercial break. When we return, we will be listening to Andrew Cuomo. Superintendent for the Department of Financial Services, uh, who's been working with us on this project over the past few days. Today is day 267. Everybody asks me the same question. Where are we and what's going to happen? That's all that people ask me. Where are we? Just to get our bearings, today is Sunday. We're in New York City. That's in the United States of America. We're four days until Thanksgiving, five days until Black Friday. 33 days until Christmas, 39 days until Christmas Eve. That's where we are. This is the challenging period. <clears throat> A lot of discussion about COVID. You listen to the talking heads on uh, cable news. You come up with all sorts of different variations of what's going to happen. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be an apocalypse. Another station will say, don't worry about it, it's all going to be fine. What is the problem we're trying to deal with and what are the consequences? The problem is that this is a dangerous period because you have increased social activity by definition. That's what happens between now and New Year's Eve. Uh, there are more parties. People are shopping, students are coming home from college in states with higher infection rates. Uh, there are more family gatherings. 37 days between today and January 2nd of significantly increased social activity. That's what's going to happen, right? What do we expect? We expect People will eat more than usual, and on average, will put on five more pounds. Why is that relevant? It's not really relevant. Then why did I put it in there? Because it evidences the social behavior of the season. People put on average of five pounds. Why? Because they're eating a lot. Why? Because they're at family gatherings and sitting at the table and visiting, and that is the season. That's what happens. Well, what is going to happen to the COVID rate? I believe the COVID rate will increase, just as I believe most New Yorkers will put on weight. The only question is how much and how fast. And nobody knows, and there are scenarios. You have moderate trajectory, you have a low trajectory that goes up, or you have a terrible spike. Nobody can tell you because nobody knows, because it depends on how we act. How much weight are you going to put on? It depends on how much you eat. That's a silly analogy. No, it's not. It is a function of social behavior during this period. It's up to individuals and it's up to individual communities. Communities across this state behave very differently than other communities. This state as a whole operates much differently than other states across the country. So it's literally up to you and it's up to your community. That's what we mean by the microcluster strategy. 
It's up to you in your community. A micro cluster is small. It's your neighborhood. Uh, it could be a couple of miles uh, in, in ge geography. It is literally your community. The advantage is we get to say to people, beware of your own activity in your own community. We get to target more closely enforcement activities. If we put in economic restrictions, we don't have to restrict everyone. Just because Hollis, Queens is, has a high infection rate, it's my hometown, I can say it, doesn't mean all of Queens has to close down just because Hollis, Queens uh, is uh, out of control. And then the micro cluster zone increases at, if the zone increases, right? Three levels of action, yellow zone, orange zone, red zone, going up with the infection rate. You hit 2.5%. Outside of New York City, it's 3.4%. Why is it lower in New York City? There's more density. You go to a yellow zone. What happens if I'm in a yellow zone? House of Worship goes to 50%, mass gatherings 25, indoor dining for person max. Schools are open, but you have to do mandatory 20% testing in the school. Up one notch is an orange zone. 3% of New, New York City, 4.4 4 to 5 outside of New York City. Orange zone, scale up the restrictions. House of Worship goes to 33, mass gatherings go to 10, businesses uh, we close the high-risk non-essential, such as Jim's personal care. Dining for people, uh, outdoor only. Schools must go to remote, no in-person, with a test-out option. What does that mean? It means the school closes for a couple of days, you clean the school, the school can either go remote or the school can test the students and reopen, okay? You go to a red zone, that's our highest zone, red zone, 4%, houses of worship to 25, mass gatherings prohibited, business essential only, dining takeout only, schools remote, again with a test out option. So even in a red zone, the school isn't closed. The school can be open, but you have to test the students and make sure that they are negative. Those are the three levels of zones. You get beyond 4%, you're in a different arena altogether. Uh, and you're in serious territory. Up to 3%, which makes the state orange zone, school districts control what they do with their local schools. Why? Historically, education is controlled locally. Local school district, local superintendent, they have local elections for uh, the school board. Localities are very proprietary about their control of their school. New York City, you have mayoral control. The mayor is basically in control of the schools. What the law says is up to 3%, local governments, you're in charge. Do whatever you want to do remote, hybrid, whatever your parents agree to, you can do. At 3%, state law governs because you're going to an orange zone. Okay? Is that clear? So they have local control up to 3%. Uh, and you have local, you have 700 school districts across the state. You have a whole variety of options. Some are in person, some are remote, but at 3%, local control goes away, state law governs, and you go to an open uh, orange zone, 
the school has to be cleaned, you have to do additional testing, and you can reopen the school if the positivity rate is low. All right? As you can see, we want schools open. All the leading experts say keep K to 8 open. The positivity rate in the schools is lower than the positivity rate in the surrounding community. It's safer for the child to be in the school than in the community. Not to mention the child's getting an education, uh, parents, etc. So we want to keep schools open. Junior high and high is a different story. There, the students are less responsible and there's generally a higher infection rate. Now, I want to just clear up a little confusion. Uh, 3%. When is 3% not 3%? Because nothing is easy. 3%, the way the state determines 3%, is it's an average over the past seven days, because day to day the number bounces like a basketball going down the court, right? It's 2 4, or 3 1. So it's a seven day average, and then that number has to hold constant for 10 days, all right? We don't want zones going in and going out. Uh, so we want to make sure they're based on solid data. So it's a rolling average, and then the zone has to stay at that number for 10 days. Local governments across the state publish their own numbers. How does this happen? The state collects all the testing data, and then we send it to the local governments. Some local governments change factors and will have a slightly different number than the state. I believe it's confusing and unnecessary, but it is also irrelevant because the state law governs, and once the state says it hits 3% or 4%, that's what matters. But when people say, well, my county says this, my mayor says this. We do all the testing. We send them the numbers. Sometimes they change what tests count because of timing. Sometimes they change. They don't uh, remove duplicate positive cases. So there'll be some fluctuations. It's confusing, but it's also irrelevant. Is 3% safe? 3% is the safest margin being used in the United States of America. 3% gives us a margin of error that if we hit three, we have time to correct before the situation gets out of control. And remember, the three is a real three, which will then designate a microcluster and then we work with that microcluster to reduce the number. How safe is three? It is so safe that 46 states are now above 3%. If 3% was a national standard, 46 states would be a zone. Isn't that amazing? It's because New York State's overall infection rate is so low. We have the fourth lowest infection rate in the United States of America. God bless New Yorkers. The only states with a lower infection rate, Vermont, Hawaii, and Maine. Beautiful states, all of them. But, not really but, and more rural than New York, lower density than New York, doesn't have the big cities of New York. So Vermont, Hawaii, Maine, and then New York. Every other state is higher. 3%, 3% is right above New York. Massachusetts, 3.2. That's how safe 
3% is. And look at how high these numbers are going in the country. Wyoming is at 51%. We're talking about 3%. Wyoming's at 51. South Dakota, 46. Iowa, 45. I mean, it's amazing what's going on in this country. And it's amazing how good a job New Yorkers are doing at keeping the rate down. Context is important. What people should be asking now is what is my community's infection rate? Not what is the state rate, because it's different across the state. What is my community's infection rate? Because it's your community that's going to determine if you go into a yellow, orange, or red zone, right? Highest rates we have are Western New York, 6%. Lowest is the North Country, one3 but look at that variance. Finger Lakes, 2.5. Mohawk Valley, 2.1. Central New York, 2.6. Southern Tier, 1.5. Uh, you see all across the state the variance. You see by community the variance. Tonawanda, 6.8. Orchard Park, 6.9. West Seneca, 8%. Lancaster, 9%. That must be the highest in the state, Lancaster. Yes. 9%. So it's not, it's not where, what's the inf state infection rate. It's not even what's my regional infection rate. What is your community's infection? We're going to continue to listen in on New York Governor Andrew Cuomo when we return in just a couple moments here on News Now from Fox. Chester, 6.4. Look within New York City. You, if you're in Forder Manor, 3.9. You have parts of Staten Island, 5.6. Sheepshead Bay, 2.9. Bensonhurst, 3.2. Where's Queens? Queens boy always looks for Queens. Elmhurst 4, Corona 4, Woodside 3.3. So you see the variance? Even within New York City. How high will the infection rate go? I don't know. But there's going to be two points of, I believe, increase. We don't know how significant. December 1, December 10, you'll start to see the results of what happened over the Thanksgiving weekend. Right? People get infected, the, you need an incubation period for the virus, they then start to get sick, they then start to show up at the hospital. So December 1, December 10, you'll see the results of Thanksgiving weekend. After Thanksgiving, you go into that period of hyper-social activity. I think after New Year's Eve, January 2nd, January 10th, January 15th, then you'll see the collective impact of all 37 days, right? After New Year's Eve, everything slows down a little bit. New Year's Day, everybody has a little bit of a hangover. They go home, they go to sleep. Hopefully, the infection rate stops. I didn't mean that you personally have a hangover. I'm just saying, generally. But uh, if you ask me, when are we out of the woods here, this increased activity period, you'll know where you are January 10, January 15. So what if the rate goes up? So what? Everybody's talking about the rate going up. Let it go up. The rate goes up. There are more restrictions to slow the economy. That's bad for business. Rates go up, you overburden the hospital system. You overburden doctors, nurses, you can have possible equipment supplies. Numbers go up, people die. People die. Period. It is a mathematical equation. More people will die the more the rate goes up. Unless you are extraordinarily casual 
about human life, it matters. It matters. Even if you say, I don't care what happens to the economy, close everything. I don't care about the hospitals. People will die. And that's a fact. Best I can do, warn people, and then show them the scale every day. Show you your numbers every day in your community. Because you can change what you do you do, and you can change how your community acts. And aside, people say, oh, don't worry, there's a vaccine. I understand there's going to be a vaccine. What difference does it make? The vaccine's coming. The vaccine is starting to come December, January, depending on who you believe. It will be for first high-need populations, nursing homes, etc., I will wager you dollars to donuts it's six months at a minimum before you hit critical mass with the vaccine. You can't take six months of unrestricted increase. The numbers for today, the micro cluster zones 4.3, statewide with the micro cluster zones I'm sorry, statewide without the microclusters, 2.2. Statewide with the microclusters, 2.7. 196,000 tests, 30 deaths, 2,562 hospitalizations, 500 ICU, 234 intubations. 30 people passed away. There are no thoughts and prayers. That's the only number on that chart that really means anything to me. We have several communities that are in the warning track. I hate sports analogies for those people who don't know them. Warning track is the track just before the uh, fence when the, you're running to catch the ball and it's going to be a home run. Warning track turns into dirt so you don't run into the wall. I always ran into the wall anyway. Parts of Staten Island will go into an orange zone. Parts of Staten Island will go into a red zone at the current rate. Staten Island is a serious problem. Staten Island uh, is also a problem in terms of overburdening hospitals. And we're running into a hospital capacity issue on Staten Island that we have to be dealing with over these next few days. Parts of the city of Syracuse will go into an orange zone at this rate. Parts of the city of Rochester will go into an orange zone. Upper Manhattan will go into a yellow zone. Parts of Nassau will go into a yellow zone. Parts of Suffolk will go into a yellow zone. How much weight will I put on over the holidays? How high will the infection rate go? Depends on what we do. You have a trajectory where it goes so high, the whole scale changes. You know, we're now down there as the fourth state at three. You see those other states, 20, 30, 40. You could see our whole scale change by the time this is over. I would not be shocked if they said on January 10th, January 15th, we're up at 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. That could very ha easily happen if we are irresponsible. It could even be higher if we're irresponsible. It's purely a function of what we do. Questions? Yeah, so on Staten Island and, and Upper Manhattan, you're saying they, they will go into different zones this week, or you're saying it looks like they're going to enter those zones? It look, uh, right now, by the numbers, remember our numbers we don't use day-to-day -day numbers because they bounce. So we use a seven-day average, and then uh, once you hit that seven-day average, the number stays constant for 10 days. Unless they dramatically change the trajectory of the infection rate, this week they will go into those zones. Does that make sense? to the discrepancy with the city numbers, why is it better in the state's opinion 
to report that data based on when the test results come in as opposed to the city's method as of when the tests are taken? Well, the, the, the real difference with the city's numbers is that, first of all, the city's number is legally irrelevant, right? So I think it just causes more confusion because it's the state's number that determines any action. The only relevance of the city's number is what they do below three. But once it hits three on the state number, the city is irrelevant, right? I understand the main difference in the testing and this gets into the weeds because different scientists have different methods. The city counts duplicate positives, meaning if you go and get a test today and you test positive and then you go home for two or three days and you think, I'm, I think I'm over this and you go for a second test, they count that as two positives. We count that as one positive because it's... Are you, are you doing the antigen tests? Because the antigen... No. Okay. The, uh, the all full tests. Test. For all tests. Okay. But all tests. For all tests. But the state is also counting the antigen test data and the city is not, right? And what is the epidemiological... I don't know. Do you know? So there's three basic differences between how the state does this and how the city does this. And there's all... You can talk to many different public health experts who will give you the advantages and disadvantages of each different kind. The first is, Clayton, as you mentioned, the specimen collection date versus the reporting date. If you look at, when you do it on the seven-day average for both the city and the state, there's very little difference if you look at it on the averages, especially if you go back, let's say, a week, because those numbers balance out over time. So that really shouldn't result in much difference. The advantage to how the state does it is that if our number is 2.7% today, that number is 2.7% today a month from now, two days from now, a week from now. We don't, there's no, we don't backfill any numbers. So there's advantages and disadvantages to both sides. Antigen testing, any test that is licensed by the FDA or the New York State Department of Health to detect the current infection, if it's an antigen test, PCR test, we would count that because if you tested positive on an antigen test, you would be required to quarantine. Now, many people who might test positive on an antigen test per Department of Health guidance, we put out extensive guidance about how to read these results, might seek a, a, con a confirmatory PCR test. If you test positive on both, we would, both, we would only count one of those. So this, uh, if you look at the, you know, if you solely look at antigen testing, is that making the numbers different? Not really, because the antigen testing numbers and the PCR testing numbers alone aren't, aren't, that, aren't that different. They're, as the governor said, what we believe is the, the discrepancy here is really that we don't include that duplicate positive, and the city does in their numbers. Yeah, okay. I mean, along those lines, we're now seeing very long lines at CityMD and other private clinics. We know in the worst of this, we had a big backup with the national labs. Are you seeing that same kind of backup, and is that having any effect on the data right now? So in terms of the, the, the two different questions, one is the wait times at testing sites, and the second is the lag times at labs. Our lag, the lag times we are tracking have not increased uh, at all, really, amongst the, the larger labs and the smaller labs. We have a network of hundreds of labs in the state that are operating on one to two day turnaround times. We still have uh, 85 to 90 percent of our results coming back within 72 hours, which is very good. In terms of the wait times, we have multiple state-run sites in the city that are just uh, collection sites that are running under capacity. There's, I know, reports of H and H sites that have plenty of capacity. I know there is a preference among many to go to the urgent care clinics where you can get your results immediately and that are might be more convenient. We have sites that are coming back to us and saying we have excess capacity here to uh, to do more testing. And we've also been trying to get more rapid testing and more testing supplies to some of these urgent care clinics so they can meet some of that demand. Yeah, let me, may, let me just follow up uh, on how you count, what tests you count, what tests you don't count. If you don't count antigen tests, you leave out hundreds of thousands of tests, right? We do all the nursing home workers. We do uh, hundreds of thousands of antigen tests per week. So you would significantly reduce the database. And the antigen test gets you the results faster, so uh, you have a better idea of where you're going. 
But my basic point is, yeah, you can have scientists argue this all day long. Why confuse people since the New York City number is irrelevant? It's irrelevant. It doesn't determine if a school opens. It doesn't unless up to three. It doesn't determine whether a restaurant or a bar opens or a church opens or a synagogue opens. It is irrelevant. So why confuse people? And I said that with the other elected officials across the state. Uh, well, my Department of Health wants to count this. All right, but your number is irrelevant. So it's just confusing. But it does appear to be irrelevant in this case because the 3% threshold according to the city's data was the justification for closing schools last week. That's all up to them. Yes, but they could say three, but by the way, it's now four, or it's five, or it's six, or I decided not to do it, or I got new data, or I turned on the TV, and every leading expert said it's better to keep the schools open, right? That's all in their control. The only thing what's not in their control is when they hit three, their control is gone and it becomes an orange zone. On the testing, people have to understand this. We have 420 sites in New York City. Some sites are being overrun and some sites are being underused. I don't know why. I don't know what, what makes some sites more popular than other sites, but I tell my people, we have 420 Dunkin' Donuts in New York City. Some Dunkin' Donuts have a line going out the door. Some Dunkin' Donuts, you can walk right up to the counter. Look at the availability of the 420. They will tell you how long the wait is. We need to better distribute the volume over all the testing sites. I don't know why people, why do people uh, prefer or the as you can see, everybody, on the right-hand side of your screen, we're taking a live look at Times Square in New York City while listening in to Governor Andrew Cuomo's latest COVID-19 update. Oh, well, as long, oh, excuse me, alongside other state officials, some of you are going to see a two-minute break. We're going to continue to listen in here on News Now from Fox. Out to a lab, you're still getting it back the vast majority within 48 hours or 72 or 72 hours, and so seeking out these these other sites uh, makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's nice to know quickly, but then again, the antigen test in New York City wouldn't even count. Yes? On, on schools, on the, if New York City hits 3% for 10 straight days by the state's numbers, theoretically that would mean schools would reopen under a yellow zone. Is that yes. Correct? So, how do can you reopen? Can, can reopen. How do you anticipate someone like, uh, like Mulder, U of T, seeing that, saying our numbers go up and schools reopen? That doesn't seem to, to mesh. That is the law, and Mr. Mulgrew knows the law, and the law is the law. And by the way, we just did this. We did. Brooklyn was a red zone, and Queens, right, two weeks ago. So we did this. It hit 3%. The schools closed. The schools could reopen, clean the school, test the student population many of the schools reopened. Some didn't, some did. But you can reopen the school because the school is safer than the local community. I mean, think about it. You have 3% infection rate in the community. The school is under half a percent. Why would you want the child to go to stay, stay at home, which means they're not going to stay at home. It means they're going to go outside, they're going to run around in a 3% community, right? Not being educated. Have them go to the school where the positivity rate is 0.5. So if, if you could have, theoretically, you could have kept the schools open here. They're closed now through Thanksgiving and however many weeks longer than that. And the track right now would show that they would reopen once the numbers go up again. So why have parents go through this back and forth? Because the local government controls schools and always has, and they're very proprietary about it. Uh, people buy houses, not so much in New York City, a little bit. People buy homes based on school districts in this state. 
when you go to buy a house in Westchester County, they don't say, I want to live in Montesco. They say, I want to live in the Chappaqua School District. You know, that local control is uh, really a fundamental premise of our entire system. I was being aggressive saying, you can have local control, but only up to 3%. Uh, because 3%, things get serious. So you have control up to the 3. But when we hit 3, then the state law is going to govern, period. Now, you have school districts all across the state. You have 700. They're all doing different things. Some are open, some are closed, some are remote, some are hybrid. Uh, if they hit 3, then the state law governs, and that is uh, uniform across the state. I thought that was a fair compromise because it honored local control. Uh, but when it became a public health issue, at, which is 3%, in our opinion, then the state law governs. I got a question. Yeah, let's just make sure. Anyone else? Yeah, Governor. Um, so the state has spent forty million on. You have to be first um, Hold on. Let's do this again. Let's do it again. Just give me a second. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, Governor. there you go. <laughs> go um, speaking of individual communities, we have just seen that a few weeks ago there was a very secret Hasidic wedding where seven to ten thousand people attended, completely maskless. And I'm just wondering your reaction to this. Will there be consequences? And what's to stop this from happening that, over the holidays? That, you know, if that happened, I heard the report. If that happened, it was a blatant disregard of the law. It's illegal. It was also disrespectful to uh, the people of New York. The law protects everybody. It protects you, but it also protects me. We went through this uh, with weddings. We literally stopped the wedding uh, a couple of nights before, which was going to be a very large wedding. If it turns out that because we stopped that wedding, the reaction was, well, we'll have a secret wedding, uh, that, that would be really shocking. Uh, and totally, uh, I think, deceitful of the conversations that I had, because I had personal conversations with members of the community. But put that aside, I've been deceived many times. Uh, it's illegal, and uh, the city is, should do a robust investigation. If 7,000 people went to a wedding, you can figure that out, right? That's the problem with the secret 7,000. It's hard to keep a secret. You know, they say the only way to keep a secret? Tell no one. That's the only way to keep a secret. 7,000 people were there. It's going to be hard to uh, keep that a secret. Uh, and the city, it's uh, my information, the city is investigating. They should investigate. And if 7,000 people are at a wedding, uh, I'm sure they'll be able to figure it out. And uh, then they'll be, uh, we'll bring the full consequence of legal action to bear. The state has spent $40 million on a rent relief program and legislation was intent from the CARES Act and legislation was written with the intention to spend the full $100 million in New York. I'm wondering if the state is going to alter the program in any way to get the rest of that um, $60 million out to renters and are you considering um, widening, it, widening any eviction protections now that cases are rising again? Uh, that is such a specific question that I will bet you even Melissa doesn't know the answer. What do you want to bet? You want to bet for or against Melissa? I do not know the answer. What do you want to bet? What's the over under on whether Melissa knows the answer? I, I, I think that Melissa knows the answer. Okay, you say Melissa knows the answer. Go ahead. 
So the legislature set the parameters of that hundred million dollar fund and we've yeah. paid out 40 million as you noted that are based on those parameters. So those parameters were set in statute and every applicant that has put in an application that have met those parameters, the money has gone out the door. We're not sitting on the money. We want the money to go out to people who need it most. We are going to reevaluate what the parameters are that the legislature put into law to see if there's anything we can do to get more money out to the people who need it. Um, on the Safe Harbor Act, again, that was something that was passed in legislature legislation and that means that rent evictions cannot go forward during the pendency of the crisis. So if you have a COVID related issue with being able to pay your rent during the pendency of the crisis that stays in effect. The governor has continually extended the commercial rent eviction um, and that's something we continue to monitor on an ongoing basis because we understand the plight of business owners. And, and just on the um, rent relief though, how could, I, I understand the legislature set those parameters which has resulted in 40 million being spent, but could could you as the governor um, issue an executive order to alter it to get the money out? And would that happen in the next month or so? Is that possible? It's something that we're looking at, we're consulting with the legislative leaders on, but no money will be returned to the federal government. We will spend all of that money. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Governor, the Gateway Tunnels, you tweeted the other day that you want the Gateway to Commission to release the London Bridge Association or London Bridge Associates report on whether they can fix the current North Hudson tubes in place. Um, isn't that you just talking to yourself? Steve Cohen runs it. New Jersey doesn't even have appointees yet on the commission. Um, can't you just get Steve Cohen to release the report? And two, if that does find, if that report does find that you can fix the tunnels in place like the L train, do you, would that require a new EIS to be conducted or at least the current one to be reformed because that entire project is based on you can't fix the tunnels until you have the new ones? I do take particular pleasure in hearing you endorse the now accepted L train repair <laughs> methodology. <laughs> well, you speak about it now, the proven L train technology, <laughs> the, the well documented success story of the L train rehabilitation. I'm just kidding. Not really. The, uh, <laughs> look, my only point is um, there's a question of rehabilitating these tunnels so they're safe. As you remember, I've gone through these tunnels. I took video of these tunnels. I sent the video to the president uh, trying to encourage him because he owns them. Amtrak owns them. The president owns Amtrak. It's their tunnels. Uh, to repair the tunnels. These are the tunnels that go into the Hudson. And uh, they have done nothing. We have a report that says uh, they can be rehabilitated. I haven't seen the report. There's also a desire uh, by Amtrak and many people to build new tunnels to have additional access to New York, which I think is a good idea. But one is not the enemy of the other. The, I don't control the Gateway Corporation. Steve Cohen is my appointee. But uh, Amtrak and uh, New Jersey are the other two partners. And I don't have absolute control. If I had absolute control, I would give you the report tomorrow. Uh, I don't have absolute control. What is Steve Cohen saying? Steve Cohen says, uh, well, I told Steve Cohen to release the report. He said, fine. He said, uh, the other parties are not yet prepared to release the report. That's it. That's it. Two to one, one wins. One, well, in almost everything. Well, well, New Jersey doesn't even have their appointees on the board. Their well, that doesn't mean New Jersey. Just because you don't have an appointee doesn't mean you don't you give up your voice, right? Usually doesn't. Um, no, not uh, no. Um, I, I have another no. transportation. You call up the governor of New Jersey or the secretary of New, to the governor of New Jersey or the transportation person, and you say to New Jersey, just because you don't have an appointee. I'm not going to be totally non-collegial and disrespectful. I've got the transportation question. Uh, the uh, Port Authority released their uh, doomsday uh, budget for next year on Thursday. Um, and they, they're cutting capital spending across the board except, um, except work that's already underway and the only other exception is a $2 billion air train. Given the crunch that the Port Authority is seeing, is it still prudent to move forward with this very expensive project. The completing LaGuardia is essential, in my opinion, for New York City. It'll be the single greatest economic boost 
that has been done in generations. And with all this bad news surrounding us, uh, and all these tales of uh, possible catastrophe, to have the first airport that's opened in 25 years open in New York City is going to be a very big deal. And the air train is part of that. As far as the doomsday budget, if we don't get federal aid, everybody has a doomsday budget. Port Authority, MTA, New York City, New York State, and by the way, every state in the United States. That's why it's madness for them not to provide state and local funding. Madness. Happy Sunday. Could you talk a bit about like the coordination with the city on how that rollout is going to look? Yeah, the state is coordinating with all the local governments, but I said six months. I bet, my wager, my best estimate, six months at a minimum before you hit critical mass. Uh, healthcare employees will get it, senior citizens will get it, people with immune compromise will get it, but critical mass to where it starts to have an impact on community spread, I'll bet you it's at least six months. Think of it this way. We did, we did 12 million COVID tests to date over eight months, moving heaven and earth, every hospital, every clinic, everyone we knew. 12 million COVID tests over eight months. Antigen test, very fast. We have to do 20 million vaccinations. It took you eight months to do 12 million COVID tests. How long does it take you to do 20 million vaccinations? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. You too. Happy Thanksgiving. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to News Now from Fox. I'm your host, Regina Gonzalez, in for the next hour. Today on this Monday, November 23rd, you're taking a live look over Times Square in New York City. Three days from Thanksgiving, you can see it's pretty empty as COVID-19 restrictions and curfews are going underway. You just listened in to the latest briefing from Governor Andrew Cuomo, who mentioned Thanksgiving and holiday travel in that update and was just giving an update on what is going on as far as New York City schools, what he thinks you should be doing for the holidays. And he even mentioned a more than 1,000 person wedding that caused quite a bit of stir in Brooklyn over the weekend. So as you can see, some people are not abiding by certain restrictions in New York City. So we did want to give you that live picture right here. I'm going to say hello to you all in just one second. Let me fix my hair and do all that jazz, just like Pilar says too. That's the beauty of News Now from Fox. We are live, raw, and unedited. But good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you on this Monday morning. I hope you all had a great weekend. Like I said, we are just three days away from Thanksgiving and I must say I was at the store over the weekend and I already saw Christmas decorations. I live in an apartment complex where I see several people putting up their lights and Christmas trees. So we haven't even gotten to Thanksgiving yet. Typically a tradition in my family is to put the tree up the day after Thanksgiving. But guys, 2020 has been such an unpredictable year. It's been, it's caused a lot of chaos. So a lot of families seem to be skipping 
to Christmas ahead of Thanksgiving to just get into the Christmas cheer a little bit. So we actually have one of our Fox reporters covering this topic this morning. So I'm going to start you on a light note at the top of the hour. Let's get the latest from her on how Christmas cheer is spreading earlier and right before Thanksgiving on News Now from Fox. restrictions for Thanksgiving, like small gatherings over big family affairs, and travel discouraged, many people are instead looking past the holiday meal, focusing on decking the halls for Christmas to help bring more joy to the final months of a difficult 2020. This year has been so full of turmoil, so we're trying to enjoy as much of the you know festivities as we can, so try and get it up early. Some getting a jump on holiday decorations as early as September, hoping to harness the warmth and comfort of the season as the country faces rising COVID cases with the possibility of more lockdowns, election turmoil, and economic hardships. These people have, have looked at me in tears and saying, this is what we needed for normalcy, a sense of, of escapism, finally. Without widespread holiday travel, many will be celebrating at home, using the time to create their own winter wonderland. We wanted to enjoy it longer. We're here all the time. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas. Part of the drive to keep the Yuletide going and Christmas spirits up is continuing to honor traditions, even if the things that bring you holiday cheer look a little different this year. Once you check in, you'll have your temperature checked, then you'll wait in line, socially distanced, of course, six feet apart and then you get to see Santa. Psychiatrists say putting up holiday decorations has shown to make people happier, with one suggesting having them outside the home makes you appear friendlier. In New York, Ashley Strohmeyer, Fox News. All right, thank you for that report. As you can see, many people getting in the holiday spirit ahead of Thanksgiving. You know, 2020 has been a tough year, guys. Any excuse to put up some lights and spread a little holiday cheer, we will take it. And as people are maybe staying home for Thanksgiving, a lot of states under lockdown, not recommending family gatherings of more than 10 people. A lot of people are still hitting the roads already. It's Monday, a lot of people only have a two day work day. And in certain states, in certain states, road travel comes with precautions. Specifically in Texas, our sister station in Houston talks about how deers are still on the road despite a pandemic, and it is important to be careful, keep an eye out when you are traveling to see family this Thanksgiving. So I wanna show you this short segment on how they are speaking with AAA on how to be cautious when driving in certain areas that have a heavy deer population. I came here from West Virginia, guys. I have almost hit a deer twice. I've had several coworkers that hit deers, totaled their cars, it is not Fun. So it's definitely really important to look out for deer population, any animals, and just be safe on those roads when you are traveling to see family this Thanksgiving. So we're going to check in with our sister station in Houston and see what AAA is saying about traveling this holiday season. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox Live, raw and unfiltered, and we will have live events here coming up in just the next hour or two. So be sure to stay with us for right now. Again, we're going to head to Houston to talk to AAA about deer precautions when traveling. Well, Thanksgiving is just days away and usually it's to grandmother's house we go. Well, hopefully we're not exposing grandma to COVID this year. So all that's at your own discretion. But we've got Daniel Armbruster with AAA Texas here live with us this morning to talk about what traveling is really going to be like this week. Daniel, how are you doing? Hey, good morning, Casey. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing pretty well. Thanks for coming on. So what's it going to be like this week? How many people are really going to going to hit the roads? That's a really good question. You know, uh, if based on our forecast data back in mid-October when that data was last taken, uh, which included coronavirus and the economy and unemployment, uh, we're looking at about 50 million people that were going to travel nationwide. Uh, that was a 5 million uh, people drop from the year before. But now coronavirus cases have e exploded across the country. And so uh, that forecast now will likely uh, be even lower, fewer people. Uh, the largest year over year uh, drop in people traveling for Thanksgiving on record will likely happen this year. Wow. 
Uh, anything else we need to say about that before we move topics? Well, you know, I, I would say that if, if you are going to be traveling, uh, number one, know before you go. Know uh, what uh, state and local authorities have as far as restrictions. You can go to triptick.aaa.com, T-R-I-P-T-I-K.aaa.com, and, and you can find a virtual map there. Uh, that will tell you the restrictions in place. What's interesting right now about travel, Casey, is a lot of people aren't planning to travel for Thanksgiving as they normally would, but we are seeing an explosion of people who are planning travel for uh, next summer, 2021 and beyond already. Uh, people are ready to travel, but of course, with COVID cases rising, uh, that just is not going to be possible right now. All right. Well, I wanted to talk to you about something else uh, kind of related to Thanksgiving travel or Christmas travel or any travel for that matter. It's deer mating season right now, meaning yeah. deer are on the move, which means you have a really good chance of hitting a deer out on the roads. And Daniel, you yourself, uh, you used to be a Fox 7 reporter and you, you put that to practice here and you went out and you interviewed somebody or you did it via Zoom uh, who recently <laughs> yeah. hit a deer. Kind of, we're going to play a clip, but set this up. Who did you speak to and what happened to her? Yeah. Yeah, so I spoke with uh, Nancy McHugh. She's a AAA member who lives in Spring, Texas, which is just outside of Houston. And this is an area that used to be uh, mostly rural, but of course now with growth uh, is now uh, very well populated. But uh, nonetheless, she was on her way to church uh, one morning uh, last month, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a deer came across, and uh, right, and she struck that deer uh, as it was crossing the roadway. Wow. Let's play that clip from her. Here's her take on it. I never gave it a thought. I've seen deer on the road, on the side of the road, but never in my wildest dream did I think. And he, you know, I say I hit a deer, but I think that deer hit me. He was, I think he was on the right. He was leaping because he was on my window, you know, on my windshield. I did not see that deer until he was, <laughs> we were, well, I don't know if we were face to face. I just remember seeing antlers and maybe eyes. I'm not sure, you know. I've tried to relive that in my mind. And you really can't exactly because it happens so quickly. Scary stuff. And I'm sure that's a common experience. And what's interesting, Daniel, she says that she travels that road every day and there are no woods around. It's just buildings. Yeah, that's good. Something to think about, especially when we you're living in a, a, a populated area. It's not just rural areas where we see this happen. It's, it's, it could happen anywhere, especially if you're on the edge of rural area and uh, city growth. But, but the one thing about it is, is that what she said is it came out of nowhere. Right. Uh, and, and a lot of times you don't have a lot of time to react in these situations. So it's really important if you do see a deer in that moment, try not to overcorrect, don't uh, swerve. And if you are going to strike that deer, the last thing you want to do is slam on your brakes because what that will do is push your uh, hood down and then that deer will fly up into your windshield. And, it, of course, then it can strike you. And Texas leads the nation in fatalities from animal strikes. So certainly, uh, you know, it, it happens here frequently. I was out driving in uh, the San Saba area the other day, Casey, and I saw four to six deer uh, just laying on the side of the highway there uh, in between San Saba and Atlanta. Yeah. So... It, it's happening yeah it's scary for sure it's never happened to me knock on wood um but i've yeah. seen a lot of deer on the side of the road so good tips there daniel thank you so much and happy thanksgiving good to see you. well thanksgiving is just days away and usually it's to grandmother's house we go well hopefully we're not exposing grandma to covid this year so All right, everybody, you're watching News Now from Fox, and you are taking a live picture over New York City right now while they have seen 
Some violence over this weekend, including just last night, the NYPD is looking for at least two gunmen who opened fire at a party in a Brooklyn apartment building, injuring six people and killing one person. Police be believe the shooting at a party on Albany Avenue in Bedford Stuyvesant at about 11.15 last night was connected to a shooting during a Sweet 16 party in East New York shortly after nine last night. So we actually do have an update from uh, Robert Moses on Fox 5 New York. He is providing us the latest on this shooting here on News Now from Fox. So we're going to bring you that here. Again, any live, raw, unedited updates, we will bring you. So let's check in with Robert right now on News Now from Fox. This morning, detectives are still pouring over that apartment building just down the block here on Albany Avenue. They are looking at ballistic evidence stretching all the way up to the third floor. It was a chaotic and horrifying scene that unfolded shortly after 11 o'clock last night. Police tell us seven people were shot, four males, three females, ranging in age from 14 to 20. A 20-year-old woman was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. Police believe this shooting is connected to a Sweet 16 party earlier in the evening in another part of Brooklyn that was broken up. A teenager who was at that party was shot in the leg. He's expected to be fine. The party that was in that other part of Brooklyn relocated here. The shootings here, police say, may have been retaliation for the one that took place earlier in the night. Now, for some context here, the shootings here in Brooklyn are occurring in, amidst a spike in shooting incidents citywide. They're up nearly 95% this year compared to last year. And there's a more than 100% increase in shooting victims citywide this year versus last year. Police say they are looking for multiple shooters this morning. And those shooters, police believe, used at least two guns. In Brooklyn, Robert Moses, Fox News. All right, everybody, that was the latest on a deadly shooting that unfolded at a Sweet 16. If you heard what he said, a 20-year-old was pronounced dead at a New York City hospital. We did want to start you off on a lighter note with some Thanksgiving stories, but this is the violence that's happened not only in New York City, but across our nation over the weekend. I actually want to take you to our sister station, Fox 29 in Philadelphia right now, where there was several shootings, including a store owner shot in the head last night while closing up shop. So we have Steve Keeley from Fox 29 Philly giving us an update on the weekend violence. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox live, raw and unedited details. They actually sent us this this morning just to give us this update for News Now. So like we always do, we want to bring you the latest updates on anything going on. So let's head out to Philadelphia right now. This is Steve Keeley. Philadelphia violence in 2020 has happened in surges and we've had most of the surges on weekends like it happened again this weekend. Four fatal scenes in less than 24 hours. The violence started late on Saturday when two men were arguing inside an A-plus mini market. The argument went outside and then it got violent with guns. A 19-year-old shot and killed. The violence continued overnight when a little boy, just 12 years old, went to answer a knock at his grandmother's front door. Only home with his little sister and grandmom. Somebody knocks at quarter to three. As they may see his figure coming down the steps, they shoot through the upper window of the front door. One shot hitting him in the forehead and killing him. Then the violence continues into Sunday. Two twin brothers, both 21 years old, out with a friend. The 21-year-olds both shot. One killed their friend critically wounded. And then this scene on Ridge Avenue just before 10. To cap off this violent surge, a 50-year-old store owner is working with his 19-year-old daughter. He lives above the store, is going to shut the gates to close it at 10 last night when the 19-year-old daughter inside the store hears one gunshot, goes outside to find her father bleeding profusely from the head. When police arrived on location, they found the 50-year-old male laying on the sidewalk, leaning against the door of a convenience store. He was unresponsive suffering from a gunshot wound to his head. Police picked him up, rushed him to Temple Hospital. That 50-year-old male is in extremely critical condition, unknown whether or not he's going to survive the gunshot wound to his 
head. We don't know if it was a robbery according to family who was inside and heard it. They said the minute he walked outside to start closing up the grates, she heard a gunshot and he collapsed. She didn't hear any type of argument, so we're not certain if there's a robbery is the motive at this time. The latest surge in violence in Philadelphia puts the yearly murder total close to 440, a number not seen in nearly a quarter century. With detectives fearing uh, this year we're going to hit 500 homicides for the first year since the 1990s. At Philadelphia Police Headquarters, this is Steve Keeley for Fox News Now. All right, everybody, you're watching News Now from Fox. I'm Regina Gonzalez. Like we say all the time, we're all about the live, raw, and unedited that is happening around our nation. So you are taking a live look at a caregiver strike in Chicago. According to our station in Chicago, nearly 700 essential nursing home workers walked off the job this morning. This is at Infidy owned facilities in the greater Chicago area. They went on strike at six this morning because they want better pay, especially as they work through a pandemic. Another issue is safety. Employees say a nursing home in Cicero has the state's highest number of COVID-19 infections. The nursing home had more than 200 COVID-19 cases and at the time nine residents and one worker died. Cicero even went to court in an effort to shut it down. So the nearly 700 Infinity caregivers will walk off the job and they say their contract expired in May and they've been bargaining for a new one since June to no avail. They accuse Infinity of ending pandemic pay for workers at the end of July even though it received 12.7 million in COVID-19 funding through the CARES Act. So that is the latest out of Chicago right now. Now we do want to talk about, you know, everybody going on strike, a lot of unemployment fraud happening right now in the nation as well amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So our sister station in Milwaukee actually brought us a segment about unemployment fraud happening across the nation right now. So staying on the topic of COVID-19, I do want to bring that to you here on News Now from Fox. If we get any more updates on this caregiver strike in Chicago, we will bring them to you here right on our show as always. So again, we're going to head to Milwaukee to talk about unemployment fraud here on News Now from Fox. This is really hurtful for anybody. This is the letter that notified Albert Sarkis the state had received his application for unemployment benefits. There's just one problem. I never filed, absolutely never filed. Albert has been working full time throughout the pandemic. I needed to do two steps and then I'll be paid my unemployment even though I'm still working. Who never applied for benefits under Albert's name had his address in Wauwatosa, his social security number and work history. Albert immediately froze his credit filed a police report and called the Department of Workforce Development. She told me there is a fraud alert. There is an investigation under this claim. DWD tells Contact 6 since May 15th it's paid out $4.3 billion in unemployment insurance. But since May 18th, it suspects $5.97 million has been paid in error due to suspected identity fraud. It's millions of dollars wasted on things that could be used for helping somebody who really deserve it. Law enforcement is investigating cases of fraudulent unemployment claims. This subpoena filed by Milwaukee police in July, seeks financial records related to 19 cases of possible identity theft. 
The alleged victims are city employees, including some police officers. It reads, in all of the above incidents, an unknown person applied for unemployment benefits in the victim's name, unbeknown to the victim and without their consent. I don't want my information to be out there for anybody to apply for it. DWD tells Contact 6, fraudsters have been trying to take advantage of the high number of unemployment claims throughout the pandemic through a variety of schemes. And it has identified more than 20,000 Social Security numbers associated with suspect fraudulent activity. Albert says he was told a DWD investigator would call him to discuss his fraud investigation. Nothing happened after that. DWD says it has been fighting off fraud and hacking attempts by making system enhancements. It does use multi-factor authentication and password strength spotting and estimates its safeguards have prevented more than $53 million in fraudulent overpayments. I'm Jenna Sachs, Contact 6. All right, everybody, thank you for watching News Now from Fox. I just wanted to say hello here again. I'm Regina Gonzalez here with you for about the next half hour. Now we are bringing you all the live, raw, and unedited events happening across our nation right now. I do have some live pictures to show you at the moment. Let's take a look at Chicago, where I just mentioned there is a caregiver strike happening in the streets. Now these are about 700 essential nursing home workers who walked off the job this morning. They're bringing up issues as far as safety, saying that this nursing home that they work at had one of the highest number of COVID-19 infections. So that is a story that we're following closely here on News Now from Fox. We also have this picture of New York City that I will bring to you right now. It's a gloomy day in New York City for all of those who, of you who don't know. I am from New York, actually from Long Island. I do miss uh, such this, all the streets in the city. I was about a train ride away at home, so definitely one of my favorite things to do was hop on, go to the city, see the lights. But uh, like we brought you before, Governor Andrew Cuomo still enacting restrictions in the state of New York amid COVID-19 cases that are on the rise. Now, also something happening in the COVID-19 pandemic that our sister station, Fox 5 DC, is talking about this morning is porch pirates. People are online shopping already. We're trying to get Christmas gifts in time, holiday gifts. And with people out of work, a lot of people have resulted apparently to porch pirating and it is becoming an issue in the D.C. area. They actually have a reporter Bob Barnard on that story this morning. So I want to bring you his update from D.C. like we always do here in at News Now from Fox, the live, the raw, the unedited. This is from about about an hour ago. He sent us this update on his story that he'll be following today on UPS and FedEx robberies. So again, thank you for watching News Now from Fox. Here is Bob Barnard in D.C. Good morning. We're in the Bethesda area where the FBI for the D.C. area is uh, offering a $10,000 reward this morning because uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks there have been five either uh, armed robberies or armed uh, carjackings, primarily of uh, delivery truck drivers, FedEx, UPS, and uh, Postal Service mail carriers have been targeted because they're making a lot of deliveries. With the pandemic, more people are shopping online. People who shop online are, are ordering more online, and those deliveries in neighborhoods are, are made uh, out of trucks that are not often locked or even kept running while the drivers run uh, back and forth to the houses. And there, again, there have been a number of these robberies here in the D.C. area uh, just this month alone. Uh, D.C. police are telling us that there's been an increase of some 129 percent of carjackings uh, over this same period last year. Uh, and, and what the FBI is saying, a lot of times people are just leaving their cars running to make a, a, a quick errand, and, and you shouldn't do that. Don't leave it unlocked. Um, and uh, it's just something that they're saying they're just seeing more of now. And, and these are dangerous people. Uh, in the wanted poster that the FBI put out, you see there's a guy with a gun leaning into a truck, uh, demanding uh, the packages there. And so, uh, again, uh, the FBI is just warning people just to be on the lookout, be careful. A lot of people are ordering 
uh, iPhones and the, the new PlayStation uh, game, gaming equipment, and uh, that the thieves are not only looking for cash if they're lucky, but also those kinds of hot ticket items that are being delivered in and around uh, our areas all across the country right now. So again, this is an issue that's happening here in D.C., but no doubt happening uh, uh, likely all across the country, uh, especially at this time right now. We'll send it back into you. All right, that was the latest from Bob Barnard with Fox 5 DC on UPS and FedEx robberies on the rise as people begin their holiday shopping. Black Friday is already upon us this Friday right after Thanksgiving. We are closely following on whether or not malls stores will continue to be packed like they are every year with people trying to find those bargains. But I do want to bring you this live, raw, unedited photo, or, excuse me, not a photo. That is indeed a video of a caregiver strike happening in Chicago. It's one of the live pictures we have right here on News Now from Fox. Nearly 700 essential nursing home workers who walked off the job this morning. It's at an infin infinity owned facility in the greater Chicago area. They went on strike at around 6 this morning because they want better pay, especially as they work through a pandemic. Now, speaking of the pandemic, we do have the latest on the pandemic and the presidential race happening right now from Doug Lazader. So we do want to bring you that here on News Now from Fox. Again, thank you so much for watching on this Monday. If you're on the platform that has a chat, feel free to let us know how you are going to spend your Thanksgiving. In the meantime, here is the latest from Doug Lazader. While the legal battles continue to play out over the election, Joe Biden is quickly assembling his team with some big announcements coming this week before Thanksgiving. This may be Joe Biden's Secretary of State. And while Tony Blinken may not exactly be a household name, he has a long history in Washington's Democratic foreign policy establishment, and more importantly, a long history with Biden, at one point serving as his national security advisor. And this may all be announced tomorrow. We're going to see the first of the president-elect's cabinet appointments on Tuesday of this week, uh, meeting the pace, uh, beating, in fact, the pace that was set by the Obama-Biden transition, uh, beating the pace set by the Trump transition. An aggressive pace, but Blinken may be a relatively safe pick. The Biden team could have chosen someone like former U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice, someone that would have excited the progressive wing of the party. But any cabinet pick has to be confirmed by a Senate that may still be controlled by Republicans next year. They can pass the Green New Deal through the House or push for Elizabeth Warren at Treasury, but good luck. Good luck getting any of that through Mitch McConnell's Senate. Biden is also expected to name Linda Thomas-Greenfield as U.N. Ambassador and Jake Sullivan as National Security Advisor, expanding on the team that has already been assembled in the run-up to the transition. But there is still no official transition taking place yet, and that is leading to more and more frustration from the Biden camp. In Washington, Doug Luzader, Fox News. All right, thank you, Doug, for that latest update on the presidential race and the COVID-19 pandemic. We're showing you this live picture of a caregiver strike happening in Chicago right at this moment. These workers at a nursing facility have been on strike and marching in the streets since about 6 this morning. It's one of the live pictures we have for you on News Now from Fox. But I do want to switch gears here a little bit and take you to Florida, where attorney Ben Crump spoke in Cocoa Beach about the death of two teens in a deputy-involved shooting. So we are focusing on violence across our nation this morning. It's just several stories making headlines. So let's head out to Cocoa Beach for the latest on this story. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox. Thank you so much for watching us. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the attorney, we'll talk first, and then we're going to have the mothers and then I'm going to get a nice, real, deal, your case of questions. There's nobody else uh, besides the immediate family that needs to talk to. 
Mr. Mayor. So yes, sir. Is there is there a preacher amongst us to pray for the family before we start? Uh, yeah, we got Sammy Brown Ma, Councilwoman Sammy yeah. Brown Ma, right here, Church of God, right here. The Honorable Mr. Honorable, okay. Mr. Honorable Crump, sir. Okay. Councilwoman, that's who. Just, okay. There it is, sir. Madam uh, Councilwoman Martin, would you pray for these families in the community Certainly. to heal? Certainly. And you, you can pray. Certainly. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you, God, for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We thank you for this community, God. We thank you for every kinship that's here. Father God, you know the needs. We ask in the name of Jesus oh, yeah. that everything that's done be done for your glory and your honor. We pray that you comfort these family members. Comfort our community, Lord. You know the needs that we have, oh God. And we believe that you're able to make us whole. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I'm waiting for Ram in the bush. One thing to come next to And we have the balloon. Y'all bear with us one second. And what we're going to try to do is as much as possible when people are speaking on the mic uh, to be uh, socially distanced, we'll try to stay back uh, as much as we can. You can step up close to <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank Mayor Mike Blake for opening up this park and making sure that the families and communities were safe to come and voice their righteous anger for Yet again saying young black people killed by the people who are supposed to protect and serve them. And I thank uh, his leadership, Councilwoman Martin uh, and Coco City leadership in this matter. I'm attorney Ben Crump along with my co-counsel attorney Natalie Jackson attorney Kendall Moore, Cliff Jones from my office. We have the honor of representing the families of A.J. Crooms and Sincere Pierce. And we have their family assembled with us today. Now, I've been in trial in federal court all week, and I'm very thankful to Attorney Jackson and others for disseminating information to combat the attempts to assassinate the character of these two children, these two young men whose life was taken as they were just beginning to live. 
the fact that we've seen this playbook. We've seen it in Louisville, Kentucky with Breonna Taylor. We've seen it in Kenosha, Wisconsin with Jacob Blake Jr. And we've seen it in Minneapolis, Minnesota with George Floyd. And now we're seeing the same playbook by Sheriff Ivy in Brevard County. The fact that they tried to disseminate as much negative information about Miss Pierce's child and about Miss Groom's child as possible. Even though there is a video that clearly shows us what happened and how this unnecessary, unjustified, excessive use of force could have been avoided. The fact that instead of using the least intrusive measure of force, they used the most excessive use of force that took their lives. And Attorney Jackson is going to get into even more detail than I am, but it is very important that when you watch that video, you slow it down and you watch it for yourself. Don't accept the police narrative because if we accept their narrative, every one of our children's deaths would have been their fault. The police never, ever did anything wrong if you take their narrative. So therefore, look at that video for yourself. And all of this allegation about a stolen vehicle, well, I'm going to have Attorney Jackson re just refute completely that lie. Because that's a lie to justify these unjustifiable killings. But I'm getting a little emotional. And the reason I am, because... I got to town this morning, but even before I talk about that, it's so deep because when I was in court, Miss Pierce, I mean, my phone was blowing up about your baby and your baby. And I kept thinking to myself, man, this is getting so much attention. Um, and we know in America, they kill a lot of marginalized people of color, and most of them never get any attention at all. I mean, it's just swept under the rug. But here in Bavard County, it was getting so much attention. And I was talking to Attorney Jackson. Every day I would get out in the courtroom, and there would be the New York Times and Don Lemon and uh, Gail King from CBS all trying to ask questions about A.J. Crooms and Sincere Pierce who were killed in Bavard County. And Attorney Jackson said something to me profound when I said, I, I wonder why it's getting so much attention. And she said, well, Ben, this is true. You know, normally we have heartache over them killing one of our children, but now these are two babies they took at one time. I mean, it's like they got two for the price of one excessive use of force. And the fact this ain't like loading the animals on Noah's Ark two at a time. No, we don't want you to kill any of our children. We definitely don't want you killing two of our children at one time. Amen? Amen. And so, I'm so emotional because I went to the homegoing services of Tasha and Eric's child. And I know next week we'll be doing Sincere's home going services. And I asked Mr. Jones 
to get this funeral program. Because when you look at Angelo Crooms in the casket, now that he looked like such a young child. 16. I mean, he has such a baby face. And I thought back to myself at 16 years old, how much of my life was unlived. And I kept looking at this program as I heard the preacher preaching his eulogy. And I kept thinking to myself, this should not be a funeral program. This should be a graduation program. All his family and friends should not be gathered together in grief. They should be gathered together for a celebration of him graduating, starting the next chapter of his life. But instead, this is a funeral program representing the very last chapter of his life. And we cannot let these deaths be in vain, Brevard County. We cannot let these deaths be in vain, Florida. We cannot let these deaths be in vain, America. Because AJ life matters. Sincere life matters. Our children lives matter. Black 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 lives matter. And and I want us to continue to say that until Sheriff Ivy and the Bavar Sheriff's Department hear us every day to the point where they cannot ignore black lives being taken unnecessarily at the hands of these people who are supposed to be trained to preserve life, not to take life. And far too often, as I understand, that has been the county, that has been what has been happening in this county where there's the Edwards case and many others. So I would simply say this before Attorney Jackson address you. The deaths will not be in vain, not just for these families, but for your families too. But for your families too. Because what we hope to achieve is to transform this tragedy into policy. Policy that, like the national standards say, Attorney Jackson, you cannot shoot into a moving vehicle. I mean, that is the national standard. It's the standard in Orange County. It's the standard in Volusia County. But it's not the standard in Brevard County. So we need this A.J. Croom's Sincere Pierce Law to be passed in their name to say that we won't lose any more of our children in this manner. In this manner. So without further ado, I, I would like to introduce you to one of the best lawyers in America. Uh, she is a force of nature uh, with Trayvon Martin. She was my North Star as we strategize how to let people know that Trayvon Martin life mattered. And, you know, I can't think of a better person to work with me and the national lawyers who are going to be working on this case than a young lady who's not far from here. She hails from Orange County, Florida, by way of Sanford, Florida, the great attorney Natalie Jackson.
Thank you, Attorney Crump. Thank you. So the first thing I want to say, I think every reporter that I've talked to previously has received a Dropbox um, folder of Sincere Peers. If you have not received one, we will give you that po folder. In that folder is ring cam video. In that folder is cell phone video that shows exactly what happened. We don't have to guess what happened in this case because we have video that shows what happened in this case. So there's no guessing. If you did not get it, contact me afterwards. I'll make sure you got it. And what we know happened, Sincere left his house at 10.31 a.m. on Friday. What we know happened is that Sincere Pierce and A.J. Crooms were dead at 10.33. Mm. What we know happened was that lights were never engaged. We know that the boys did not commit any traffic violations. We know that they were being followed. We are told that they were being followed because there was a possible stolen car. Well, from what I know on law enforcement, you run a tag <laughs> before. That's how you verify whether or not a car is stolen. You run a tag. You do not hold 16-year-olds and other teenagers at gunpoint, yelling at them, confusing them when they're behind the wheel, not knowing what you're going to do or why you have stopped them. That's what you do not do. Tell it, madam. Now, the other thing you do not do, according to the model policy of use of force by the International Association of Chief of Police, you do not shoot into a moving vehicle and unless your life is threatened or you're in fear of serious bodily harm. But even if that is the case, if you have the opportunity to move out of the path of the vehicle, yeah. like you Tom should. <laughs> before you shoot and the reason that the reason that they have promulgated that policy is because as you can imagine when you're shooting into a vehicle and disabling a driver of a vehicle that vehicle then becomes a dangerous weapon for everyone around including the officer any innocent children this happened in a neighborhood mm -hmm. this happened in a neighborhood and the thing that's really upsetting is that you don't see these kind of things happening in Windermere are nice neighborhoods or rich neighborhoods. This is a nice neighborhood, so I'm not going to say that. But it always happens in disadvantaged, poor, and black neighborhoods, these type of things. So we should wonder why it's okay to put everyone in the neighborhood in danger in these situations. And that's what happened because, as we know, this car ended up crashing into a house that little children were in. So if you have any other questions about this case, like I said, if you need a copy of the folder, let me know. I'll be able to give it to you. Thank you for your time. I want to, I would be remiss without thanking Attorney Crump for coming here because I know without him, y'all wouldn't be here. <laughs> so I know that he has helped civil rights lawyers across the nation in these cases. And because of him, we're finally get the getting the amplification on these type of cases that we need to change policy, to save lives, and to make sure things like this don't happen. So I just really want to thank him, and I thank you for coming. And I hope that my prayer is that you tell the tr you are truth seekers, and that you tell the truth in this case. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about what that person who just got video of him and his aunt coming out the house? Yes, that's Can you so, tell that part? Yeah. So, and, um, got video. Yeah. yes, ben, ben asked me to tell you about the ring camera video. This is Miss Green. Miss Green has, she has taken care of Sincere Pierce since he was three days old, two, two days old. She has video of herself and Sincere Pierce when the car pulls up, when the police come by. Miss Green got into her car. She was leaving too when Sincere left the house. She was leaving too. So she saw the police officers and she saw what happened. And she, she'll tell you in, your, in her own words what she asked these, what happened and how this, how this situation took place. Ms. Green. Hi. Very brief. Very brief. Okay. As we was leaving, as I was leaving my home, my son got into his friend's car. And I seen, when I was backing out of my driveway, my son had already gone. And I seen the sheriff car coming, the cruiser coming down my street. And he was coming kind of like fast. So I said, Lord, he's going to go mess with these kids. I'm going behind them. Hmm. I went behind these kids. When I got there and turned my car around in the middle of the street and parked on the opposite side of the street going back out, 
I got out of my car and I told the officer, please don't shoot in that car. My baby just got in that car. That officer told me, get my... Say what he said. <laughs> he told me, get my motherfucking ass back in the car. <laughs> there was no reason for all of this. Wow. My Lord. And, and the reason, the reason we wanted this eyewitness account to be heard before you heard from these broken hearted parents was because this is the kind of disrespect that leads to our children being killed. That was the mentality. Even before they shot the first bullet. But equally important is the last bullets because they are trained that each time they fire a bullet, it has to be justified. There is no way they can justify shooting those bullets into the side of the car. And when you look at that video, you can see there's no way they can justify shooting the first bullet when you look at the angle of the tires, how A.J. Crooms was trying to avoid the police officer. So it's very hard for these next two individuals. They literally buried their child this morning and watched his casket go into the earth and I thank them so much for like Mamie Till coming out to bear all their scars to the public to try to help prevent this from happening to others. We're going to have a balloon release at the end of this press conference to recognize that we are celebrating their lives, even though we're saying goodbye. We have Mr. Eric Smith and Ms. Tasha Crooms, the mother and father of A.J. Crooms, 16 years old. You can take your mask off when you talk on the mic. Take your time. A.J. is my firstborn. AJ had me to itself for three years. Those three years we bonded, 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 like we got memories from those three years alone. Nobody can tell you. He was my baby. He was the oldest of my crew, but that was my baby. When I got the phone call from a friend of the family that he was shot, I asked what happened. They say they didn't know. The only thing they told me is that the police did it. When they said the police, I knew then my baby was going to be dead because they trained to shoot. They know exactly how to shoot. They know exactly what to aim at. So to know that nobody could come give me an explanation on why my son was dead, it just made me heartbroken. Heartbroken. AJ was a cool kid. He loved everybody, especially babies. My son was taken from me on my second son's birthday. He was robbed, even. He was robbed of his life on his brother's birthday. My Lord. I want justice for my son. Jeff. Here comes my son. Thank you. Thank you. And the joy. And that's his girlfriend. Okay. This is his girlfriend. Okay. Um. Next, we will have Crosetta Pierce and LaJoyce and family members uh, of Sincere Pierce address you. And you heard his aunt talk about the level of disrespect. This is very emotional. And so, 
please know that they did not ask to be here fighting for justice. They expected their children to be alive with them today. And so, Ms. Pierce, if you could address the press. Take your time. You want to step back and get in the center? I can't really explain how, how I felt when I got that phone call from a friend saying, hurry up and come, the police shot your son. I think my heart just stopped. I was driving, but I was driving in days. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. Since he was a cool dude, he wasn't disrespectful. He always liked to joke. He used to make me so angry because everything was a joke. He used to like to joke around. He smiled. He smiled. Always did it for me. I would miss that smile. Miss him. I took my son life. He didn't even make it to 21. I would miss him. We want justice. We want these officers held accountable. The same way they hold us accountable when they arrest Amen. us. We want to know their backgrounds just like they want to know our backgrounds. Amen. That's right. That's right. We want to know who's hiring these people to kill our kids. Exactly. We want to know who they are in our neighborhoods. You can't police a neighborhood if you don't know the people. You won't be able to have a relationship with these people if you do not know what's going on in these neighborhoods. They are trained to kill. And that's what happened. They could have took any other way to dismantle that car, to stop that car. But they did not because they are trained to kill. It speaks loud, it speaks volumes, and we want answers, and we want justice. I don't care what they say about those boys. I don't care. They weren't doing nothing right then. Exactly. They weren't doing nothing right there in that spot. Exactly. So it don't matter. They can look up their records. They can look up their backgrounds, their criminal history. Right then, they weren't doing anything wrong. So that's all we want is justice. That's it. Wonderful. And it's so important where she said that we don't let them assassinate their character now that they have assassinated their bodies. That's right. The fact that when you watch that video as Attorney Jackson and Mr. Jones and I studied, literally, you don't see the police turn on their sirens and their uh, flashers. I mean, you literally see them not having a high speed chase. I mean, for them to try to characterize it as that is yet another lie because you see the young men driving the car. They stop at the intersection. The police stop at the intersection. If it was such an exigent situation, why didn't they have the sirens and the flashes on? Why didn't they have the loud speaker telling them to pull over? No witness is saying that the police said that. The witness is saying what they said to her when she begged them not to shoot in the car. The fact that these police, if they assumed that it was a stolen vehicle, all they had to do was run the tag. They would have did that, as Attorney Jackson said, in another community. Mayor Blake, they wouldn't have just started shooting in a more affluent community. So why are they allowed to do this in our communities? Shoot first and ask questions later. When would our children get the benefit of the doubt, the benefit of consideration, the benefit of possibility? When will Sincere get that? When will AJ get that? So we're here saying a prayer for the family, but a call to action.
a call to action from everybody in Brevard County who considers themselves to be a good person. Amen. You want to say something else before we did question answer? Say about the video, how they you know, some oh, that's right. And thank you, Attorney Jackson. We understand that there are others who have cell phone video possibly of what happened who have contacted us anonymously but are afraid to deal with the police. And I will tell you, they have good reason to do so. Amen. Remember Eric Gardner in Staten Island, New York, the first I can't breathe case. Mm -hmm. We all remember in our community that none of those killer cops ever went to jail. They didn't even go to court. But you know the one person who went to prison was the person who took the video because they're trying to send a message to our community to intimidate us. But we won't be intimidated, will we? No. We will not be intimidated, will we? No. As because we have to fight for our children. As Dr. King said, the cowards will ask the question, is it safe? Expediency will ask the question, is it politically correct? Vanity will ask the question, is it popular? But conscience will ask the question, is it right? And Dr. King concluded, there comes a time when one must take a position that's neither popular, nor politically correct, or not even safe. But there comes a time when one must take a position, Eric, because our conscience tells us it is the right thing to do. Brevard County, it is the right thing to do to stand up for our children, to speak up for our children, to fight for our children. And we will fight until hell freezes over. And then we'll fight on the ice. So at this time, Attorney Jackson and I will try to take some of your questions. The family is very emotional. If they can answer a question, we will try to understand this is very emotional. They are trying to figure out what clothes they will bury their child in. That's how deep this is. So your questions, we'll take a few. Mr. Trump, Earl Burns with the Space Coast Rocket. Law enforcement has made statements about the history of the children, but what they have not made statements about is the history of the officer. Right, so like right. The, the history that this officer has, that has been reprimanded by his own agency is relevant to this shooting. It very much so, and as LaJoy said, we need to know who are these officers? And I'm going to let my co-counsel, Attorney Jackson, speak to that because I think she already has presented some information about this officer's background. And we may have some video information that should be germane in this case. But also, if there's body camera video when they get out of that car and he curses this aunt out, that should be released to the public. I mean, if you're going to release stuff about the children who you killed, you ought to release stuff about the person who did the killing. That's right. That's right. And so, thank you, Robert. Um, yes, we do have information that this officer was involved in a domestic violence incident in April 2020. We do have information that he may have a prior criminal arrest background. Um, we're researching into this, and we'll let the public know more as we know more. And is there video now? Is possible video of the Yes, there's possible video of this officer being violent and um, with with a, another officer who happened to be his wife. Uh, Deanna Albrin from uh, WFTV. I have a follow-up question to that. So we got uh, the personnel records of that deputy. Uh, yes, sir, and we did get some video of the personnel records of that deputy. And there were a couple of things that seem notable. Uh, it does talk about some of that domestic violence history uh, and that he was not terminated 
because of uh, commendations of his performance uh, and that they, he also declined to answer questions about any criminal arrest, including potential felonies, on the application. Can you speak to whether that is standard among uh, policing within an agency of themselves? Well, I can tell you what is standard is very many times the problem officers are put in black communities. So that's a standard thing that happens. Um, here we have an officer who possibly had some home issues and was sent into a community with a gun. And so that is something that we will be looking into whether or not he should have been there. I would simply say this. The fact that he has a propensity for violence should have been a red flag to the Bavaria County Sheriff's Department. It should have been a big red flag because if they would have heeded the warning signs, maybe these two mothers would have their sons alive today. Also, I want to thank Mayor Blake and the city leadership of Coco. Beach for making sure that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, I'm sorry, Jess Coco. Jess Coco. <laughs> I want to thank Mayor Blake and the leadership of Coco for getting the Florida Department of Law Enforcement involved so we wouldn't see a replay of what happened in the Edwards case where you have the Bavard County Sheriff's Department policing themselves and amazingly concluding they did nothing wrong, even though the video is just outrageous of how they killed Mr. Edwards, this veteran. But that's another story. I also will say we look forward to having the Department of Justice review these matters because we understand that Sheriff Ivey has a history with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement as my clients have shared with me. And we don't want anybody who is biased to decide whether there would be justice for Sincere and AJ. Any, yes ma'am? Um, I have a question about, I watched a lot of the early news coverage that came out that morning that next morning, and some of it seems to be a lot longer than the clips they're playing now, which are short that don't give out yes, as can. much information. Can you get all the footage from the news companies? We're, we, we're going to get all the videos, but most importantly, we want to make sure that the p Sheriff's Department release all the video that exists, because oftentimes what we have seen them do is release only evidence that is favorable to them. Right. And we think that is what they attempted to do in the beginning. But thank God for people in the community that gave the ring videos, that gave the cell phone videos. And that's why we're begging on the blood of these children. I know you're scared. Right. I know you're intimidated. But please get us that video out there that exists. If you got any portion of the pursuit or the execution, we want to see it. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. You're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Hope you're having a fabulous Monday morning. Start to the holiday week so far. We're taking a live look in New York City where they've gotten some rainfall this Monday morning. It's 9-11 on November 23rd. A couple of you are going to see, or a few of you, excuse me, a quick commercial break. We will see you in two minutes. When you return, we will be listening in on the uh, Biden-Harris transition team, Biden campaign. Essentially, they are representing President-elect Joe Biden, talking about the transition to the White House. We're going to be listening to that in, when you return in two minutes. A few of the things uh, that happened uh, this week. Um, so. 
Uh, as you all know, uh, we are still waiting for the GSA administrator to ascertain the outcome of the election, but we are still moving full steam ahead. Uh, and so is, of course, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. So this week, uh, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris had a pretty busy week. Um, they had a week full of meetings with congressional leaders, governors, national security experts, CEOs and labor leaders, frontline workers. Earlier this week on Monday, uh, they hosted a meeting that included both CEOs and uh, labor leaders to discuss ways to begin to put people back to work. Um, and this is just a reminder that he's somebody who can uh, bring people together and convene them uh, at this time and when we need people to come from uh, all sides to come together and address the crises we're facing. On Tuesday, uh, they, the president-elect and the vice president-elect uh, met with some of the country's most experienced national security experts uh, about the challenges facing our country and our institutions, including the diplomatic, defense, and intelligence challenges the administration will inherit on day one. And just as a reminder, you know, these are meetings that, of course, uh, he would probably have uh, anyway. Uh, these are people, many of them he's known for decades throughout his time uh, and career uh, working on foreign policy issues. But right now he uh, is being shut out and the administration is being shut out of uh, intelligence briefings and national security briefings real-time information, uh, threat assessments, uh, data about uh, the threats we're facing around the world, our engagements around the world, and information we need to get the pandemic under control. On Wednesday, uh, the president-elect met with frontline workers, uh, hearing firsthand accounts from healthcare workers and first responders uh, who are bearing the high emotional toll uh, of helping others recover from COVID. And just yesterday, the president-elect and the vice president-elect met with Democratic and Republican governors from the National Governors Association, in a meeting, I should say, convened by the National Governors uh, Association. Uh, and they talked about the importance of working together as one country to beat COVID. Uh, addressing COVID and getting the pandemic under control is not a partisan issue. It's not an issue that's going to be solved by one party. It needs to be uh, something that's done together with health experts and scientists and certainly leaders from both parties. And as you also may know, uh, today the president-elect and vice president-elect later this afternoon, I should say, will be meeting, will host Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer for a meeting in Wilmington. They'll discuss emergency aid that families desperately need, small businesses need, and state and local governments need uh, at this uh, critical point in time. Uh, of course, the president-elect um, and he also named several members of his team about a little more than a dozen, including uh, last week before we spoke, he of course had named his White House Chief of Staff. And uh, this week, uh, including some this morning, we've announced a several, uh, a number of diverse, qualified and experienced uh, individuals who will be filling important roles in the White House uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, and as we look ahead to next week and approach the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, he's going to be focusing on continuing to uh, address, uh, be briefed on, uh, speak out about the crises facing our country. Uh, we know this isn't a holiday season that uh, most people um, uh, would have envisioned, uh, and they will continue to do the work to ensure that during next year's holiday, uh, we can celebrate with our loved ones. So with that, I will turn it over to Johannes. Thanks, Jen. And thanks everyone for making the time to be here. As Jen mentioned, the GSA administrator has yet to ascertain the results of the election, despite an overwhelming consensus that Joe Biden is the winner of the election and therefore the president elect. And as Jen also mentioned, we continue to move forward in the absence of an ascertainment decision. However, the non ascertainment does place limits on the resources available to the transition and most importantly, uh, our access to federal agencies. This isn't a game who gets to talk to whom. Our inability to start our formal agency review process has the potential to have real impacts on families across the country. In fact, there's a growing chorus of national leaders who are calling upon GSA to move forward with the transition and sounding the alarm about the potentially harmful impact of further delays. Earlier this week, Dr. Fauci said that the lack of ascertainment would delay vaccine distribution. Leading medical groups, including the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, and the American Nurses Association, also wrote a letter urging the Trump administration to coordinate with the Biden transition on COVID-19 planning. Public health experts around the country echoed these sentiments and called for the GSA to stop delaying ascertainment and ensure seamless transition as COVID-19 infection rates surge across the country. 
Yesterday, numerous business leaders and groups released statements calling for the transition process to move forward, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Black Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, the National Association of Manufacturers, Small Business for America's Future, and other leading business leaders. And finally, as Jen mentioned, uh, this week, the president-elect and the vice president-elect were briefed by former national security officials about the readiness of the diplomatic defense and intelligence agencies. Uh, as you know, they are still not able to receive the critically important classified briefings that should be available to them. And so the GSA administrators in action has the potential to have a real impact on families across the country. Now, even in the face of that, the transition team continues to do the work it is able to, including the continued rollout of senior White House officials. Uh, last week, we announced during this briefing that the public jobs portal would be open on the website. And the personnel team is making strong progress and getting us ready to hit the ground on inauguration day with a diverse, talented team. So with that, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Q&A. Great, thank you both. Uh, we'll go to Lisa for our first question. Lisa Desjardins. Great, thank you guys for doing this. I really appreciate it. Hi, Hi guys, I've got um, a couple of questions. One, if generally you can talk about uh, Vice President-elect Harris's role. She mentioned to reporters this week that, that she's had a very um, uh, tight role, an important role in the cabinet selections and just anything more on that would be great. And then also on the COVID relief bill that I know President-elect Biden's talked a lot about, is he lobbying members of Congress directly, including today, um, Republicans and Democrats, to pass something now? Tell, talk us about that. And would he be okay with something less than what Democrat leaders want because he needs something now? I'll take the, I'll take the first question. Um, and Jen, maybe you take the second one. Uh, the, the answer to the first question is, is easy in so much as Vice President-elect uh, Harris has been an integral part of all personnel discussions uh, that happened during the transition and will continue to play that role. Uh, I will just uh, add to your second question, Lisa. Uh, so as you know, uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris will be meeting with Speaker Pelosi and uh, Schumer later this afternoon. Uh, they are going to be working in lockstep and they're in lockstep agreement that there needs to be emergency assistance and aid uh, before during the lame duck session to help families, to help small businesses. We, there's no more room for delay, uh, and we need to move forward as quickly as possible. He, of course, is speaking with uh, leader or, uh, officials or elected officials from uh, both sides of the aisle, and we'll continue to do that. But it's an important meeting this afternoon because they're going to continue to work together on pushing that forward because they know how much that relief is needed, especially as we look toward uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. Do you know if he's speaking to Republicans in Congress on this? The president. I don't have any more uh, calls to read out for you, um, but he's been doing a range of calls. He has relationships, of course, that go back with people from both sides of the aisle. And if we have to read out later this afternoon, we'll, we're happy to share that with you. Well, thanks. Great. We'll go to our next question from Eamon Jabbers. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks for doing this. I uh, really appreciate the call. So um, earlier today, a, a group called Demand Progress put out a list of uh, Democratic officials and, and you know veterans of previous administrations that it said uh, were corporate Democrats and too close to oil and gas and other interests that they don't like. I'm wondering what effect that list, which includes people like Bruce Reed and Steve Braschetti, is going to have on your decisions of how to staff up this White House. Are you going to take that into account in any way or are you going to ignore it? Uh, well, Eamon, thanks for, for the question. And as you can see by the number of announcements that we've already made to date and the decisions that have been made by President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris, um, they're eager to get uh, their team in place. Uh, there remains a commitment, and we've certainly seen this as they've had discussions and made decisions already, and you'll see this as more names come out in the weeks to come, but, that they want the cabinet and also the White House team and the teams that will fill these important roles to look like America. And that means there will be people from a diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, uh, and a diversity of political views, including from uh, all sides of the Democratic Party. So we are certainly hearing from and listening to people and their thoughts and views, um, but um, he's made that commitment. And I, I would encourage people to wait until we've made even one announcement about a cabinet member and certainly more than just a dozen White House names uh, before they pass judgment. The last thing I would just say is that, you know, President-elect Biden is 
Uh, he campaigned as somebody who would be governing for all of the country. That means Democrats, that means independents, that means Republicans, that means people from all political ideologies. Um, and his personnel decisions and his, um, you know, his approach to how he's going to fill those seats and fill the important roles uh, will be reflective of that. Um, and that's the approach he'll continue to take. And Jen, thanks, thanks for that. Just one quick follow-up specifically on Wall Street. Uh, does the president-elect see a Wall Street background as something that's helpful uh, for potential White House staffers and, and cabinet officials, or does he see a Wall Street back background as uh, something that's not great to have on your resume? Well, Eamon, I think as you know, and, and, and from having lived through the um, Obama-Biden, uh, blissfully lived through, happily lived through the <laughs> Obama-Biden administration myself, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that um, he's, he's not uh, a fan of Wall Street policies or an advocate for, uh, you know, a, a lot of the policies that some people would would be uh, in favor of or be pushing for from that end. His record speaks for itself and his um, his advocacy and his words speak for themselves. And his team that he selects will be people who are implementing his policies, who are implementing the Biden agenda. They're people who are committed, committed to putting Americans back to work, to uh, ensuring there's regulation where there needs to be, to uh, ensuring that people have access to affordable health care. Um, those are the, the, the people who will be named to the cabinet and named to his team or there to implement uh, his agenda. So I would certainly point people to words he said uh, and his own background uh, over the last several years. Okay, thanks guys. Great, we'll take our next question from Sabrina Siddiqui. Thank you both so much for doing this today. I uh, just wanted to ask if there has been any outreach to the transition team whatsoever from current Trump administration officials, and if so, what has their message been to the transition team? And just a second question is President-elect Biden uh, he said yesterday that he's not ruling out legal action. Can you just talk about at what point you will feel that all other options have been exhausted with respect to the GSA ascertainment and when it might come to pass that you would consider legal action? Well, I'll start and Johannes may have some words of wisdom to add. Um, so on your second question, you know, the president-elect has made clear that, and, and, and we certainly share this, of course, given we all work for him, that our pre preference would be for the GSA administrator to sign the ascertainment and we can all move forward. We can have access to intelligence briefings. Uh, we can have access to the information that's necessary to have our team working on uh, vaccine distribution, uh, have access to the current information they need. We can ensure that there wouldn't be a delay in Americans getting relief they need come January 20th. That's our preference. At the same time, I, I think there's a shared um, view that are shared running out of patience happening. Um, that that's happening, as we can see on Capitol Hill. That's happening with business leaders. That's happening with national security officials. Because uh, a smooth transition uh, and uh, a, a period of transition where the president-elect, the vice president-elect, uh, national security officials and experts, experts who are helping us get the pandemic under control, have access to the information they need, is is essential for our democracy and for our country. So, you know, I, I would say there's, I, we've seen that escalate um, externally, uh, and, and Johannes started off uh, mentioning a couple of the business leaders and business groups. They want certainty in, in the economy. Uh, they know that if we have a delay in um, in getting the information we need about vaccine distribution, that could delay that moving forward. We're going, the Biden administration is going to be responsible for the distribution of the majority of 300 million uh, vaccines. If, when, if that is delayed, that could impact small businesses. That could impact the economy reopening. Everybody's looking for certainty at this point. And the last thing I'll just say is, you know, no one, no presidential transition would take options off the table. Uh, and we certainly aren't, but we would love it if this afternoon, or even during this call, if during this briefing, if we learned that the GSA administrator signed the ascertainment and we could all move forward with continuing to prepare to govern. Great, we'll take, oh, sorry, y'all. The only thing I'd add there is we're consulting with a broad range of stakeholders outside of the government that uh, have uh, expertise in various lanes that'll be critical to governing. But at the end of the day, exactly as Jen said, uh, there's no replacing the real-time information that can only come from uh, the post-ascertainment environment that we should be in right now in terms of regularized contact and regular contact with 
uh, folks inside of the agencies who have information that would be vital to everything from our national security to, as Jen said, vaccine distribution. Sorry, just to be clear, you do you have had you not had any outreach then from current Trump administration officials? So, just Sabrina, it's a great question, and I know there's been some confusion about this. We, um, our teams can't speak with um, or engage with current administration officials because um, the ascertainment has been delayed. And we would certainly love to have that engagement and love to be um, discussing with uh, civil servants and people who have been experts on a range of issues from foreign policy to health policy, um, you know, preparations to take over January 12th, but our team has been uh, very careful, of course, about following those rules and guidelines, um, and we'll have to abide by that until uh, ascertainment uh, happens. Great. We'll take two more. Uh, we'll move on to our let sign. Hi there. Um, yesterday, the president-elect talked a little bit about his cabinet selections, and I was wondering if you'd be able to provide kind of a target date for when you are planning to roll out that first cabinet nominee. And then also, I know you'll say that every cabinet position is important, but is there a certain priority that you guys have in mind for certain positions and getting those out first? Sure. Well, Arla, thank you for the question. Um, so I've been doing this long enough to know not to get ahead of the president-elect. Um, and certainly uh, when he's ready to make his announcements about a cabinet, he'll do that. He indicated yesterday that that will be around Thanksgiving. That's aligned with the timing uh, that uh, of the announcement of cabinet nominees back in 2008 when I was working on the Obama transition. Um, and I expect you'll hear more from him on that soon. But since you gave us the opportunity, I just wanted to say one thing about the cabinet um, and the nominees. He is committed to uh, selecting people, and as he indicated, has selected some people who are qualified, who are experienced, who are going to be prepared on day one to uh, address the crises that our country is facing. And he will also put together a team that looks like America, that is diverse in terms of ideology uh, and background as well. So that's how he's looking at putting together his team. And uh, we certainly saw today that um, there were a number of Republicans who have indicated they'd be open to supporting nominees. Uh, that feels like a positive sign forward because a positive sign, because we know that the American people are not expecting obstruction. They're expecting uh, members of both parties, Democrats and Republicans to come together and help put qualified and experienced people in place to address the various crises that our country is facing. Uh, and I expect um, you'll know more soon. You'll know more in the coming weeks. Great, hey, thanks. And we'll take our last question from Sandstein. Oh, hi, guys. Uh, thanks for doing this. Much appreciated. Um, this is a, a bit of a, a weird question, but um, obviously, as you're planning for the transition, this is happening during a spike in uh, COVID. Um, and there's articles about the difficulties in actually laying out the physical space of the White House and how to use it. I'm wondering if you can walk us through what type of decisions are being made, plans are being implemented to actually physically staff the premises of the White House come January 21st when you expect to be there. So our, our top priority, as you saw in the campaign, and certainly as you've seen throughout the transition, is the uh, following the science and abiding, uh, keeping the safety of our team um, top of mind. And it's a dynamic uh, situation with the pandemic, but I think we'll see the exact same adherence to and commitment to the science of keeping the team safe that you saw in the campaign that you see during the transition. You'll see that as we enter into the White House physical space. Does that, and how does that manifest itself? Are we talking about fewer people actually working from the West Wing? We don't have anything to share on that at this moment, but I think you can uh, rest assured that we will follow the science and we'll put procedures in place to keep our team safe. And as you can see, Sam, we are obviously not, not working in a transition office. Uh, hence I can see. Children's art and such things. Um, and Johannes obviously needs more pictures on his wall. Um, but we also, you know, <laughs> President-elect and the Vice President-elect have conveyed to all of us that we should do our best to be model citizens as well, which means being safe. And I know this is just about this moment of time. Being safe, of course, wearing masks. Um, you know, we're, most of us are, of course, the vast majority are working remotely um, because, uh, you know, we want to be models for the country too. Thanks, guys. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of news in the coming weeks uh, that we'll discuss with all of you.
As you can see, everybody, stocks just started trading on Wall Street. The New York Stock Exchange there, Dow Jones Industrial, beginning right out the gate, up about 200 points. Quite interesting there, right? Probably in response to another vaccine trial for COVID-19 news update. AstraZeneca says late stage trial results show the COVID-19 vaccine they worked on with the University of Oxford is up to 90% effective in preventing the coronavirus. Today's announcement is based on analysis from trials in the UK and Brazil involving 23 thousand people. It's quite a bit, everybody. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine candidate is different from those from Pfizer and Moderna as it doesn't have to be stored at ultra cold temperatures, making it easier to distribute. So again, it's kind of a race to the finish line, everyone, to see which of these companies is going to provide the vaccine that is distributed worldwide that is most well known to everyone. Late stage trials are also underway in the South Africa, Kenya, and Latin America, and further trials are planned for other European and Asian countries. It still needs regulator approval before it can be distributed. But we both know, we all know, that is, that uh, news like that definitely impacts the global markets. So a little bit of silver lining, some good news this morning there in vaccine trial news for COVID-19. It's 934 here on the East Coast. Some of you are going to see a very quick commercial break. When you return, we'll be listening in on some uh, special coverage from our sister station, KTVU Fox 2. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Happy Monday. We're going to be with you for about another 24 or 5 minutes or so until our coworkers and friends, colleagues in Phoenix, Arizona, at the News Now from Fox headquarters take over. But again, thanks for being here. Hello everyone, Heather Holmes here with KTV Fox 2 News in the San Francisco Bay Area. And joining me once again to talk about the coronavirus is Dr. Rashid Khani. He is medical officer at IEM and infectious disease expert. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us once again. Well, thank you for having me uh, to talk about this very important subject that is not just affecting the United States, but the entire world in a very, very bad way. It, it certainly is, Doctor. We are seeing cases increase just about everywhere. I want to ask you, does it really come down to people masking, social distancing, and washing their hands? Hands Is it really that simple? Well, it is not that simple. Uh, but, you know, as we had already predicted that uh, during the fall and the winter time, we are going to have more cases. And that's what, you know, the rest of the world is seeing. And that's what we are seeing in the United States. Uh, what are the measures that we've got available uh, to us right now are three things. Those are the three things that you just mentioned, masking, social distancing, and hand hygiene. Right now, we do not have a vaccine. Yes, the vaccine is coming, but we don't have it as yet. So we've got to use those particular measures. We have a monoclonal antibody that has been approved by FDA. And I believe that uh, in the next uh, few months, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, people will be going and getting tested, and if they're positive, uh, then they will be getting uh, an infusion of their monoclonal antibody, which takes about one hour to infuse, and then you've got to wash them for one hour, and then they can go home. So we do have a treatment, but it is not widely available at this point, till we have that treatment widely available, till we have the vaccines that are, are out, uh, and, and FDA approved uh, and, and uh, given an emergency authorization use, and we've got some really good vaccines. We have to use the measures that we've got, and, and we've got to do the masking, social distancing, and hand hygiene. I want to talk with you about just what we're seeing in regards to the number of cases and the number of deaths. I mean, it just keeps climbing in both categories. Absolutely. Right now, we've got 11.6 uh, million cases, and, and, and we've passed a grim, grim, grim milestone. And I, I feel terrible talking about it, but we've, we, we have 251,000 deaths in the United States. Uh, the deaths are not as high as we had seen. Uh, daily deaths are not as high as what we had seen uh, in the spring. But uh, unfortunately, I have to say that these numbers will rise. And, and uh, deaths always follow two weeks after 
Uh, we've had surges of cases. Now we've gotten much better in, in taking care of patients in the hospital, hospitals, uh, and, and, and our mortality rate has decreased. There's no question about it. But when you have 160,000 cases per day, right, uh, which is a 77% uh, increase uh, looking at the last two weeks, I mean, you're gonna have deaths associated with them, even if they're less percent wise compared to what we had in spring, we're still gonna have a tremendous amount of deaths. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but the rate that we are moving at, uh, you know, by Christmas, we could have 2,500 deaths a day in our country. And, and that is what is just unbelievable at this point. And it's extremely heartbreaking to see that. Even if, the, if, even if people are gonna start getting the, uh, you know, uh, monoclonal antibody outside the hospital in, a, in, a, in an outside setting, it is gonna take time for all that process to take place. Once the vaccine is out, and I can assure you that by the end of this month, uh, I, I, I believe both of the vaccines the Moderna vaccine, as well as the Pfizer vaccine are gonna get uh, FDA EUA approval because right now the immunogenicity data and the safety data on both of them look really, really ast astonishing. And you know they've just exceeded our expectations in terms of efficacy or effectiveness as people call it. And we were expecting something which was gonna be 50%. Now we are seeing something that is unbelievable 95, almost 95% effectiveness of both of those vaccines. But, you know, to roll that out, you know, to have people get the vaccine, uh, uh, by the way, you have to get two doses to actually develop that 95% uh, effectiveness. So it's gonna take some time. And, and we just, uh, you know, which is unfortunate, it's remarkable that we have all of these things that are coming out during a pandemic, during a major surge. But right now, the virus is in control. We are absolutely not in control. So we've got to just make sure that we keep ourselves safe, as safe as possible. You mentioned vaccines and obviously so much incredibly positive news coming out from these two vaccines, at least these two right now. How realistic is it, doctor, that a large number of Americans are going to be receiving this vaccine shortly after the new year? It's not gonna be uh, happening uh, to a large number of Americans who will receive the vaccine. Uh, you know, when the vaccine comes out, uh, you know, the, uh, the CDC, you know, FDA approves it. And then uh, with CDC and uh, ACIP, as well as the National Academy of Medicine, uh, it is determined who are going to be on the priority list. So the, the healthcare providers in harm's way were taking care of COVID-19 patients elderly uh, with comorbidities, elderly after that, and then, you know, mis mis mission essential people, physicians, nurses, uh, uh, you know, police officers, uh, uh, firefighters, you know, all the mis mis essential people, uh, essential workers are going to get that vaccine. And after that, you will have uh, school teachers probably and students, and then it then goes out to the general population. So, it will take some time. We will not get the vaccine to the general population before the end of uh, the first quarter of next year, if everything goes smoothly, or the second quarter. So there is still a lot of time left uh, uh, you know, for people to get the vaccine. And when you mention, you know, obviously there is a, a, a lot of time before we see mass distribution of the vaccine. What are you encouraging people to do in, in the meantime? Obviously, doctor, we have Thanksgiving coming up next weekend, followed by Christmas. What are you encouraging people to do when it comes to traveling and seeing family? Well, I would say do not travel. Uh, if you want to see your family, do a Zoom meeting. Try to keep yourself safe as much as you can. If it's just, uh, you know, if, if you have to travel and you're not going to stay away from travel, make sure that you're using a proper mask. Make sure that you're, you know, uh, keeping social distancing. You know, when your kids come from college, right, there are so many colleges, so many college towns where, you know, the outbreak just exploded. Fortunately, those kids are not going to get uh, a serious uh, illness, but they can give it to you. And, and, and you will then suffer. So when the kids come home, you know, just make sure either they've isolated themselves for two weeks before they come, 
or uh, you know what they can do is they can isolate themselves and and you can wear a mask uh, in the house and you know and and keep the social distancing if that's what's going to uh, take but you got to be careful the virus acts in a very bizarre way you know i've had i've had families uh, you know the wife has it a husband didn't get it kids got it what is going on the husband had the most exposure he does not have any type of uh, antibodies. The virus acts in a very, very, very bizarre way. So we got to be very careful, very cautious. Just let's let, let's let's pass this time. Let's let's you know take care of Thanksgiving and 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 uh, uh, Christmas and New Year's and and just be in our own part. Next year we can definitely enjoy. You know we're not out of the woods yet, uh, but we might be approaching well the beginning of the end at this point. Uh, this perhaps is the first time, as I've mentioned, that the vaccine has been approved during a pandemic. We've got a therapeutic that has been approved that is gonna be out there, which is just a tremendous scientific feat. And, you know, I've, I've gotta give, give credit to Operation Warp Speed uh, for doing that. But believe me, better days are definitely coming. Uh, but for now, let's all uh, keep doing our part, mask up, stay home, and count the days until we can line up to get our shot, the vaccine. Yes, and, and doctor, my final question for you today, you mentioned colleges. A lot of uh, you know, students will be going back home. Uh, and in a lot of states where kids right now are at school and, and doing in-person learning, they're going to be taking these breaks soon. Do you anticipate that they will then return to the classroom? Or do you think that this will now be the time that more schools, more colleges will move solely to that distance learning model? Well, more than 2,500 cases uh, have been reported among students and employees at 1,600 or 1,600 institutions across the, uh, across the nation. Uh, so yes, there have been problems. There have been 80 deaths uh, uh, among uh, among uh, teachers, but you know we have already seen that uh, you know football players in California and and Pennsylvania and a sophomore in uh, another place have essentially uh, died uh, uh, due to uh, contracting the disease. Ten states, uh, college towns: uh, Texas, Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, Illinois. Uh, Indiana, North Carolina, and Michigan have the highest number of cases among students in the campus setting. So yes, uh, uh, what's going to happen, I believe, is that once uh, these kids come back home, uh, the rest of the classes, as we see the numbers of cases rising, the less, probably most of the classes for the rest of the year are going to be from their homes, or else if they are in, a, in, a, in an apartment, in a, you know, in a college town, they'll be taking classes from their own apartment. There probably are not gonna be any, you know, in-class teaching for this year or probably, and probably, uh, you know, the, the next semester also. Uh, it's just not gonna happen because we are just gonna have more cases and disease will spread. So we, in order to control that, we have to have uh, no in-person classes, and uh, remote learning, uh, which is tough for the students, but that's how, unfortunately, uh, things will look uh, for the next few months. I know that whenever we wrap up this conversation, you always like to give your final thoughts. And I'm just thinking about all of those students, doctor, who have really endured so much, missing out on, on so many things. Your, your advice to them, if in fact now, they, they're going to be removed from the classroom and, and finish out the school year at home. Well, one of the things that I have appreciated looking at my kids also, who are, you know, taking all the co college co classes from home, and uh, there are high school kids that I got, and I've got elementary school kids. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen all of it. One of the things that I've noticed is that the kids are extremely adaptive to what they get, the surroundings. And, you know, they keep themselves busy. Uh, they, they, they have learned how to uh, cope with this problem. You know, social media has helped them quite a bit. And, and all the technology that's out there is helping them communicate with people and talk to people and, and be together uh, with their friends, uh, uh, you know, remotely. I believe uh, that, you know, adults uh, are having a much more difficult time than uh, 
uh, than the students because uh, how technologically savvy they are. Yes, it's not easy not to be in a classroom, not to be enjoying time with your friends after you've had your classes, because that's what you, that's what you want to do when you're in college. But uh, at this particular point, they can't do it. But I honestly believe that they will be able to endure this thing. They will be able to successfully complete their semesters. And you know, if nothing else, one of the things that they have to think about are their family members, are their parents, yeah. uh, you know, making sure that they're not bringing the disease back home so that their parents are not getting sick or their siblings are not getting sick. Because, you know, we all have to work together. Sacrifices will have to be made. Sacrifices are being made in a big way by all these students. And I am so delighted to see that, you know, more than adults, uh, the students are actually following directions which was not anticipated, but they are, you know, majority of them are being very careful and cautious and they are, they know what's going on. They follow the news, they look at the data and they appreciate how difficult, uh, the difficult times that we are in and how difficult is, it is to deal with this virus. So I thank them and I hope they continue to do what they're doing because that's what we need. The nation needs them to be, you know, doing and, and giving the sacrifice and not giving up studying and not giving up their academic uh, goals that they have mm -hmm. and just keep pursuing them. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rashid Kutani, a medical officer at IEM. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much and, and appreciate it. Delighted. Big thanks to our sister station, KTVU. They provide us a lot of COVID-19 special coverage and updates. Matter of fact, we're going to continue it in just a few moments. But I wanted you to see how stocks are doing. Dow Jones Industrial out the gate for the morning and the week. Currently up almost two, excuse me, 300 points right now. And I do want to show you the other different live pictures we have right here at News Now from Fox, just to kind of prove to you that we are always monitoring the live pictures. And if any news breaks across the country or even worldwide, we'll bring it to you right here. Here's a live look at the U.S. Capitol and our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And just like that, we're going from D.C. all the way to New York City. Here's a live look outside the Fox News headquarters right across from Radio City Music Hall. They've seen some rain this morning there in the Big Apple, and you've even got some flags there in the wind wavering. Again, happy Monday, everyone. You're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Silly me, I thought it was almost 11 Eastern already. We have you here from the News Now from Fox East Coast Hub in Orlando, Florida, until 11 Eastern. So we've got an hour, 10 minutes left with you. Some of you are going to see a very quick commercial break. When you return, we will be watching KTVU Fox 2's continuous coronavirus special coverage. Again, this is News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Frank Malacote. I'm an anchor reporter for KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest is the owner of EnviroMaster out of the Sacramento area. It's a commercial disinfectant and sanitizing and safety company. And just for fun, we're going to talk about public restrooms and COVID-19. They don't mix very well, apparently. Let's say hi to uh, Harminder Simi. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Frank. Thank you very much. Nice to have you uh, and I have this opportunity to talk to you. Well, good to have you as well. Um, well, according to a survey, a lot of people are fearing the flush. I mean, a lot of times you can't even find a public bathroom that's open these days, but nearly half of Americans are just staying away from them completely. I think I know why, but tell us why. So it, you, even before COVID, uh, so let's just face it. Um, the restroom is a place where we go and deposit waste. Um, and studies show in the same way that we are required to wear masks because uh, anything that's airborne, you know, has a higher chance of getting in, you know, infection across people. Think of the restroom uh, or the toilet bowl that effectively sneezes as well. Every time it's flushed, you're getting all these droplets. So before COVID, the risk of getting something from a public restroom was high. With COVID, of course, um, you know, that's, that has a different um, impact because, you know, we're still working on vaccines and so on. So, yes, people are right to be uh, cautious, uh, you know, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, you, you can't go into a restroom. You just got to take some precautions. Exactly. I, I know from your survey as well, uh, one out of three actually went into a public restroom and walked out. 
yeah. um, is the cleanliness issues or just being afraid of whatever's in there. And 15% actually said they hold their breath when they go in there. Uh, I mean, I that. that might be a little much, but uh, some bathrooms are better than others, I guess, right? For sure. Uh, and I mean, you look at, we can all examine our own personal behaviors, you know, how much, you know, how many times do we use our elbow to open up? Uh, we, you know, there's all sorts of little things that we do uh, uh, that, that just basically recognizing the fact that, you know, there are germs lurking in the air, on door handles, um, everywhere. So, yes, it, it, you know, our behavior, we just examine our own behavior. That's what the survey is, is showing, for sure. Yeah, I was uh, at the airport at SFO uh, last week, and mm. uh, and it was crowded. I walked in and just said, no thanks, I'll find another one. So yeah. I, I think we are developing new habits, especially when it comes to the bathroom. Uh, I know you got a list of Lou do's, yeah. Uh, if you are going to use a public restroom and you kick it off for uh, looking for a sign, what do you mean by that? So, so there are, you look at, uh, there are many businesses and many of our customers, you know, they, they take pride in, in, uh, in looking after the restroom. If you're a restaurant, you're in business to provide great food, a great experience to your customers. You don't want your restroom to reflect the fact that, you know, somebody might question what's happening in the kitchen, for example. So for us, the way we've always done it well before COVID is provided signs, a, a little sticker on a sink, on a urinal, on a toilet, you know, where you flush, just to say this place has been in sanitized and cleaned by EnviroMaster, and it's a weekly program. And our brand has become quite recognizable now uh, we're national, including in in, uh, in Canada. So when people go around and they look at that sticker and they look at the, what the, the fixture looks like, it's shiny, it's clean, uh, you get a sense of, okay, somebody's taking care over here. Mm. Okay, so that sign uh, becomes, you know, quite important. We've expanded that to a much bigger sign. So, you know, um, one of the processes that we use in our weekly program is called uh, the virus vaporizer gun. It's spraying the whole room with a hospital grade germicide. And that with COVID, we've taken that service outside of the restroom, you know, onto the tables, in classrooms, in industrial places. And for that, we provide a sign, a much bigger sign to say that this particular premises is protected because it's got a restroom hygiene program and a virus vaporizer program. So that sign is the first uh, sense that a customer or a, a member of the public should look for to say, right, at least somebody's doing something on a regular basis to keep this place clean and sanitized. Do you recommend people bring their own sanitizing wipes into a bathroom just to be sure? Uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, for an emergency, of course. Uh, so. Fundamentally, washing your hands with soap and water is by far a most effective way of keeping it clean. Now, you know, when are you going to ever, you know, if you're next to a sink, uh, yes, of course, that'll work. Now, the next thing is what kind of paper uh, products do you use? Are the paper towels just lying on the counter or are they being dispensed? Because if they're lying on a counter, then what you're touching, you might have cleaned your hands, but this aerosol that, you know, when somebody flushes <clears throat> a toilet, all of that's lying on the paper and all you're doing is putting it back on your hands. So having hand sanitizers in your bag, in your pocket, you know, you get all of these in your car. Uh, I mean, I have it in, in the car. When I go to a gas station, I pump gas and I just, you know, wipe my hands. So those kind of situations, of course, you know, we, it's thoroughly recommended. How about the hand dryer? You see those, uh, I saw them at the airport the other day. Yeah. They, they, yeah. They're probably pretty dirty, I bet. They are, and unfortunately, in our line of work, uh, we tend to focus on areas where a public might not see because we are, you know, we're trained to look for places where germs are lurking, where there's buildup and so on. And, and when you really look down into one of those hand dryers where you get the water droplets will sit there, uh, you, some of them are pretty gross. Um, now, I know the hand dryers have some HEPA filters and so on that when they do blow the air, but actually what you're blowing onto your hands is air that's already circulating in the restroom. And as we've, you know, uh, the surveys also show that when you, uh, when you flush a toilet, you know, these water droplets get ejected to up to between six and 20 feet, you know, and they stay in the air for between 20 minutes to an hour. 
Mm. So if you're using a hand dryer, again, you've used hand, you've used water and soap, then you're just redepositing potential germs onto your hands. I would imagine it's probably good to get in and out pretty quickly too. The, the less time you're in there, the less chance of getting For sure. a virus uh, or something. Exactly. Uh, of course, if you see a, a sign from EnviroMaster that says that this place is, you know, taken care of, then you you have a little bit of comfort. Uh, always wear your mask. Uh, you know, that's that goes without saying. We should be, you know, wearing a mask. Just not just so masks do two things really. They're protecting you if you have an N95 mask. That's protecting you. But if you're wearing any ordinary mask, you're protecting other people. So when you go into a restroom and there's water drops and so on, having some sort of a barrier is good for you. The less time you spend there, of course, the better it is, the less chance you have of catching uh, any disease other than, you know, let alone COVID. And with that hand dryer in mind, I guess the least amount of things you touch is mm. better too. I mean, there are some aerosol things that you might bump into, but no. candles, toilet flushers, yeah. the faucet. Yeah maybe get a, a paper towel to, to kind of uh, not touch some of those things. Right exactly. On, right? exactly. So you, um, you don't always need <clears throat> automatic soap dispensers uh, because when you, when you go and when you first dispense soap into your hand, you may touch the dispenser, but then you're washing it away. <clears throat> now the tap or the faucet would have, uh, could, could be contaminated. So before you shut the water off, you just take a piece of paper and you shut the water off and wipe your hands. You can use uh, even the, you know, and it's a good habit because even if you have an EnviroMaster sticker to say that this is sanitized, if you, if you, if you really want to be careful, then you use a piece of paper just to open the door and uh, make sure you just di dispose of the piece of paper correctly into a trash can as opposed to leaving it on the floor. Yeah. I think we're developing good habits though. I have not had a cold or anything uh, yeah. since March, uh, knock on wood. And, uh, yeah. you know, I got disinfected. I wear my mask, but I'm, I wasn't a big hand washer. And I think we're all becoming good hand washers now. And hopefully when COVID's down the road a little bit, we can all stay a little bit healthier. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Frank, here's the thing. Um, you know, winter times are associated with flu uh, and they're more vulnerable people that have always had flu. And uh, so EnviroMaster, some of, many of our customers actually have stepped up some of the services in, during the winter months. Mm -hmm. um, the, the real evidence that we have from our customers, so we look after kiddie schools, uh, grocery stores, for example, and the evidence from the owners there is that even before COVID, that our processes, when we're going in each week doing a deep clean and using the virus vaporizer spray, this is this hospital grade germicide, which is food safe, um, they've noticed the level of sickness amongst their staff come down. Now, that's just a huge, you know, the, the cost of the service is you know, insignificant. Some of you are going to see a very quick commercial break. News Now from Fox will be right back. Uh, less days off. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. I guess mm. it's a good thing to talk about toilets because who knew there was a national yes. toilet day? November... <laughs> The 19th, and some people may see this uh, uh, a day or two after, but uh, happy National Toilet Day. <laughs> well, you know, it's a very, very serious topic if you think about it. I mean, you know, it's, I think it was the UN maybe designated it, what, 20 odd years ago. Uh -huh. uh, and for very good reason, because half of the world does not have access to clean, sanitary, you know, uh, facilities. Right. Um, and the one sure way of trying to protect an, a population is to look after, you know, A, to provide sanitary you know, uh, uh, facilities, and secondly, to where you do have them, to really look after them. And I think in the US, uh, or, you know, where EnviroMaster fits in is that this isn't something that we just invented, you know, yesterday. Uh, you know, the company has been going uh, 10 years but uh, our founder and CEO, Pat Swisher, you know, he started this business 30 years ago and he had an amazing foresight to say, well, let's focus on an area, the restroom, where it's an epicenter for disease and germs. And let's go in and try and kill the germs that might kill the business. So um, 
I, I, you know, I had I knew nothing about toilets before we bought this um, this franchise, and I absolutely loved the biz the business model because we it's a combination of the training that we give our technicians, um, how they are introducing themselves to the manager to the owner each time, the processes and the training that we give them of uh, how they use it consistently, whichever part of the uh, country you might be in and the solutions and germicides that are proprietary to us. And the combination of those three things simply enhances the restroom environment for the customer, the patrons, the staff. Very good. Well, if people, Harminder, that would like to get in touch uh, with EnviroMaster in Sacramento or beyond, how do they do it? Well, you, you Google us, uh, you Google EnviroMaster services in your area, and uh, we have uh, very well-developed websites. You'll get directed to your local area. Uh, our headquarters are in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we um, each, the, 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 the guarantee that you get, that anybody gets, is that the service you get from one is gonna be entirely consistent. And this is why we service people like uh, Texas Roadhouse, for example. So if, whether in Sacramento or in San Francisco or in Houston or in Orlando, and you're going to use a Texas Roadhouse restaurant, you know that the service that that restroom has got has been entirely consistent. So Google us um, uh, and you look at this. If you go to a place and you see a sticker, you know, there's a phone number on it. Call it. All right. Hmm. Well, um, some great insights on toilets and uh, how to clean up our world a little bit. And hopefully we can get COVID in our rear view mender. Uh, uh, rear view mirror, not mender. That's you. Harbinger <laughs> Simi uh, out of Sacramento with Enviro Masters. Want to thank you very much for joining us here on Fox. Well, thank you very much for having me, Frank. Again, big thank you to our sister station, Fox 2 KTVU. They do a lot of coronavirus special coverage for us right here on News Now from Fox. We are taking a live look, everyone, at my hometown, Phoenix, Arizona. I am currently missing it. It is the News Now from Fox headquarters. I'm going to head on over to our sister station, Fox 10 Phoenix's uh, website to see that it's 60 degrees, and that makes me even more homesick. Oh, my goodness. This is the time of year when you definitely want to get out hiking in Arizona, the Valley, Superstition Mountains. Oh, I'm definitely missing it, especially ahead of Thanksgiving. Going to be staying in Florida here with the News Now from Fox East Coast Hub, but I'm happy to be here with our team providing you all this News Now from Fox coverage. So I'm going to say hello. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching on the platform that has a chat feature, feel free to let me know exactly where you are watching from. But again, everyone, my name is Pilar Arias. Happy to be here with you. I do want to show you my graphic with my name. If you happen to want to follow me on Twitter at Pilar News Now, I'm also on Instagram and on Facebook. So please, please follow and like me. That way we can stay in touch even when I am not hosting this show. Here at News Now from Fox East Coast Hub in Orlando, Florida, you've got myself. Regina Gonzalez, Rain Augustine, and then our headquarters in Phoenix, Arizona. You've got Mike Pache, Andrew Crafts, Daytona Everett, and we also have Stephanie Weaver out in Los Angeles as well. So we have gone national here on News Now from Fox, and it certainly is great. All right, everyone, so what else do we have? What can we take a live look at right now, right? We've got the U.S. Capitol in our nation's capital. Looks like it's a little bit cloudy there in Washington, D.C. We've also got a live look outside of the Fox News headquarters in New York City, right across from Radio City Music Hall, and we have a live look of the Dow Jones Industrial Big Board, currently up about 240 points. So tell me, are you all ready for Thanksgiving weekend? Do you have a four-day weekend? Do you have just Thanksgiving off? Let me know. Again, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. Happy Monday. Hope you all had a great weekend and hope you are prepared for this upcoming weekend. But again, you're watching News Now from Fox. My name is Pilar Arias. We're continuing on with our uh, coverage of top stories, coronavirus, politics, election 2020. Still not quite over just yet, but right now I'm going to take you out to Fox 6 in Milwaukee, and that's because we have a follow-up to the mall shooting that happened over the weekend. That shooting injured eight people. Amelia Jones live outside the mall for us with new details about the suspect's arrest. 
Carl, the suspect who was arrested was a 15-year-old boy, and we are still waiting to learn what charges may be filed against him. Wauwatosa police say that some of the eight victims are out of the hospital and recovering this morning. Police say that the teen was involved in an altercation between two groups that led to the shooting at Mayfair Mall on Friday. Wauwatosa Police Chief Barry Weber says the 15-year-old walked out of the mall with fleeing shoppers Friday while police and SWAT teams ran inside. More than 24 hours later, the teen was arrested at a traffic stop. The 15-year-old boy is one of still an unknown number of people involved allegedly in the shooting. Police say of the eight injured, four were innocent bystanders not involved in the altercation. We wanted to get it out that the, the person's in custody because there's no other threats to the public and everybody who is involved, we believe, are, are, have been uh, um, taken into custody. So there's nothing more as far as that goes. Again, we do not know how many people were taken into custody in connection to the shooting Friday. Also, because the suspect who was arrested was 15 years old, police are not releasing his name or photo. Police say that they are expecting to release more details about what led up to that altercation in the coming days. As for Mayfair Mall, it is back to business as usual, but Wauwatosa police said you should get used to seeing a more police presence here at the mall. Live in Wauwatosa. Amelia Jones, Fox 6 News. Maybe seven or eight on your way. Oh, man. They're playing some music there. In New York City, ahead of Mayor Bill de Blasio, should be providing a COVID-19 update in just moments. It's always scheduled for the top of the hour at 10 o'clock, but hardly is he ever on time. So I just want to let you know there we are on standby Meanwhile, I'm going to show you President Trump's latest public remarks. He was actually talking about lowering drug prices. We're going to watch that right now on News Now from Fox. Remember, we're staying on top of all breaking news for you in terms of the election, in terms of coronavirus. If anything happens live, raw, and filtered, we've got you covered right here on News Now from Fox. Thank you very much. This is a very big announcement, the biggest ever concerning drugs and drug pricing. So today, I have to tell you it's a great honor for me to announce that my administration is issuing two groundbreaking rules to very dramatically lower the price of prescription drugs for the American people, especially for our cherished seniors. We're pleased to be joined on this occasion by Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, an administrator of Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Seema Verma. Thank you both. Thank you both. And thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. The unprecedented reforms we're completing today are the direct result of the historic drug pricing executive orders I signed in July. Uh, statutorily, we had to go through a very long process and we got it done. I was very proud to have gotten this done. We were pushing it very hard, as we did with the vaccines and other things. Uh, the first action will save American seniors billions of dollars by preventing middlemen, famous middlemen, they call them, from ripping off Medicare patients with high prescription prices. Currently, drug companies provide large discounts on the price of prescription medicines, including nearly $40 billion in rebates to Medicare Part D plans last year alone. Yet often, middlemen stop those discounts from going to the patients, which is what we're interested in, not the middlemen who need it the most. So the patients are going to be now getting the benefit instead of these very wealthy individuals. Patients pay very high prices, and they have for many years, although we brought it down, you know, first time in 51 years, with the costs adding up to hundreds or even thousands of dollars per year per patient. Today's action ends this injustice and requires that these discounts go directly to people. These are the people that need it. This will save patients up to 30 percent, could be 40 percent, could be 50 percent, could be much higher than that. These are numbers that nobody's ever even contemplated. And uh, that doesn't include life-saving drugs like insulin, which will be even higher. Insulin was 
destroying lives and destroying families because the cost was so high, and now it's uh, at a level that nobody can even believe. Is that correct, Seema? $35 a month from many times that number. The second rule we're finalizing today will transform the way the U.S. government pays for drugs to end global freeloading on the backs of American citizens and American patients. Until now, Americans have often been charged more than twice as much for the exact same drug as other medically advanced countries. Uh, we would be having a drug, identical drug, same company, and we'd pay many times the price of what that drug would sell for in certain countries. In case after case, our citizens pay massively higher prices than other nations pay for the same exact pill from the same factory, effectively subsidizing socialism aboard with skyrocketing prices at home. So we would spend tremendous amounts of money in order to provide inexpensive drugs to another country. And when I say the price is different, uh, you can see some examples where the price is beyond anything four times, five times different. For example, Medicare Part B recipients are forced to spend five times more for a common breast cancer medication than patients in other countries. So five times more. And we have other examples that are substantially higher than that. To address this unfairness and to lower prices for Americans, we're finalizing the Most Favored Nation Rule. Remember that name, Most Favored Nation Rule. Uh, nobody's ever done this. Uh, the drug companies don't like me too much, but we had to do it. It took a long time before we were, we were able to do this, because statutorily we had to go through a process. But they'll There'll never be anything like this. I just hope they keep it. I hope they have the courage to keep it, because the powerful drug lobby, Big Pharma, is uh, putting pressure on people like you wouldn't believe. Medicare will now look at the price that other developed nations pay for their drugs. And instead of paying the highest price on the list, and we are substantially higher than any other country in the world, we will pay the lowest price. In other words, we take the lowest price and we match whatever the lowest price is, leading to colossal savings for all Americans. And we're talking about savings of 50, 60, 70 percent, 80 percent, different drugs, different prices. In addition, today, we're taking one more historic action to hold down drug prices. In the past, drug companies have been allowed to identify certain very old generic drugs that have been widely available for decades and exploit a misguided program called Unapproved Drugs Initiative. That's Unapproved Drugs Initiative, a program that has been around for a long time and uh, hasn't been too good for the, the people that were supposed to benefit to obtain market exclusivity on these medicines. So uh, we are doing something that uh, nobody thought anybody would do. The savings is going to be incredible. Then they've jacked up the prices by as much as 1,000 to 5,000 percent on uh, this product. This program has also caused shortages of important medicines. Today I'm announcing that we are ending the Unapproved Drugs Initiative program to stop this unfair practice. So prices are lifted by a thousand percent to five thousand percent in one or two cases even more than that and we're ending this we are putting an end to it together these reforms will save american patients many many billions of dollars every single year for generations the american people have been abused by big pharma and their army of lawyers lobbyists and bought and paid for politicians but i've been loyal to the special interests i've been loyal to our patients and you know, people that need drugs, prescription drugs, and devoted myself to completely fighting for the American people. You see that? This is not an easy thing to do. Big Pharma ran millions of dollars of negative advertisements against me during the campaign, which I won, by the way, but, you know, we'll find that out. Uh, almost 74 million votes. We had Big Pharma against us. We had the media against us. We had big tech against us. Uh, we had a lot of dishonesty against us. 
But Big Pharma alone ran millions and millions of dollars in ads. In fact, I looked at it and said, who is it? Uh, they uh, — I've never seen anything quite like it, because I told them I'm going to have to do this. You know, I was put here to do a job. And Pfizer and others were way ahead on vaccines. You wouldn't have a vaccine if it weren't for me for another four years, because FDA would have never been able to do what they did, what I forced them to do. And Pfizer and others even decided to not assess the results of their vaccine. In other words, not come out with a vaccine until just after the election. That's because of what I did with favored nations and these other elements, instead of their original plan to assess the data in October. So they were going to come out in October, but they decided to delay it because of what I'm doing, which is fine with me, because, frankly, this is just a very big thing. A very big thing. What I'm doing here, I don't know if anyone's going to appreciate it. These people can't even believe it. Alex, even you can't believe it, can you? Look at you. So they waited and waited and waited, and they thought they'd come out with it a few days after the election. Uh, and it would have probably had an impact. Who knows? Maybe it wouldn't have. I'm sure they would have found the ballot someplace, the Democrats and the group. These corrupt games will not deter us from doing what is right for the American people. And I will always put American patients first. And I think uh, it can never be shown better than what I'm doing today. Already, we successfully lowered drug prices for the first time in 51 years. In September, we finalized a rule allowing states, wholesalers, and pharmacies to safely and legally import drugs from Canada. Career politicians have promised to institute this reform for decades, and we got it done. The reason Canada, and this is going to be, I think, just a short-term fix, because until we have the favored nations fully ready, which we hope to have be in January 1st, I think a very important thing is to say January 1st. It's right around the corner. Um, but uh, I'm giving governors the right to go to Canada because they'll pay, pay approximately 50 percent less for their drugs for, that they buy for their states. So the governors buying drugs for their states go to Canada. They buy the drugs for very, very much less, and they'll be able to pass that on to the people of Florida. Uh, Ron DeSantis uh, was the first one to ask, but others are asking also. And uh, it's a great thing. I mean, you'll save 50 percent. They're going to buy a lot from Canada. Uh, initially, and I think ultimately, they'll be comparing prices. You'll get the lowest price anywhere in the world, so you won't need to buy from Canada. In a few weeks, my administration will also finalize rules requiring federally funded health centers to pass drug company discounts on insulin and EpiPens directly to patients, and the EpiPen prices come way down. We remember those horrible stories about EpiPen. Well, the prices now come way, way, way down. We capped insulin costs for many seniors at just $35 a month, as I said, saving them an average of nearly $500 to $1,000 a year just on insulin. Saving $1,000 a year on insulin. Since I took office, we've reduced Medicare Part D premiums by 12 percent, putting nearly $2 billion back into seniors' pockets. Now, 12 percent is great by any standard, but 12 percent is peanuts compared to what we've done with favored nations. It's uh, — I think it's probably the biggest story that we've ever had relative to drug prices. There's never been anything like this. This is uh, something that has been talked about for many years, but nobody had the courage to do it because of the power of Big Pharma. We ended the gag clauses that prevented pharmacists from telling patients how to buy less expensive drugs. As you know, pharmacists could not talk to patients about how to buy drugs. How about that one? I think that's right. And now they can and should. We approved a record number of affordable generic drugs for three years in a row, and we put a very, hef very heavy emphasis on generic drugs. And uh, the pricing there has become very good, but that pricing will also go down very substantially. No administration has ever fought harder or achieved more for our patients and for our seniors. But for America, when you think of it, for America, because other countries were paying a fraction of what we were paying, in some cases a small fraction. I mean, it was — it was uh, what — the numbers were just staggering, the difference between going to — I won't name nations, but I could uh, name five of them right off the top of my head, that uh, it — it is so incredible to think about for years what was happening. We've been working on this for two years. 
statutorily, we had to go through a process. But when you think that our nation, for the exact same pill out of the exact same box, often made in the exact same factory, same company, and you take a look at uh, the cost with so much more, many, many times more, in four short years, we've instituted the most dramatic series of drug pricing reforms in decades. And you'll see that it all comes to fruition right now, starting on January 1st. And the American people will benefit from our actions for many, many decades. And it should be very immediate. Now, I presume they'll sue, but it's a suit that they should never be able to win. Uh, they should never, ever be able to win. So now I'd like to ask Secretary Azar to provide some more details as to the action. And then, Seema, I'd like to have you come up and say a word, few words. And uh, great job. We appreciate it. Thank you, President, Secretary. Well, thank you, Mr. President. What an extremely exciting day for American health care. On top of the news that you just made, today, Pfizer will be filing an application for an emergency use authorization with the FDA for their COVID-19 vaccine that appears to be 95% effective. Within weeks, we could have a decision from FDA, and within 24 hours of that, we will have started distributing millions of doses of safe and effective vaccine to begin protecting our most vulnerable across America. You know, the President mentioned his passion for getting drug prices down, and I can tell you I've seen that firsthand. When I became Secretary in January 2018, the very first meeting we had in the Oval Office was to put together our plan for tackling drug prices. It was the number one priority the President said for us was getting drug prices down. And in that meeting, we came up with the idea for most favored nation status and for ensuring that the discount prices that Big Pharma was giving to middlemen would get passed on to America's seniors at the pharmacy counter. And almost two and a half years ago, in May, the President laid out the most comprehensive vision for reforming drug pricing in American history. The President's blueprint was clear. We need to put American patients first, and our drug pricing system too often puts them last. The system had to change. The blueprint called for tackling foreign free riding, for bringing down high list prices, for reducing out-of-pocket costs, and for better negotiation by our government programs. That's what the President has delivered over the last two years already, and that's what the President's delivering today with these new historic reforms. We're ending a broken system of shadowy kickbacks that drove prices higher and higher every single year and left so many patient, patients shocked at the out-of-pocket costs that they owe at the pharmacy. We're replacing that system with upfront discounts in Medicare delivered straight to the patient at the pharmacy counter. We're bringing negotiation to the way we pay for the most costly drugs in Medicare, fixing a system where the government just took the price that drug companies offered, paying about twice as much as comparable countries. We're ending a program that's been used by drug companies to jack up prices on older drugs. The President's actions today boldly take on the big drug companies, take on the middlemen, and take on foreign countries free riding off of Americans. If you don't believe how fiercely special interests have fought these efforts, you must not have watched any TV in Washington over the last couple of years. Special interests have run millions of dollars in ads against the President's drug pricing initiatives. Mr. President, they underestimated me, and they sure as the devil underestimated you. About two years ago, just over in the Roosevelt Room, the President signed legislation to ban pharmacy gag clauses alongside me and his drug pricing advisors. That included my friend and colleague, Dan Best, who passed away two years ago this month. And he devoted his life to lowering drug costs for American patients, putting them at the center of our health care system, just as President Trump has done. And he was one of the key driving forces behind the rules that we are announcing today. I wish Dan could have been here today, Mr. President, but today's actions are a lasting legacy for him and for you. The President's historic actions will transform drug pricing forever and build the system that American, the American people deserve, a system that puts American patients first. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for making today possible.
masks and hoop earrings don't work well. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership. And let me take a moment to give some context for today's announcement. From day one, President Trump made it very clear that he wanted to make health care more affordable and accessible to every American. And the most important thing is that he wasn't afraid to take on the special interest groups to get this goal accomplished. And in the absence of any meaningful legislative support, this administration has delivered real, tangible results. Premiums down in Medicare by 34 percent, the lowest in 14 years, and some areas saw declines almost as much as 60 percent. We stabilized the exchange, lowering premiums for the first time, and brought back more plan choices. We have set forth a pathway to make the American health care system work more efficiently to deliver better quality and lower cost, tackling long-standing problems that no other administration had the guts to do. And the list is long. Price transparency so that patients know what they're getting charged before they get their care. Portable digital health records so patients have their complete medical history right on their phones. Reducing regulatory burden so that doctors can spend more time with patients. The health care system will work better because of what this administration and President Trump has accomplished. And as the President noted, our achievements on drug pricing are no less sweeping and unprecedented. Thanks to regulatory changes in 2017, the Part D premiums have dropped to some of the lowest rates in seven years, saving beneficiaries over $1.9 billion in premiums. And we're also bringing price transparency to Medicare so that doctors and patients have pricing information when drugs are prescribed so that patients can get the best deal. The President's senior savings model has our Medicare beneficiaries cheering this year as they are selecting plans in this year's open enrollment. They have over 1,600 plans that are offering insulin for just $35 a month or less, and that is a massive 66 percent savings. Today's announcement is about Part B, where the Medicare program has been nothing but a powerless price taker. And the problem is simple. While there are market forces and negotiations that serve to reduce costs in other parts of the healthcare system, it just doesn't exist in Part B, which pays for drugs that you get in a doctor's office, cancer drugs and other infusions. In Part B, American seniors and taxpayers pay whatever drug companies want to charge. And doctors also get paid a percentage add-on. So the higher the drug costs, the more they get paid, giving an overt incentive to prescribe higher price drugs and for manufacturers to increase its prices. And so it's no wonder that American seniors are paying twice as much as what other countries are paying. And because of this, over the past five years, Medicare spending for Part B drugs has gone up by 55 percent on average and drug spending in Part B is responsible for over a third of the premiums that our seniors pay. So the bottom line is higher drug costs lead to higher premiums and higher co-pays. Doctors do well, drug companies do well, but patients pay more. This effort is going to save over $85 billion over seven years and saving seniors over $28 billion as well. And so I want to thank the President for being a problem solver to, willing to be to think big and to act boldly on behalf of the American patients. His record of success over the last four years is a testimony to that mentality. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. President Trump not taking any questions there after that remarks on lowering prescription drug prices for all Americans. Some may be surprised, some not. Here's a live look. New York City, we are waiting. Mayor Bill de Blasio, hopefully any moment. He's about 30 minutes behind schedule. The other day it was even more so than that. So we're going to continue to keep a very close eye on that for you. Meanwhile, the Bay Area, our sister station, KTVU, continuing to cover some breaking news. We've got a live picture of it. I want to read to you the latest while I can here on News Now from Fox. Here's the live picture. Unfortunately, two people died in a stabbing at a downtown San Jose church last night. That's according to the mayor. There were, quote, multiple stabbing victims, victims some with life-threatening injuries, end quote, at Grace Baptist Church about 845 
in the evening last night, according to the San Jose Police Department. They actually tweeted it. The violence did not occur during a religious ceremony, the police said. Instead, the attack apparently involved people who were receiving shelter in the church. This is a quote. Unhoused individuals were brought into the church to get them out of the cold, the police department said. A source said Kate told KTVU there were victims inside and outside the church, which serves overnight as a shelter. Mayor Sam Licardo tweeted that a suspect had been arrested, but then he later deleted that tweet when police would not confirm that information. Investigators have not said what led to the stabbing. Police said there would be more information released later in the day. The deaths raised the city's homicide total to 41 this year in 2020. So again, we are on standby just a few moments. Hopefully, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio will return. Meanwhile, we're going to head on over. Sister Station, Fox 35 Orlando actually talking about how things are going to be prioritized when a COVID-19 vaccine is officially released. It is a race to see which company in which location can get it first. Some of you are going to see a very quick commercial break. We'll see you in two minutes. FDA granting emergency use of the drug Regeneron to use as the first antibody cocktail for COVID-19. This experimental therapy is the same treatment given to President Trump back in October when he got coronavirus. When administered, the treatment reported has been quick and effective when it comes to fighting COVID-19. Adults and children with mild to moderate symptoms will be the first to receive the treatment, as well as anyone 65 and older who has certain chronic medical conditions. And as we do get closer to the approval of a potential COVID-19 vaccine, one may even be ready for distribution as early as next month. But here's the thing, that everybody will get this vaccine at the same time. And so the question is, who will get it first? How will it be distributed is another question a lot of people have. And so we do want to bring in Dr. Jason Littleton with more on the vaccine and the timeline. Good to see you, Dr. Littleton. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. How are you doing, Danielle? I'm Pretty good on this Monday. You know, here's the good news. That approval process is rolling along. But how long could it take, doctor, for the distributions to actually roll out? You know, it could actually take a full year for everyone to get the vaccine. And I know that can make some people anxious. You know, they're triaging it. And, you know, just like Mayor Demings was talking about, you know, the first line workers will be the first to get the uh, vaccine. And this is something that is really important because they're taking care of the elderly, they're taking care of those who could be affected with coronavirus. So making sure that they don't transmit the virus is uh, first and uh, foremost. The National Academy of Medicine has laid out uh, recommendations to the CDC who will help, help to rule out this, these guidelines. And this is something that they're gonna really take very serious. So can we talk more about those distribution phases? Who's first, who's second, third, fourth? Well, there are four phases. And again, frontline workers are the first, and that's actually phase 1A. Phase 1B is where you're going to uh, roll it out to those who have comorbidities, who have are 65 and above, who live in group homes. Phase two are people who are going to uh, be you know, above 65, but they don't necessarily have two or more comorbidities. They're also going to be given to critical workers and those who, who have high moderate risk, such as uh, people who are in child care and teachers, people who are also in jails and prisons, they're going to be the second tier to get that. Mm. And then in the third tier, you're going to have people who are young adults and children, those who are college age, those who are essential businesses, such as hotels, banks, um, and other factories. And then lastly, the rest of the population will be the uh, fourth tier to be able to get the, um, the vaccine. Okay, very interesting. You say it could be about a year before everybody is able to get that vaccine. And I know these vaccines are different. They're going to have to be stored differently. And you heard Mayor Demings talking about already purchasing some of the refrigerators for the ones that have to be stored in exceptionally cold conditions. Will this doctor affect distribution in terms of which hospitals or pharmacies are likely to get which vaccine? Absolutely. Now, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at negative 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have to uh, purchase a special freezer for that. So that's a big hurdle on that vaccine. The Moderna vaccine will be negative four degrees Fahrenheit. So these are sub-zero freezers that uh, hospitals, um, you know, clinics have to store. Now, the AstraZeneca will have a conventional refrigeration. So that's probably going to be the easiest one, but they all have different efficacy. So this is going to be something that can be a challenge. Not just that, price can also be a challenge. And they're priced out differently as well. 
you know, you've heard people say, yes, I'm going to get the vaccine as soon as I'm able to. Others are saying they're not going to get the vaccine. Can we dispel any myths about it being unsafe? Because people are saying, listen, I don't want to be the first one to get this. I don't know how safe it is. Are there any safety concerns associated with this vaccine? Well, again, even right now, as they, they're uh, uh, getting ready to have emergency use authorization, it's still an investigation still going on. There are safety concerns, no doubt about it, but most of the trials and phase three trials have had minimal side effects, things like maybe fever, headache, fatigue, but there hasn't been any severe symptoms like anaphylactic shock or other immunologic uh, reactions. So there's still concerns. I understand people who may be a little concerned about, let's see how this rolls out, and that's granted. Um, so I, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt, but I think there is a need to help protect the elderly and those at high risk. So I think there are gonna be a lot of people who are still eager to get this, vac this vaccine. Dr. Jason Littleton, it is Thanksgiving week, so I just want to tell you how thankful we are for you. Thank you so much for all of Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you guys. Thank, Thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right. Again, big thanks to our sister station, Fox 35 in Orlando, for that special coronavirus coverage. Taking a live look at the Dow Jones Industrial Big Board, currently up about 180 points. We are still on standby for New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. He is about 38 minutes behind schedule because they are always scheduled for the top of the hour. Meanwhile, it was a very busy weekend for the White House. Not only did we hear from President Trump himself about lowering prescription drug prices, but we heard from Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany. So we're going to listen to that right now on News Now from Fox. Don't worry if any news breaks across the country or worldwide. And we have a camera there or we can bring you the info. We will do so right here on News Now from Fox. We are all about live, raw, unfiltered, and showing you events in their entirety. Again, happy Monday. I hope you all had a great weekend. I know lots of us are gearing up for Thanksgiving. It's going to be my very first here on the East Coast in Central Florida. Good afternoon, everyone. The beginning of the end of the pandemic started with the leadership of President Trump. In recent days, Pfizer and Moderna reported the highly successful results of their vaccine development, each achieving a COVID vaccine that is over 90% effective. We know Moderna is 94.5% effective, Pfizer 95%. That is extraordinary. In July, the Trump administration, as part of Operation Warp Speed, agreed to provide Pfizer with $1.95 billion to manufacture and distribute their COVID vaccine, allowing this vaccine to be provided free for the American people. While Democrats were pursuing a highly divisive and entirely baseless impeachment endeavor, as far back as January 13th, this president, the Trump administration, and the National Institute of Health was partnering with Moderna and working on this vaccine for the American people. But that's not all. This administration has remained engaged on the development and distribution of a safe and effective vaccine throughout the year, began in January and continued thereafter. On May 15th, Operation Warp Speed was launched. On September 16th, we released two documents outlining a strategy all right, Regina Gonzalez, just let me know that New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is currently speaking live. We're going to take you there right here on News Now from Fox. People some encouragement because everyone's been working so hard to protect people's livelihoods and bring them back, and it is having an impact. I'm going to talk about our schools, which we closed for the safety of all but are coming back with a plan to intensify our safety measures and bring our schools back. So we need to reference all those facts and remember what we're capable of as New Yorkers and how that's going to move us forward. And at the same time, we could recognize the real challenge we face with this second wave bearing down, with COVID cases rising, all the things that we need to do to stay safe. So let's talk about schools. I know it's on everyone's mind, and it's on my mind as well all the time. We can and we will bring back our schools. It will take a lot of work. And I just want people to understand that from the beginning. 
Bringing back the schools this next time will take an extra effort. It can be done, it will be done, and then in the months ahead, we'll be able to do so much more as we start to feel the effects of a vaccine reaching this city. And hopefully that starts in the next month or two. But in the meantime, to bring schools back, we have to take our core vision, which is health and safety first, and intensify it. The, the data and the science govern all our decisions. We saw these numbers rise. We made a decision based on the standards we put forward months ago. But now a new reality is coming into play, the strong, strong likelihood that in a matter of days, uh, the state of New York will determine that New York City is an orange zone according to state standards. Now, I'm not going to speak for the state or the exact timing. I'm just taking their numbers, looking at them, and acknowledging the clear trajectory and basing it on what the state has said already. There is a likelihood as soon as next week even uh, that New York City will be declared an orange zone. Once that happens, uh, we will be in a position to take additional measures to reopen schools. And there's a clear um, protocol for that. It involves a lot more testing. It's a very conservative, cautious approach. Again, a lot more work. But we will go through that hard work together. I know how much parents want their kids back in school. I know how much educators and staff want to be there to serve kids. It will take a lot more testing, a very aggressive approach, a very proactive approach, but we can do it. Testing has to be done, in fact, in advance of kids and staff coming back to school. And constant testing uh, throughout the school year, much more than we've even been doing already, and we've been doing a lot. Remember, New York City, first of all, we opened our schools when almost no major city in America did, but second, we put a strong testing approach into place and the situation room to act quickly if anyone in the school community tested positive and when necessary to close the school. That whole approach was working and working very well. We're going to now build upon that, intensify it, and make sure that there's testing constantly. Now, I'm going to say again, as I said several times last week, if you're a parent, you want your kid back in school as soon as they reopen, get that test consent form in because that will be absolutely required for any child to come into the school uh, to have a test consent form on file. And that includes all those who opted back in to blended learning uh, over the last few weeks. Now, how will this work? Well, a lot of details have to be worked out between the city and the state, but we can say for sure that we're going to focus on the most important and most vulnerable elements of our education system. So first of all, our special needs kids and the families with special needs kids have been saying very, very clearly how much they need in-person education. I couldn't agree with them more. So when we come back, the first thing we're going to focus on is getting what's called District 75 schools, special ed schools, back and up and running across all grades. Uh, next, the youngest grades, early child education, such a difference maker for children. Bringing that back, 3K, pre-K, will be a high priority, followed by elementary school. And we'll keep building from there. So this is a, an initial vision, a lot of work to do to make it come together. But I want to give people a sense of how things are going to go in the coming weeks and the focus we're going to have as we build out this plan. Again, parents, this is going to require a lot from you. You've got to get those test consent forms in. You're going to have to help us with the testing of your child before uh, we come back to school. It's going to be something that everyone has to participate in, but we can do it. I don't have a doubt in my mind we can do it. And our schools will come back with this plan and then more and more as the vaccine comes into play in the coming months. So anyone who believes in the power of bringing this city back, remember, you can do something about it. I just talked about what parents can do. Everyone can contribute to this city coming back. And it comes down to this, as always, wearing this mask consistently and practicing social distancing, but also the choice we all have to make now at the holidays. I've talked about this. It's a painful reality. We're going to have to do something very different this Thanksgiving, very different throughout the December holidays. Uh, do not travel if you can possibly avoid it. If you travel, it just greatly intensifies the exposure you could have and the risk you would take. Even if you're getting a test, you're still going to be exposing yourself 
to the challenges that come with travel and uh, to a lot of places in this country that just are not as safe as we are. I uh, keep urging people to please don't travel. Please change your plans if you've made them. And if you do travel, take every conceivable precaution. Uh, and if you come back and you test out, that's, that's great. But if you don't test out, honor that quarantine. We need you to. And again, everyone, small holiday gatherings, uh, if it's folks from outside the home, practice social distancing, wear masks. There'll still be joyous gatherings, or if you do it virtually, it will still be a joyous gathering, but let's just protect each other. I said it on Friday on WMYC. Let's protect each other this year so we can all be together next year. Let's protect each other this year so people will still be alive next year for when our holidays are in person again. Okay, that is a quick update on the schools front. Now, let me talk to you about what's going on with our economy and our budget. And this is crucial. We have some new information here that's really important. And we knew from the beginning that this virus was going to wreak havoc on people's lives, first and foremost, in terms of their health. And we mourn everyone we've lost, but we also feel such pain for everyone who lost their job, everyone who lost their livelihood. Uh, so much pain in so many families. But we have now real data, real evidence of the power of a stimulus, of what the federal government can actually do to help people, because we now have a better sense of what the previous stimulus packages did for New York City. Our Office of Management and Budget has totaled up everything, the impact of those individual checks that were sent to people, the $1,200 checks, the unemployment benefits, the PPP loans for small business, all of that combined. The impact on New York City has been $40 billion. This is new information, it's very important information. When you combine all those previous stimulus programs, $40 billion reached the people of New York City. And that is part of why we have been able to make it through, even with all the challenges. Now, it's also proof positive of why we need a new stimulus quickly, because all of those good investments are now wearing off, and people are running out of money, and they're running out of time, and we need another stimulus, and this is exactly the right time for it. Now, I want to give you an example of what that has meant, first in terms of our economy, then we're going to talk about our city budget. Uh, go back to February. It's amazing to think, this is not ancient history. February 2020, this year, New York City was arguably at its all-time economic high, the peak of our economic strength in our entire history. 4.7 million jobs, all-time high. 3.4% unemployment as of February, record low. That was just 10 months back that we had this extraordinary strength. Along comes the horror of COVID, decimates our economy. Between March and April, the immediate aftermath of the, the worst of what we went through, almost 900,000 jobs were lost in this city. But then we started to feel the impact of that federal stimulus, that 40 billion we're now recognizing the full impact of. $40 billion came into the city over the course of months. People worked hard to bring their businesses back. Everyone worked hard to bring down the COVID levels and open up the space for economic recovery. As a result of all those efforts at the end of the spring going into the summer, now over 300,000 of the jobs that were lost have been recovered. So it's an amazing beginning. We lost 900,000 jobs, but 300,000 are back already. We've got a long way to go but so important that this city's ability to rebound is already in evidence. Now, unemployment's still way too high, 13.2%, way too high, not something we can ever accept. Many people suffering, a long way to go. Parts of our economy are gonna take a long time to bring back, but you now can see the impact of a stimulus, the way it kept people afloat, the way it helped people bring back their businesses, and the way it could do that again and the sheer impact of New Yorkers doing the right thing and fighting back this disease and opening up the space for us all to recover. As we face the danger of a second wave of COVID, again, there couldn't be a more important time for a new federal stimulus. And it is going to be the difference maker. It's the only thing that could be the difference maker. 
New Yorkers are doing a hell of a job fighting back this second wave. We're, we're in real danger here, but people are fighting. They're doing the right thing. But again, we're running out of time on the economic side as well. We need that stimulus to keep people going. And that means now. This Congress that's in Washington right now could pass a stimulus to help New York City and the whole country. And then the new administration could do even more in January and February. And that's going to mean everything starts to move. People have the money for the basics. It's going to help jobs come back. It's going to help us expand our reopening of our schools. Everything gets a boost from a stimulus, protecting all our essential services. It's the difference maker. So now let me talk about what we have achieved in part with the help of that stimulus money and other federal support uh, and what it means for where we go from here. And this now takes us to our city budget. Now, Lord knows we had to make extraordinary changes between February. I put forward a preliminary budget for this fiscal year in February. What a different world that was. By April, when the next budget submission was due, we had to change everything. By June, we end up with a budget that looked very, very different from what we thought it would. We had to cut a lot. There's a lot of things that we thought were important, but we just couldn't do. And a lot of savings had to be found and found quickly. And a lot of jobs were either cut back or not filled. We were able, through those actions, to keep ourselves going, to keep essential services happening for the people of the city to help spur that recovery. We've got a lot more to do. So today we're releasing our November financial plan. This is something that happens each year. Normally we wouldn't be highlighting it as much, but it's important because there's some major changes and it speaks so powerfully to the impact of federal support. So the budget now for New York City for fiscal 21, the fiscal year that we are in now, will now be $92 billion and remains balanced. And that is because of federal support, overwhelmingly. The money that came from that first stimulus that ended up in people's pockets, some of that turned into revenue for the city as well, but also the direct grants that came to the city through stimulus, and of course, FEMA aid, which has been absolutely crucial. We have depended on FEMA so intensely in this crisis, and even though we're still not seeing the kind of reimbursement that we deserve or any other city deserves, and that still needs to be addressed, uh, the FEMA aid is coming in and is playing a huge impact. And that is all about the things that we have focused on to protect people, feeding people, making sure no New Yorker went hungry, making sure we could build a strong test and trace core, which has been crucial to holding back this disease. Everything we had to do to get our schools open, all the things we've been doing, all the health and safety measures, you've heard about them, the gold standard we set for our schools, layering health and safety measures one on top of another, that all cost a lot of money. But that FEMA aid helped, the federal grants helped, and now we're in a position to say that we could pay for these dire needs because we got federal support. If we could get more federal support, it would be transcendent. It would help take us forward into our recovery. At the same time, we have to do things constantly to tighten our own belt. We have the furloughs that we moved for uh, city officials, senior officials, management, uh, everyone was asked to sacrifice. New Yorkers are all hurting. It was important for your leaders and the people who run the city government to sacrifice as well. So we did the furloughs, uh, the savings that we found. We have a whole set of agreements we've come to with our labor partners that resulted in savings. But in addition to that, $1.3 billion in new savings being announced in this November plan. And that is for both this current year, fiscal 21, and for next year, fiscal 22. So the budget reserves, uh, these reserves continue to be strong, and we are going to continue to protect them. And that's something that has been a crucial, crucial part of our work as well and has helped us work our way through. We made a big focus for years on reserves, kept them strong. We're going to continue to have a strong reserve as we go forward. Now, 
What I've told you is at least some good news. There's some good news. A lot of federal money came in. There's some good news. It really helped families keep going. There's some good news. It helped us, the city government, to keep going. But there's not only good news, to say the least. There's some bad news on the budget front as well. And that's what we see for the next fiscal year. Right now, an almost $4 billion gap looming. $4 billion now. But of course, that gap could easily grow. If there's not a stimulus, we're going to see less and less revenue coming in. If there's not a stimulus, the state of New York is going to be in dire, dire shape and unfortunately might have to pass on cuts to localities. So as much as I'm happy to give some good news, I have to also frame the reality that comes into play very soon. Again, almost $4 billion that we don't have to keep ourselves going next fiscal year. And we have to present a new budget in January that will be adopted in June for the new fiscal year. And right now, we don't have a way to close that gap without federal support. That's why it's so crucial that we see action at the federal level. And I'll conclude this before going to our indicators with this simple point. New administration coming, thank God. Uh, vaccines now here, thank God, that's huge. The way forward is clearer than ever. With a stimulus, all these pieces come together. It's the perfect time. Without a stimulus, we struggle. We struggle in many ways and the suffering continues. And we know that it's at some of the most dire points that some of the greatest things are achieved. Sometimes in a moment of crisis, people rise to a higher level. That's what happened in the Great Depression. That was what led to the New Deal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We need this again. We need this Congress to act. We need our new president to act in this crisis to find a way forward beyond anything we've seen. We really can come back strong. Let me go over today's indicators. Number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Threshold, 200 patients. Today's report, 100 patients. Confirmed positivity, 43.27%. So again, that positivity rate has gone up. That's the, the number, excuse me, the percentage amongst those patients who actually are proven to have COVID. That number's gone up a lot in recent weeks. That's a real concern. The 100 patients, too many, but again, we see an interesting gap here in that that number does not grow consistently so far. We are not out of the woods, but again, an interesting and important point. That number has not been growing as markedly as we might have expected, and ICUs have not been as full as we might have expected, but we are far from out of the woods. Now, number two, this is clear as a bell and again, continues to be a huge challenge. New reported cases on a seven day average, threshold 550, that's been blown by many times over and we're now at uh, 1,381 cases. So very, very uh, tremendous concern there. But some of that accounted for by more testing and we encourage constantly more testing to get us the truth about what's happening. And number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19, threshold 5%. Today's report, 2.95%. The seven-day rolling average, 3.06%. Okay, a few words in Spanish. Nuestra ciudad ha enfrentado muchos desafíos. Welcome everyone here from the news now from Fox. Thank you again for joining us here worldwide. As always, we do appreciate you being part of news now from Fox. When there is live events, you know we got you covered right here as uh, we are taking a listen right now of Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York City talking about the latest COVID-19 numbers that he is seeing in his city. And uh, we will have full coverage from other cities as governors and mayors continue to update on the global pandemic right here on News Now from Fox. And we will also have uh, some Thanksgiving travel updates as well. So we got you covered right here on News Now from Fox today. Well, we'll now begin our Q&A with us today. We have Health Commissioner Dr. Dave Tokshti, Budget Director Jacques Chiha, First Deputy Budget Director Ken Godiner, Deputy Director for City Revenue Policy and Planning Francisco Brindisi, and Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma. With that, we'll go to Juliet from 1010 Winds. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, subway pushings. There have been more frequent, they're on the rise. So how are you addressing the mental health issues involved with those accused? And what do you say to New Yorkers who are getting increasingly worried and afraid to use the subway? Uh, Juliet, look, I'm real concerned, and we got to make sure that New Yorkers have confidence that they can go and use the subway and know uh, help will be there for them. So NYPD is going to be increasing its presence in the subways. That will be very visible. We continue to expand our mental health efforts. Uh, the thing we've got to do is find people and get them help before something like this happens, and we need medical intervention which our city agencies will do. If we find someone who we think might be a threat to themselves or others, uh, we're gonna get them to a medical facility, get them um, tested and evaluated. If it's someone who should not by law be on the streets, we're certainly gonna act. But I also would say, Juliet, New Yorkers uh, are strong, resilient folks. We know that we can overcome anything, so I understand the fear but people should know uh, that we're gonna get that presence out there to keep people safe. Go ahead. Yeah, so have you spoken with Commissioner Shea? So is, are there, when you say more police are gonna be on the platforms, how many? Are, is there a, an announced effort to do this? Will uh, transit, extra transit police or MTA police be there? How does that work? Well, it's, look, the whole approach the NYPD takes is to adjust constantly. This is what ComStat's all about. If there's a greater need in the subways, we'll move additional officers in the subways. That's the plan. We'll get you the exact uh, details of the numbers. Clearly, it's gonna be about presence and visible presence and moving that around to where PD assess, uh, assesses the need. But this is exactly what uh, Comstat and Precision Policing are all about. If there's a particular need, we're going to move our officers there and people are gonna see it. And I think that's gonna be reassuring to people. Next is Emma from the New York Times. Emma, can you hear us? Hi, good morning, Mayor. Hey. Yes, sorry for the delay. No worries, um, how you doing? Can you talk about, I'm good. Um, so can you talk about this four, nearly $4 billion budget deficit? Um, what do you say to critics who say you need to do more um, to address it now and are layoffs still on the table? Yeah, Emma, we're constantly doing the work of uh, tightening our belts. That's what the furloughs were. That's what the 1.3 billion in savings, new savings over two fiscal years we're announcing today. Uh, that's what the uh, savings we found from our labor partners. All of it is about getting us through to a stimulus uh, so we can move forward. If there is no stimulus, we're gonna have to make extremely difficult choices. And again, Emma, I think it's really important to recognize our own uh, almost $4 billion, $3.8 billion deficit for the upcoming year could be magnified. If there's no stimulus, the state will be put in an awful place as well, and that's gonna mean additional cuts. So that $3.8 billion could go up really quickly. What are we gonna do? We're gonna to have to consistently cut things back. And it's not something we wanna do, Emma. We do not wanna take away essential services from New Yorkers. Uh, we do not wanna lay people off. If we don't have any other choice, that's what we have to do, obviously. Uh, so unfortunately, it's impossible to take layoffs off the table uh, for next year. We're trying to avoid any layoffs for this fiscal year. And certainly with the unions we've come to agreement with, we will avoid layoffs for this fiscal year. But we haven't come to agreement with every union, obviously. And uh, the, the real challenge that we're looking at now is just the sheer totality of next fiscal year. So sadly, and no one wants it, but sadly layoffs could well still be on the table going forward, uh, certainly for next fiscal year, if we do not get that stimulus. Go ahead. And um, in terms of the labor deals, um, what do you say to critics who say that um, you're kicking those costs uh, down the road, that you're kicking the can down the road? Um, why push those back to next year? Because we, first of all, we needed relief immediately to be able to continue to provide city services and to be able to keep people employed. Um, I value every single one of our public servants and our employees 
as people who help other people, I also recognize they're breadwinners for their family. We do not want to put people out of work. We do not want to reduce services exactly when we're trying to come back and when people are in such dire need. So this was a way of getting us to next year. But we've said all along, the only way we can actually make all of this come together is with a stimulus because we didn't, the New York City didn't create the pandemic. New York City did not create this crisis. We received the pain of this before anyone else. And the federal government was supposed to protect us. Obviously that didn't happen. The federal government was supposed to help us out of the crisis. Some of that happened, but not enough. This is an international and national crisis. So for us to just keep hanging on is the right approach to get to the day where there's actually the federal support we deserve and which I absolutely believe is within reach uh, so we can move forward. But if, if we get what we deserve, we won't lay off anyone. We'll keep doing the work of serving people. Next is Juan from New York One. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Very good, thank you. So uh, knowing that uh, the holidays are coming, uh, that uh, even the state uh, governor Cuomo yesterday said that he's expecting a spike in new cases, uh, knowing everything that is going uh, um, going on with the second wave, do you think it's realistic or pragmatic uh, to think that New York City is going to be able to reopen schools before the new year? Uh, Juan, look, it's tough, but we know that our parents who have their kids in school in blended learning want their kids back in school. We know we established an incredible uh, success with safety. We have showed that gold standard really worked in terms of keeping schools safe. Um, we've got to give parents this option again, but it'll take a lot of work. It'll take a whole lot of work. So. Our goal here is to put that together, no matter how much work it takes, no matter how much testing it takes, we're gonna need a lot of parent participation. And this is crucial, and I'm saying it to all the parents of New York City. If you want your child in school, you really have to help us out with those consent forms. If we say we need your child tested in advance of school opening, whether that's something we provide at the school building or someplace else, we need parents to follow through. Um, but there is a path, and we want to get schools open as quickly as possible. Go ahead. And the New York Times just reported this morning that Polly Trottenberg, your transportation commissioner, will be leaving your administration next month. Uh, recently, we've seen several departures. Uh, given the fact that next year will be extremely challenging for the city, how can you assure New Yorkers that you will be able to recruit the best talent to help you bring the city back in your last year in office? Yeah, it's an important question, but I'll tell you right off the bat, we already have the best talent. We have a very deep bench. Every single one of our uh, commissioners who has succeeded uh, has succeeded because they had a strong team around them, their own talents, of course, but they also had a strong team around them. And we've got a lot of good talent to draw upon. Uh, we may, in some cases, bring in someone from outside, but in most cases, what we'll do is simply work with the very deep bench we have. Polly has done an extraordinary job. I wanna thank her. Um, you know, I remember in the very beginning when she and I talked about Vision Zero, and we knew it would be extremely difficult. Nothing like this had ever been tried in such a large American city, obviously, uh, but we believed. And she did an amazing job with her team, bringing Vision Zero to life, working with NYPD, TLC, everyone. And this is something for the ages, that this city, a place you know, known uh, for such intensity and so much activity, has actually been the place leading the nation in terms of how to be safer, uh, how to protect people with an entirely different concept. And uh, that's something uh, Polly uh, played such a crucial role in, that's for the ages, and she's done so many other great things at the Department of Transportation, the, the busways and the select bus service, so many things she should be very, very proud of. So it's been a great run having her for the time of this entire administration. Uh, and I know she'll do great things ahead and I wanna wish her very well, but again, she's got a great team she's assembled and we'll be able to continue that work. Next is Sean from the Daily News. 
Yeah, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just quickly reviewing, you know, some of the state's guidelines for reopening schools once the orange zone designation is in effect. And I mean, it just looks like a huge logistical challenge entailing testing opportunity on school grounds or facilitating testing from other places, um, making sure, you know, the right population is being tested. So can you say if the city is, is laying the groundwork for that logistical t challenge now and, and, and what steps are, are taking place? Yeah, Shant, I've been on a number of calls with our healthcare team, test and trace all the folks uh, who have done great work um, putting together our testing capacity. And our uh, Deputy Mayor Melanie Hartzog has been in the lead of that. Our Director of Operations, Jeff Tom Kittikatsum, has been in uh, the lead of that with um, so many other colleagues. Uh, absolutely, what we're doing is turning our capacity to how we would build that out. We're going to have to even add more capacity to do this. But uh, the point I would say is it can be done. It absolutely can be done. We proved uh, with the monthly testing program and with the weekly testing in the yellow zones, it can be done. Uh, we proved we can keep schools safe and the situation room. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Melanie LaRocca and her whole team. They've done an amazing job with the situation room. We've proven that works. Our stakeholders all agree that that's been a huge success. Um, it's going to mean more testing. Uh, it's going to be a big logistical effort. It's going to take a lot of parent involvement, and we have to do it in stages, most likely, uh, starting with special education. Uh, but it can be done. And Sean, the other thing I'd say is this is a point along the way. Uh, we're going to fight back this second wave. We're going to get through the holidays into a time where we're gonna to start to feel the impact of the vaccine. Take, it will take months and months, obviously, for the full impact to be felt, but with every passing month, once we have the vaccine, with every passing month, I really believe we can make things better. So we're gonna be constantly doing the work of bringing our schools back farther and farther and getting more and more kids back in the classroom. So no time like the present to start that work. Go ahead. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Mayor. So switching gears, I wanted to get your take on uh, part of the mayoral race, uh, namely in-person fundraisers. You know, you've repeatedly urged people to avoid uh, gatherings during the holidays, but over the weekend, one of the candidates, Eric Adams, held two in-person fundraisers. His campaign, you know, says all safety precautions were taken, but there seemed to be a lot of outrage over that online. I was wondering if you have any comment on those fundraisers, if you're aware of them, and more broadly, would you urge mayoral candidates to refrain from in-person fundraisers uh, given the current climate? I think people have to be careful, Sean. I think the entire concept here is to really follow the rules. Um, whatever we do in this city, it is about following the very clear guidelines our healthcare leaders have laid out for us. So uh, I understand the candidates have an election coming up really quite soon in the scheme of things. I understand that they need to get their message out and it's important for the people to hear their messages and make a decision on who will be the next mayor in this time of crisis. But what I'd say is be really strict about following the rules. Whatever form their activities take, they have to be really, really careful uh, and show people that they're following the rules. Uh, I, I know they can do it, but they have to just be rigorous about it. Next is Maya from Patch. Hi, Mr. Mayor, how are you doing? Good, Maya, how are you today? Good, thank you. Um, I've been told that some local lawmakers have had trouble getting new testing sites approved in their districts and that they've made uh, many suggestions that were ultimately rejected. Can you talk about the criteria that you use to determine new testing sites, and especially given the hours long lines we've been seeing both at city sites and urgent cares, what you're doing to streamline that process? So Maya, on the lines, um, you know, and I'll let uh, Dr. Choksi get in on this one, obviously. The, I would say until very recently, we saw, um, we didn't see lines for quite a while, then we saw them more at the urgent cares, then we saw them at health and hospitals. Obviously, we're having a particularly intense moment because people are preparing for the holidays. Uh, so I don't think this is necessarily gonna be the norm going forward. 
but uh, what we've just been doing in general is expanding he uh, testing capacity to the maximum we can. There are obviously some limits. You need the test materials, there's staffing, there's uh, processing, you know, you can, at any given moment, you can only go so far, but we're trying to constantly push farther to see how much more we can do each day. As for finding sites, I mean, we're obviously led by the data and the science, and you see the zip codes now every day, you know, where we're trying to put our emphasis. Um, elected officials are trying to serve their community. That makes sense. And sometimes what they ask for really fits the overall priorities, and sometimes it doesn't. We work with them in each case. I'm looking forward to us having more and more testing with every passing month, and that's going to help us answer more and more of those requests. Dr. Choksi, you want to talk about the, the lines and how we're addressing that? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'll just start by echoing that um, it's exactly right that um, the city sites uh, are uh, ones that we, um, we hope more New Yorkers will take advantage of. Uh, we do know that there have been uh, some longer lines at city sites as well, but on the whole, um, city sites do have uh, capacity um, for, uh, you know, for this uh, major upsurge in demand that we're seeing. Um, there are a few things that we have done to try to address, um, you know, the, the particular uh, increase in demand that we've seen in recent days. Um, one is making sure that uh, for those units, uh, those testing units that are mobile, uh, we're bringing them to the brick and mortar sites where we see uh, longer lines, so essentially shifting supply uh, to match up with demand. Um, the Test and Trace Corps and Health and Hospitals who have been leading all of this work uh, are also making sure that we're distributing self-collection kits uh, to people who uh, are, are waiting in those longer lines so that they can actually perform uh, the swab on their own, uh, drop it off um, to decant, uh, you know, some of the people who are waiting there. Um, we continue to um, increase the number of both brick and mortar sites as well as those uh, mobile units uh, that I described um, and also bringing more testing to, um, to the major transit hubs ahead of the holidays, including JFK, LaGuardia, Penn Station, Port Authority. So we'll continue to try to smooth out um, the, the supply with the demand. I do wanna just say, you know, ahead of the holidays, um, we are clear public health guidance is uh, the safest thing to do is, uh, is not to travel. Um, and that uh, is also a very important message along with our message to get tested. Thank you, doctor. Go ahead, Maya. Yeah, I also wanted to ask about um, some of the areas where the COVID positivity rates have been spiking. Um, some officials have told me that they haven't been getting very much data at some point, uh, no data from officials with the contact tracers, Department of Health on where cases are coming from. I've also been told they found out about those local upticks themselves from the public data page and that they weren't notified in advance by the city. So I'm wondering what you're doing to keep local lawmakers informed about those localized spikes and possible transmission sources in their districts. Thank you for the question, Maya. I'm gonna start and turn to Dr. Choksi again. I really do appreciate, I was a local city council member, I was a school board member. I totally understand the sense of, you know, um, responsibility they all feel to their local communities, and that's a really good thing. I would say, first of all, we're putting up that data publicly for everyone to see, including elected officials. Uh, they know it's there, they know they can draw upon it, they know they can ask whatever questions they need from it. We don't necessarily have a separate operation that constantly updates the elected officials as to what is up online visibly. They know where to find the information. In terms of specific sites, again, what we've said over the last few weeks when these questions have come up is we really don't have a lot of substantial sites where we've had a lot of cases. What we are seeing primarily is uh, a handful of cases in specific sites, not the kind of dramatic numbers that you've seen in other parts of the country associated with individual sites. And where there is a concern, Department of Health shuts the site down. So it's quite obvious uh, when that has happened, people can see it because the, the business or whatever it is has been shut down. But again, that's not the norm. So um, what I'd say is uh, with Dr. Choksi and Health Department, um, I do think we, we can redouble our efforts, for example, if a store gets closed or a school gets closed, redouble our efforts to allow, you know, make sure an elected official is notified. But I think most of this stuff is pretty clear. 
Uh, and if any elected official has questions about it, we're always uh, making people available to answer them. Dr. Choksi, you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, yes, I'll, I'll say that uh, our data is uh, transparent and available, refreshed uh, each day at the zip code level uh, on our website. Um, and we have had specific conversations with a number of elected officials and their staff uh, to make sure that, um, that people know uh, how to navigate the site, how to distinguish between various um, elements of the data that we have there. Um, in addition to that, uh, second, we have um, very regular conversations with uh, both elected officials, but also other uh, leaders in the community, whether they're faith leaders or uh, people who lead nonprofit community-based organizations, um, those are happening on, uh, you know, at least a weekly cadence and sometimes uh, even more frequently. Um, but with that said, certainly, you know, if, um, if there are uh, specific uh, officials who uh, would like even more information or for us to, um, to make sure that, uh, that they have the most up-to-date information about what's happening in their community, we are 100% committed to, uh, to engaging with, um, with all of them. And then the final thing that I'll just say briefly with respect to uh, sources of spread um, beyond what the mayor has already said is that we know, again, both from our experience here in New York City, but uh, also around the country, around the world, um, a major uh, source is smaller social gatherings. Um, and that is something that is of the utmost importance as we head into the holidays, um, knowing that uh, people from different households may be gathering, um, may be convening. It is so important to stay safe, first to avoid those types of, of smaller social gatherings, if at all possible. Um, and uh, if you do have to have them, make sure that you're following rules around distancing and wearing masks, because those have been major contributors to spread. Thank you, doctor. Go ahead. Next is Arthur from Fox 5. Hi, Mr. Mayor, I hope you and your family are well. Thank you very much, Arthur, and to you and yours. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Um, my question is one on race. You articulated the tale of two cities early on. Uh, the question is, which of the two cities do Asians belong to? And I ask this because your actions on specialized high schools, which was dropped, in effect treated Asians as a class of New Yorkers who were deemed okay to take hard-earned opportunities from in their perspective. Yet Asians are a minority, and despite the myths, as you all know, the vast majority of Asians struggle as uh, their uh, fellow citizens that are African-American and Latinos do in the city with things like income and housing and education. And yet, even with uh, Asian-owned small businesses devastated by the impact of the pandemic, leaders there say they've been excluded from your racial inclusion and equity task force. At a September roundtable to support entrepreneurs of color, Asians apparently were not even mentioned once. So the question is, in which of the two cities do Asians belong to? Well, Arthur, it's such an uh, important and honest question, and I appreciate it. So let me give you some quick points. First of all, uh, this is a city that is almost two-thirds people of color, and that clearly includes our Asian communities. Uh, so if we're talking about a history of institutional racism and exclusion, that has affected Asian communities deeply, unquestionably, not only in the past history of this country and this city, but even to today. Um, if we're talking about economics, you're absolutely right. Uh, so many uh, Asian American New Yorkers struggle economically. Uh, so many uh, immigrant families are struggling uh, to make it in this city and pass something better along to their children. Uh, if we don't say that often enough, that's something we have to fix, I have to fix, and my team has to fix. The task force includes leaders of color across the administration, all agencies, including Asian leaders. And we have a number of East Asian and South Asian, Southeast Asian leaders in this administration, and they participate deeply. Uh, I would say to you, looking back on what I think was a painful episode, as we tried to address the injustices with our specialized high schools, I do think uh, that there were um, instances in which we didn't articulate, I didn't articulate well enough, the chancellor did not articulate well enough, uh, the administration did not articulate well enough our vision, which was not to take from people so that some other people could have justice, but to somehow create more fairness. I don't think we did that well enough. 
we can do both. We can create more justice and more opportunity at the same time. So, Arthur, it's a very good question, a very important question. I've said before, I want to say it again. I apologize to uh, members of the New York City Asian American community uh, who felt that the specialized high school vision was meant to exclude them. It was not. It was meant to um, help ensure that black and Latino New Yorkers who are being excluded painfully, horribly from specialized high schools would have opportunity but not to, in any other way, take away from another group. And we simply didn't handle that right. And that's my fault, I'll take responsibility for that. But the issue is still very much alive, Arthur. The specialized high schools still don't make sense. Again, Stuyvesant, I think it was two years ago, you know, between uh, African American and Latino students, 3% in a city that's over half African American and Latino, that doesn't make sense, that's not fair. But we don't wanna hurt Asian Americans or uh, white New Yorkers either and their kids. We've got to find a way to create more justice, more consistency, more fairness while increasing opportunity for everyone. And that's on us to present that vision now and put it into effect as much as we can in the 13 months ahead. And then the next mayor has to really build on that because that's where the tale of two cities is also quite evident, Arthur. The, you look at our specialized high schools, no one could say that's what we aspire to. We have to do better, and in our screen schools as well. Go ahead, Arthur. Thank you, Ed. That's, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as a quick follow-up to that, can you say right now that you will direct the MWBE to include Asian businesses? Uh, again, I want to be careful in this answer because there's a lot of angles to this. Uh, I want to make sure that we are uplifting anybody who has been left out. Uh, but we also see in the MWBE programs a lot of challenges that are still not being addressed. Uh, you know, I think, Arthur, that these programs are still not reaching a lot of the people they were meant to help who have been you know, the most excluded for the longest in this country. Um, so I want to make sure we maximize opportunity for Asian communities for sure and Asian businesses. But I also want to acknowledge that we still have a long way to go to achieve the very original concepts of why we're even doing the MWBE work together. I'll get you a more detailed answer because I want to make sure I say it exactly right having consulted with our MWBE team. But uh, much more to do on that front for sure. Next is Rima from Chalkbeat. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? Good, Rima. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, so, I, so my first question, I wanted to just ask um, about reopening. I, I think you may have addressed some of this, but and some of it might be my confusion. Um, but you mentioned that the city uh, would be able to take additional measures to reopen schools if the city becomes an or like a state-imposed orange zone, which, to my understanding, I think as people have outlined, means extra testing in schools, and then there's a bunch of other rules to actually get back into the building. Um, so I'm wondering, since the city isn't in an orange zone at this point, but you are, it seems, looking you're looking at ways to reopen with increased testing. Why can't the city start taking those measures um, right now? And that's what we're ramping up to do, Rima, but let's be clear about how the pieces are gonna to come together. You're, you're not confused. Let me, let, me, let me give you some positive reinforcement. You are not confused. These times we're living in are confusing. Ever changing reality with COVID and very difficult uh, standards that have been set to address things. Um, we recognize and appreciate the state's role. The state has set out its vision around orange zones, the way they manage orange zones. This came in part from the original proposal I put forward when we saw the problems in Brooklyn, Queens. Uh, I had a different approach and I might do things a little differently, but the state has the right to apply it the way they see fit. They came up with these color zones and the orange zone has a clear set of criteria of how you get into it and what it means to open schools within it. We know we'll be in an orange zone, again, as early as next week. Uh, the planning and the logistics it'll take, which was referred to in an earlier question, real challenging stuff, but it can be done. So we're ramping up right now 
retooling our testing operation to go focus on the schools that we would reopen first. And again, that begins with District 75 with our special education schools. Because it is much more intes intensive testing, we're not gonna try and open everything simultaneously. We would do this in waves. Um, but it does require a lot of new work and we need the time to get ready to get things in position to do that. I think it's all going to line up because again, I think the orange zone, sadly, I wish there wasn't gonna be one. You know, I wish, I wish we were doing better in terms of COVID, but it's coming, it's coming soon. So I think the pieces are gonna line up uh, pretty consistently. Go ahead, Rima. Okay, um, my second, and thank you for the positive reinforcement. Um, my second question is about learning bridges. Um, we know, you know, the city has said that there hasn't been a lot of uptake in learning bridges, and we've heard that the hours and locations can be inconvenient. And then there, I believe there was a report in CBS uh, today that kids with disabilities are being turned away from these sites. So does the city understand why there's been less enrollment than expected? And what are you doing to make sure that the program is more convenient for the families who actually need it? Thank you, Rima. The, uh, first of all, I have not heard of anyone turned away. So I'm not negating that report. I just have not heard that having had a lot of conversations with a lot of people about learning bridges. I've not heard that. The capacity of learning bridges has been consistently expanded. We have been uh, expanding it with the assumption that once we saw that school unfortunately had to close for a period of time that we would need even more. But uh, what has been clear is there has not been the uptake we expected. Um, I wanna emphasize to any parent who wants to uh, take advantage of learning bridges, you know, it's quality uh, childcare and a safe setting. It's first and foremost now for essential workers as we are dealing with this danger of a second wave, but also there are uh, prioritized slots for uh, families in shelter and others who have particular challenges. And then if there's more beyond that still available, uh, anyone can apply and anyone who wants to apply can call 311 uh, and learn how to apply and get their name in. But um, I think the important parallel here, and I imagine you saw this, Rima, we thought in the spring and summer that our regional enrichment centers were gonna be a lot more full than they were, as you know. Uh, never saw the kind of enrollment we expected. We ended up having to uh, cut back a number of those centers because there just weren't people using them. Why? I don't think we have a perfect picture. I think, unfortunately, one of the reasons why is very much about COVID. So many people are home. A lot of people who, thank God, still have a job are working rem remotely. A lot of people who don't have a job to date are home for that reason. I think for many families, there's been a decision to keep their kids close rather than taking them to uh, childcare or some other kind of option. I think that's part of what's happening here. But, um, The, um, the bottom line here is for families who qualify, Learning Bridges is something we will provide for sure and we'll do it for free. And if we have to keep expanding it, we'll keep expanding it. And obviously we're working really hard to get to the point where schools are back open and that's uh, gonna be a, an option a lot of families will of course prefer. Final point. Rima, on, on that report you gave, again, I had not heard about that, but presuming it is accurate and not wanting to ever um, belittle a situation like this, if a child was turned away, a family qualified their child was turned away, that's just wrong, and we won't allow that. Uh, we'll track down that situation and make sure that that child gets a seat in Learning Bridges for sure. Go ahead. For our last question today, we'll go to Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, good morning, Mayor DeBosi. Can you hear me? Yes, Katie. How are you today? Good, thanks. Happy Monday. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I hope you got a chance to read it. It's from a colleague of mine writing about um, the hundreds of uh, deceased New Yorkers who are being stored in morgue trucks um, in Brooklyn. This is, you know, most from COVID, but some other uh, people who died during the height of the pandemic. And I'm curious, you know, when we spoke, when he spoke to officials at the medical examiner's office, you know, this was sort of due to, um, obviously they were very overwhelmed. This was unprecedented, but we are curious, um, you know, they use a lot of temporary measures to kind of get through 
the peak of the pandemic. And are there any plans from you to increase money to ACME if there is a second wave? Um, you know, God forbid there are uh, increased deaths because of this, but I don't know if you have any plans to increase the funding there or make any changes. Well, thank you for the question, Katie. It's a sad, sad but real question. Um, you know, we've made clear whatever we need to do uh, to support the medical examiner's office. We will. A lot of extensive efforts were put into place uh, back in the spring. Very, very tough time and tremendous support we got from the federal government. That's one of the places where the federal government really did step up and help us, and I'm very thankful for that. But um, the sad reality to that story, I haven't, I haven't read it, but I got it summarized to me, is you know, those, those um, who we lost, uh, their families are still trying to determine the best way to provide services for them and uh, just have been struggling because of the pandemic and other challenges. So we're, we're trying to work with each and every family of, of those we lost who are in that situation to make sure that they uh, can have the kind of uh, services they want to have at the right time. But we'll provide the support we need to. Uh, I don't see, thank God, I don't see anything like what we went happened in uh, March and April. We haven't seen uh, some of those particular warning signs yet, thank God, but we are very, very vigilant. Uh, but we'll make sure medical examiner's ready either way. Go ahead. Thank you. And my second question um, is about the, you know, the upcoming closures in the orange zone. You know, this has been asked multiple times, I guess, throughout this whole pandemic. But the small businesses and just business in general that will be affected the most by these closures. Um, I know, obviously, everyone's waiting for a federal stimulus. But is there anything more the city can do to help these businesses? I hear from a lot of business owners who are really desperate. There's no other way to put it because of just everything is falling down on them. They can't pay rent. Their, uh, their revenue has completely been cut. So is there anything more the city can do to offer assistance financially, especially to a lot of these businesses? Katie, it's a, a question that has been asked a lot of times. It's also a fair and important question. Um, there's a lot we can do to help each business. It is not what we ideally would like to do. Um, you know, the, the thing that would help businesses the most is to get an infusion of direct assistance, cash assistance to keep going. Because you're right, with the orange zone will come restrictions again and, and businesses will have an even tougher time. And, you know, we, no one likes to see that. They're gonna suffer as a result of that, but this is, this is what we gotta do to keep everyone safe and to beat this back. Because we saw in, in the late spring and in the summer when we beat back the disease, then businesses can reopen. That's good for everyone. That's what we're trying to achieve once and for all. And with the vaccine coming, I really wanna believe, you know, this, this could be the last great battle we're going through right now before the COVID war is over. So, you know, if we can get through this immediate challenge and then the vaccine starts to arrive, it will take time, obviously, to be fully implemented. You know, but if the vaccine starts to arrive, we get better leadership on COVID in Washington. We get the impact of the stimulus. We're going to see each month get better, even if it's well into next year before we get to something like normal. But I think the bottom line is any business with a challenge should talk to small business services. Sometimes there are very particular things we can do uh, that really help dealing with a lease issue, uh, legal help, uh, loans, uh, getting rid of fines that were unfairly given. There's all sorts of things that can be done. We don't have a ready supply of money to simply deliver to them, even though I would love to, and they deserve it. It did come from the federal government initially. We need to see it happen again. That's the only true solution, that small business support be a key part of the next stimulus. Okay, as we conclude, look, oh, we've talked about a lot today, but it comes down to something real simple. We gotta fight back the second wave, we still can. Uh, we get through these holidays, we have a chance to really turn the corner. But it's up to every one of us. The fact is that the reason New York City got strong again over the summer was because of each and every one of you. You have to make that choice again. So really please be very thoughtful and mindful about these holidays. Do everything you can to stay safe. Help us turn this last corner 
so we can beat this disease once and for all and bring our city back. And when we do, I don't have a doubt in my mind that all the energies, all the pent up energies of the city will surge forward to give us an extraordinary recovery. But we need every one of you to be a part of it. And then we need our colleagues in Washington to do the thing that they should have done a long time ago and give us one more big stimulus to get us on that clear path to recovery. And I know it can be done. We've got to fight for it. Thank you, everybody. And we continue to roll on here for you on News Now from Fox. Thank you again for joining us worldwide here today as we continue to always bring you the very latest from across the country, live, raw, and unfiltered right here on News Now from Fox. Let's go out to uh, Georgia right now where the Secretary of State's office holding a uh, briefing on the recount effort now requested by the Trump administration. Lower court on that point and they were trying to make us go through Friday with the postmark by Tuesday, but then we went to the 11th Circuit and overturned that. So this office has done a lot to defend the integrity of this election. Um, and one of the things that was cited by some people is that there's really a widespread questioning of, of the outcomes of this election, but the widespread questioning has been pushed by people who have, you know, they're angry, but they're lacking in evidence. Uh, we saw yesterday that even the president is distancing themselves now from an obvious member of their legal team in, in Sydney, Barrow. Um, so that's happening right now. And we anticipate, you know, additional lawsuits now that we've reached the certification phase. We don't know when they're going to come. You know, we see on social media people talking about blockbusters and krakens. And I want to remind everybody that krakens are myths. So we anticipate we will continue to follow the law and follow the process as we have done since the beginning. We had a very successful election on November 3rd. We had average two minute wait times. Uh, we had good processing. We got through the uh, counting the ballots and in relatively normal time, this happened to be an abnormally close election. And anybody who can look at the political science of this can see Specifically, there were eight counties, six metro, and then two, Athens and Clark, Clark and Emma Oconee, that in those eight counties alone, President Trump received 19,000 fewer votes than Senator Perdue. Obviously, that covers the entire margin. There were over 20,000 people who voted in the state who chose not to vote in the presidential election at all. Again, that could feed into part of that. None of this is that odd looking in terms of if you're actually following what's happening in this state. Republicans still got 53% of all the state house votes, 54% of all the state senate votes, and 51% of all the congressional votes. And if you take the combined votes in the in the jungle primary and the Senate Purdue's race, they were in first place in all of those. So again, I understand that there are people out there who are upset, who are listening to people who are also upset, but have so far shown a lack of evidence, at least in this state of any widespread issues. We, we said before, and we'll say again, if somebody has an illegal vote they want us to track down, it's very binary, either it was illegal or it wasn't illegal. So we will investigate those, we continue to do so. We look at every affidavit. We have 23 investigators. We have hundreds of different claims that have come in both through our portal, through the hotline, and through information we're getting from the Republican Party mainly. And so we're looking at all of them. And they're all being taken as equally seriously as, as any other one and treated fairly and even handedly by our investigations division. But so far, we have not seen anything widespread. And I think we've been saying that. But again, it doesn't have to be widespread to affect the potential outcome of this election, although 12,670, which is, I believe where we are now, is gonna be a heavy lift to have that many votes flipped over. And the secondary question on the absentee ballot audit, there's no way to track those back to the ballots they were that were there. So the only remedy is to throw out legal ballots along with potentially illegal ballots if there's even an issue at all. And that's not a remedy that I think any court would sustain as we saw in the documents in Pennsylvania and in Georgia where the judges essentially tossed out uh, many of these claims because it is a, a heavy, heavy lift for people who follow the law and did, did legally vote to have those votes then tossed out is not something I think any court in the land would look at doing. So with that, I want to go ahead and open it up to, um, well, actually one more thing. In the disinformation day, Dominion and Smartmatic, completely different companies. Smartmatic was, was truly out of Venezuela. Dominion uh, is based in Denver. So, and Dominion, ESNS, and Smartmatic all bid in Georgia on this process to get to get the unified voting system we had. 
Um, the top two finishers in that were ES and S and Dominion. So we brought them in for additional negotiations. And when we first were doing it, um, we were really pressuring them both to try to throttle down the costs. And we did, we, they both came down by several million each off their initial bid and get their last and final offer, best and final offer. And the winner of that was Dominion. We followed the Department of Administrative Services rules and laws around the Georgia procurement law. All these documents are available for viewing at the DOAS website. It was an open bid process. So the concept that somebody, either the governor or Se Secretary Raffensperger or his family members were somehow paid off or kickbacks or anything that is flat out false and makes zero sense when you look at the very open, transparent process we had and went through. And we know that it was a good process because there was no challenge to the bid after it was awarded from either of the other two losing parties. So again, facts and reality fly in the face of these Facebook and Twitter accusations. So with that, I want to go and open up the door to any questions we might have. And Walter, you, you will again be unmuting people and announcing them so they can follow this protocol we've got set up so we can get from one person at a time. Okay, uh, first is Nick Wooten. Uh, hey, Gabe, Nick Wooten with McClatchy. Um, I had a question for you about the governor's comments Friday. Mm -hmm. um, he mentioned specifically uh, a signature audit, essentially mm -hmm. comparing the absentee ballot envelopes that are stored for two years by the counties mm -hmm. to the state's uh, voter database. Mm -hmm. Is that, and I, I know that ballot secrecy protects comparing the ballots to the envelopes, but is, is there anything in law that would prevent comparing these envelopes to the signatures held by the state? We will do that if a, if a court orders it or if we have specific investigatory reason to do it. But a generalized, we don't like the outcome, we don't control those ballots. Those are counties that control those ballots. Who's going to pay for it? How is it done? What's the structure? Are we going to take it to the GBI? Do we do it internally? This sounds like, he said, a simple request, but it really isn't, especially in light of the fact that we have counties running elections this week, including early voting. We have the January 5th election coming. We have a recount we have to do. They just did a hand audit. There's only so much these counties can possibly do. And again, what is the remedy? What is What, is, what are you trying to do at this point? I, I don't see a, a path. Like I said, we haven't finalized this decision. We're trying to look at law to see if there's a, a way for it to potentially be done. But right now, it doesn't look like there is a potentially easy path like was laid out to us to do something like that. Um, our main goal at this office now, and the secretary announced this, and we were glad to see Governor Kemp agree with the secretary's proposal to move to a more sort of binary objective measure of identifying a voter rather than a signature, which would be a driver's license or state ID number or a, a HAVA ID, which is listed in the federal law. Those are the kind of things that you can say, yes, for certain, this is the person that takes away this subjectivity. And I'm reminded for anybody out there who remembers older movies like this, when Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Jimmy Stewart's character is accused of being involved in the Willow Creek scandal. And they have documents and they bring in experts from both sides arguing this is an obvious forgery. This is obviously this man's real signature. And it becomes subjective and people just do the finger pointing and arguing. It just can lead to chaos. So without a, a, a path laid out of a specific investigatory purpose, like we've seen in this county, we've heard that this person did this we and investigating that versus a randomized, we're gonna check all 159 counties, like 10%. We're working on a structure if we have to go down this path to see how we would do that. But right now, who pays for it? What is the structure? What are you, what are you trying to finally get to? Because we have no evidence, because like I said, the percentage of rejection rate is pretty much the same as we've seen historically. And that's with the addition of the cure period and the curability on these ballots now, so that there is an issue in with their voter ID and cure it. So we have essentially, there's no prima facie evidence that there has been an issue. And there's no specific evidence that anybody's brought to us that anybody has done anything wrong. And again, both parties had the opportunity to view this in real time when it was being done. Both of them made, I assume, a decision that they didn't need to do that. And that's unfortunate now that they now believe that there might have been an issue on that. But without specific evidentiary cause, it's hard for us to do that because if we make a precedent of, I don't like the outcome, therefore we should start investigating random parts of the process, that means in the future, if somebody asks for the same thing, say Stacey Abrams comes up short in two years when she likely runs for governor and then starts accusing the process of being wrong even without any specific evidence. So it's a bad precedent unless we can find a legal path with specific evidentiary routes to follow. 
Right, and there's nothing currently in Georgia law that would spell out a, a recertification of, of signatures, right? Right, there's nothing. I mean, these things have already been checked twice. And one of, one of the things of the settlement agreement that has just been completely mischaracterized to a point of, you know, perversion, the settlement agreement literally only did one thing. It said, we have a cure period. We're going to, the state will send out an official election bulletin to tell people they need to do the, to remind people if they get it within, I think, 11 days of the election, they have 24 hours to notify the voter. That's the only fundamental thing that changed because what people are talking about when you moved it only to matching it to the request, that's not exactly true because the request has already been matched to what was on the state or the local file of the signature. So what happens, the process is supposed to be that new request signature should go into the file now too. So you have multiple versions of a person's signature because the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has told us it's better to have the compendium of all their signatures. So the request has already been added so by the transitive property, you're really comparing it to the ballot, to the request, to the original thing on the state file. So nothing in that system changed. I, I hope that makes some sense on that front. Right. Yeah, I just had one more really quick. Um, the Nation had something uh, published, I think it was Friday, sort of talking about George's um, audit. And I think it was Philip Stark, professor at the University of California, Berkeley, who's sort of the father of the risk-limiting audit called this a Franken count. Um, you know, he said, I think he said that his estimate was uh, the Secretary of State's office could have looked at 2,500 ballots instead of the, the full recount that the office suggested. And that some of this uh, canvassing, basically the county's making sure these ballots were found, should have been done before the audit was conducted to basically you know, he's, build the trust. He's, he's in part right. He's also a, he does not like being this. He doesn't believe that you can trust BNDs, and that there's no reason to believe on that front. We work with Voting Works, the nationwide leader in conducting risk limiting audits. This hand count came back with a margin difference on the number of ballots of 0 0.1053, and a on the margin difference 0.0099%. This was a good audit, and you know, the people who sit in ivory towers. You don't actually have to administer elections. Can they always tend to sit in the, at the side and criticize and snipe it for the details of some of these things? And we had a lot of people in the room who are also experts in risk limiting audits who said we did a really good deal. I suggest you talk to Benedita and other people from Voting Works who are actually there helping us conduct this this uh, hand tally. And the thing is, we also put the, the numbers in the Arlo tool. He, uh, Dr. Stark, in his particular front, is just wrong. And he knows, and he said before, I think he said three, two or three weeks ago, specifically, that once you get to 10 or 20 percent of the. And 670 ballots that we wouldn't have moved to that. We put it in with a risk limit of 10 percent. In and out and right there, we had to be 1.5 million you. ballots, which is well over the 10 to 20 percent even he talked about. And we put it in at a. At a 5%, we would have had to go to 2.5 million. And I'm estimating what I said, because it was close to that, it was like you know, 2.63 million or something like that. So we had to go down this path, but this was the best way, because if you remember correctly, there were people out there saying the Dominion machines didn't count right. They flipped votes. You can't trust that because it's software changes and fractional things, and all of which was debunked because we did a count it nearly exactly lined up with what we saw in the audit crew. The machines did their job properly of counting those ballots. So thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> next, we have Ann Walker. Uh, you. Hi, Gabriel. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. I just want to compliment you and thank you for everything that you've been doing and you really know what you're talking about and appreciate you explaining everything in the minutia. So, so um, big kudos to you. Um, regarding the signature audit, because there's been so much disinformation by the president, by the RNC, um, and just misinformation floating out there, just want to clarify. So again, we've been saying over and over, it's impossible to rematch the ballot where there's the marked vote for whoever presidential candidate that was voted for, you cannot match that to the signed envelope. So then, then what would an audit accomplish? If you can't trace which presidential candidate was voted for, and you end up throwing out 